Okay, welcome everybody to this virtual hearing for the inquiry into floodplain harvesting. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which Parliament sits. I'd also like to pay my respect to the Elders past, present and emerging of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people present. Today is the committee's third and final hearing and is being conducted virtually. This enables the work of the committee to continue during the COVID-19 pandemic without compromising the health and safety of members, witnesses and staff. As we break new ground with the technology, I ask for everyone's patience through any technical difficulties we may encounter today. If participants lose their internet connection and are disconnected from the virtual hearing, they're asked to rejoin the hearing by using the same link as provided by the committee secretariat. Today, we'll hear from a number of stakeholders, including legal experts, the Natural Resources Access Regulator, irrigators and other water users, local councils and the Minister for Water, Property and Housing, the Honourable Melinda Pavey MP, along with departmental representatives. Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the virtual hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media or to others after you complete your evidence. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regard, it's important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness could only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days of receipt of the transcript. Today's proceedings are being streamed live and a transcript will be placed on the committee's website when it becomes available. Finally, a few notes on virtual hearing etiquette to minimise disruptions and assist our Hansard reporters. Can I ask committee members to clearly identify who questions are directed to and could I ask everyone to please state their name when they begin speaking? Could everyone please mute your microphones when you're not speaking? Please remember to turn your microphones back on when you're getting ready to speak. If you start speaking while muted, please start your question or answer again so it can be recorded in the transcript. Members and witnesses should avoid speaking over each other, please, so we can all be heard clearly. I remind members and witnesses to speak directly into the microphone and avoid making comments when your head is turned away. I now welcome our first witness. Good morning, Mr Walker. Could you please state your full name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation from the cards that have been emailed to you from the Secretariat? Mr Walker. Uh, my name is uh, Brett William Walker. I'm a barrister and I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Mr Walker, would you like to begin by making a very short opening statement? Uh, yes. Um, uh, now, more than two and a half years ago, I published uh, my report as uh, the Royal Commissioner for South Australia with respect to the Murray-Darling Basin. And in its chapter 14, um, I addressed uh, quite a few matters that at least overlap considerably with what I understand to be the concerns of, of this committee. At least I hope there's some useful uh, consideration to be found in that chapter for the purposes of this committee. Uh, it will be clear, I think, from what I wrote back then, uh, that I took then the view that floodplain harvesting was uh, so long overdue for uh, governmental attention uh, that it was becoming um, a real embarrassment in water regulation uh, on the uh, in the eastern states. Um, one of the problems is that uh, this state, which is uh, hydrologically uh, terribly important, perhaps the most important, 
of the jurisdictions involved with the basin uh, has for a very long time tried to adjust political, uh, legal and economic considerations not very successfully in relation to floodplain harvesting. And it may be that culturally and in a very understandable way, uh, the intermittent and sometimes uh, disastrous, that is having too much of the good thing water in the terms of a flood, uh, has really removed floodplain harvesting from proper hydrological regulation. Uh, generations ago, uh, I can well imagine how measurement of a flood and its extent, let alone taking from it, would have been very challenging. Uh, but we haven't done much governmentally uh, to repair that technological challenge in, say, pre-war years. Uh, it does seem to me that uh, one symbolic way of indicating today the gross inadequacy of the social and governmental history with respect to floodplain harvesting in New South Wales is to reflect on the obscurity to lawyers of the interrelation between the Water Act 1912 insofar as it survives as to what I'll call its unrepealed effect or portions, and the Water Management Act, uh, which of course contains, in theory, uh, the state's uh, latest uh, governmental intentions with respect to, among many other things, floodplain harvesting. And as a lawyer, and I mean this very seriously, I think it's a failure of our system if you need to be a full-time lawyer to understand uh, law such as uh, the Water Management Act. I have a perhaps naive but strongly held view that law is defective to the extent that you need to be as silk as I am in order to find your way around its provisions. I think that's a really serious aspect and reflecting for today on what I've written for you by way of an opinion, I'd update one thing, and I mean this really seriously, when I urged that regulation of floodplain harvesting should be set about so as to be achieved with clarity, I should have added to that that it should also be intelligible to people who are not silks. I'm not suggesting that it's particularly intelligible to me as a silk. Um, and I really dislike, I have to say, the puzzle making approach to legislative drafting of which the Water Management Act is not a particularly egregious example, but it's still a bad example. I don't understand why the statute can't be written in such a way that farmers and graziers and regulators and parliamentarians and people in, concerned with environmental effect cannot, without a single law degree among them, um, understand how it is that the public resource, which is water, uh, has been regulated, I hope, for the common good. So I suppose I would urge, without any great optimism it will ever be achieved, I would urge that the law be intelligible according to the standards of uh, well-meaning but not legally qualified persons. Thank you. One, Thank the you. one other thing I should add, I don't know whether it will come up in, in an answer to a question, but I have benefited greatly from discussion with a colleague, Mr. Tim Horn, um, concerning the, I'll call it, a continuing effect in the areas still regulated by it of the 1912 Act. Um, I probably have made an assumption in the way I've written my opinion, uh, the assumption being that I was asked to address that those matters that are regulated by the provisions I was asked to address of the Water Management Act, and thus understood the questions about the 1912 Act to be, as it were, inquiring about a possible overlap. There are, of course, areas where the Water Management Act doesn't reach, so to speak, and the 1912 Act has continued effect. However, uh, I should make it clear that the 1912 Act doesn't, in terms, I stress, in terms address floodplain harvesting. There is an indirect possibility of an effect on the use of so-called works, uh, which 
uh, could give rise um, in a relatively indirect fashion to the possibility of offences having been committed with respect to what we would call floodplain harvesting, that is offences with respect to the 1912 Act. However, that will depend entirely upon a case-by-case -case factual determination of the use of works, and I stress the use of works. And where works can be lawfully used, there will be a very important question as to whether what I call an incidental or intermittent use in, in times of flood uh, would amount to an offence. Uh, that is not a matter that I can possibly advise on in the absence of particular facts. So um, it needs to be understood that the 1912 Act is, in my view, both obscure and indirect in any possible effect it may have upon historical floodplain harvesting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. We'll go straight to questions from the opposition. Mr. Adam Searle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walker, and thank you for your uh, opinion. Now, the opinion you provided the committee dated 15 September, you were specifically asked to advise about whether floodplain harvesting offended against the various penalty provisions you were asked to comment on. That's correct, isn't it? It is. And in relation to uh, 60 capital A of the Water Management Act, was it your advice? I think it's at paragraph 10 of your opinion. Is it? Do I understand your advice correct that essentially that provision doesn't apply because um, the uh, section 55 capital A declaration was not made in a form that would capture floodplain harvesting within 60 capital A? Uh, yes, I'd go further and say I suspect, again, with not much respect to those who are addicted to this puzzle form of drafting, I suspect it was actually intended to ensure that it didn't apply. I'm not suggesting that's sinister. I wish it could no. have been more direct. <laughs> Indeed. And at your paragraph 15, when you say it appears floodplain harvesting was not unlawful while the Water Act 1912 governed the position. Yes. Can I just ask, Section 392 of the Water Management Act currently vests all water rights in the Crown, that's correct? It does. And 393 abolishes all common law rights to the taking of water in New South Wales, that's correct? It does. It's part of the, I would call it, splendid Australian initiative uh, to put water in the hands of the people who should control it, that is, the people. So, so, so if water is owned by the Crown, and all common law rights have been abolished. If there is floodplain harvesting without a license and without any approval from the Crown, does that offend in some way against the Water Management Act? Not necessarily constituting an offence, but would floodplain harvesting therefore be in some way in conflict with the, with the Water Management Act? That's a question which as I, as I know you know, uh, requires consideration of a number of different ways the law views water. Mm -hmm. The first answer is, of course, conduct can be unlawful without being an offence. That's mm -hmm. common and sensible. Second, it can be unlawful both by statute and also at common law, such as torts of conversion and the like. Uh, there are also related torts such as nuisance, uh, by which, for example, one landowner may complain that another landowner has prevented the first landowner from enjoying natural flow of water, for example. Those are matters that are affected by Australian, first of all, colonial and then state parliaments deciding to reverse the English position and to put the dominion of, over water in the hands of the of the people in Parliament. However, uh, water still remains something that flows, and it is not sensible to speak really of the ownership in terms of property of H2O molecules uh, in any particular person. In my view, any more sensibly than it is uh, to contemplate ownership of the molecules of 
nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere, they're part of the environment rather than something which is, as it were, owned in the same way that I can own a pencil or a motor car. And for those reasons that the unlawfulness, if it, if it be unlawfulness, of floodplain harvesting in the sense of one person detaining and using water which is part of the public resource is probably not something which gives rise to any uh, legal recourse for the past damages etc but it might of course uh, give rise to the possibility of what i'll call an administrative law injunction that is equity's jurisdiction to assist the law in this case declared by the statute that would be a very clumsy and expensive way i can't imagine a more expensive way of regulating floodplain harvesting than leaving it to one-off ad hoc injunction applications in the equity division of the supreme court to uh, regulate people's conduct with respect to floodplain harvesting so the, the question really does raise uh, as it were the thing that ought to have been considered more than 100 years ago but if you do take the water resource into public hands where i strongly believe it has to be then it really is part and parcel of that control that you define what people can do what people can't do and what sanctions will follow if the law is disobeyed and with respect to floodplain harvesting that has never been done including up to today because although there are provisions that provide for it to be done as you all know better than anyone else it hasn't yet been done so never the, so although it may not constitute an offence floodplain harvesting may nevertheless depending on the fact situation offend against the water management act and there may be legal consequences for that although as you say leaving it to equity might be clumsy <laughs> yes although that's the sharpest tool there'd be um yeah. I, I think i've got to be really careful about saying it would offend against the water management act um it would be conduct that sits most oddly with the general provision and provisions of the water management act that make water a publicly owned and controlled resource uh, but that doesn't mean it's contrary to the act because um, naturally enough a parliament could in certain circumstances say of a public resource uh, you the people may treat it as if you like the commons so it can be owned by the state for the people without needing regulation that would prevent particular individuals from having recourse to it that is the centuries old notion of the commons so no it doesn't follow that it's against the act but i have to say it's against uh, what might be seen to be the political program of all the water acts of which i'm aware from colonial times uh, and for the last uh, century or more it's against the notion that there ought to be control it doesn't mean there's a defense it doesn't mean there's unlawfulness that it would be sensible to go to court to remedy. It does mean there's a crying need for the legislators to consider what to do. I myself think floodplains harvesting being treated as an aspect of the commons, that is a public resource that anybody can help themselves to as they like, is absurd and totally at odds with the intergovernmental agreements that culminate, for example, in the basin plan. Well, just on the, just on the basin plan, under the basin plan, there is this notion of the cap. That's the legislative requirement to limit surface water extractions to the level of development as at 1 July 1994. Now, if floodplain harvesting wasn't expressly approved in New South Wales and wasn't subject to any licensing, does it follow then that whatever take is being taken through floodplain harvesting? doesn't fall within that cap that legislated cap uh, uh, the short answer is i don't know and if i may um, put that a bit more sharply and that's a sorry reflection on uh, the political um, notion and use 
uh, of the cap. Um, the fact is that dubious legality, and that's as far as I think one can sensibly put it, um, with respect to some or all floodplain harvesting activities, uh, is not at all addressed, <laughs> as, the, as you've made very clear, Mr. Searle. It's not at all addressed in the way in which the cap was negotiated as a concept, let alone understood administratively in, t in, in terms of volumes. Um, I myself think it is far too neat and, and probably wrong an approach to say that no floodplain harvesting activities should ever have been regarded as contributing to the historical usage which constituted the cap. And that would appear to be at odds with what might be called the social justice of a lot of floodplain harvesting being notorious, that is, well understood to be occurring by people who understood they were doing what they were entitled to do. And under the eyes of governments of all stripes that had no objection to it, indeed, in, in a large amount of material historically, not statutes, but other administrative material, plainly regarded it as um, something that, as it were, came with the territory. If your land was the kind of land that would from time to time as city people would call it, suffered floods, uh, you were entitled to take the benefit. Um, those were days, of course, long before that massive, massive uh, turkey nest uh, shaped dams that um, yeah. one can only imagine what gigantic turkeys some of them must have been because indeed. Indeed. Can I ask you this has question? moved on, earth moving has moved on and Lasers have a lot to answer for. Yeah, but you can ask this question because I think my, my time is about to run out. The Commonwealth Water Act that sets out the sort of legislative authorization for the basin plan, um, if if takes of water exceed the caps developed under the plan, um, that would be contrary to the basin plan and the Commonwealth water legislation. Is that the correct understanding? Yes. Yes. And so if, yes. if the state government of New South Wales wanted to put in place a licensing arrangement for floodplain harvesting that had the effect of allowing the take to exceed uh, the cap, that would not be lawful, whether that action was undertaken by the State Department or the State Minister? It would, it be, would, be, un it, it would, be, un it would be unlawful and can lead to um, action uh, under the Commonwealth Water Act, uh, which ultimately uh, would remove from the state uh, its regulation through water sharing plans, water uh, regulation plans, water resource plans, um, control over uh, matters within the state. That would be, I would have thought, uh, in federal terms, a very bad outcome. Uh, it could also lead to more direct legal consequences, such as injunctions. Um, yes, it would be unlawful. Thank you. Our position has expired. expired. Um, we'll move to the crossbench. I'll uh, kick off with a couple just on um, what we, you were just referring to, Mr. Walker. Um, the MDBA, Murray Darling Basin Authority, has made a submission to this inquiry. They attached their floodplain harvesting position statement from June 2019, in which it said, and I'd like your opinion on this if I can. When a new and better understanding of the volume of floodplain harvesting is determined, it is likely that the baseline diversion limit for valleys where floodplain harvesting is occurring will change. Where this results in an increase, this does not mean that there has been growth in floodplain harvesting. A change in the estimates of the baseline diversion limit simply reflects a more pre precise and certain volume of what was already legally being taken. What's your view on that statement by the MDBA? Um, I, I have strong views about it. Um, I'll start with, um, I strongly deprecate uh, the intention that I impute to those who advance that as an argument. Do they or do they not plainly mean that the sustainable diversion limit is affected by the discovery of better information 
concerning uh, a state of affairs at times in the past. Unless there is an answer to that direct question, uh, those words that you've just quoted, with which I'm very familiar, are, uh, in my view, uh, very mischievous. They, they dodge the central question, which has to do with the allocation between uh, the protection or rehabilitation of the system, the hydrological system, against the historical consensus among governments that we, that is the people, have been taking too much. And so the mechanism for controlling that by means that all of us can see transparently, usually volumetric measures of take, require fundamentally under the Water Act and the Basin Plan, the establishment and observance of sustainable diversion limits, SDLs. And the MDBA, not for the first time, does not explain uh, the legal reasoning by which the statement you've read would have any effect in terms of administration. If it means that the SDL floats around by reason of better intelligence being found, then that is simply wrong. Uh, the law stipulates otherwise concerning the adjustment of an SDL. If it means that we should always be alert to getting better information, including about the past, I completely agree. And I find it massively ironic that the MDBA, which devoted resources to denying my Royal Commission access to information, now uh, would uh, like it to appear that it's happy for information uh, to be revealed and improved. I'm very anxious for information to be revealed and improved about historical take from the system. Um, I'm very annoyed, to put it mildly, that the MDBA uh, still will not em engage with the requisite legal analysis of how, in particular, an SDL may be adjusted. It cannot be adjusted by somebody simply producing another research paper. We were, we were, this committee, I think, were, well, I certainly wanted to ask the MDBA these questions myself, but we have issued two invitations to the authority to appear before this committee, both of which they've rejected. Do you have an opinion about that, Mr Walker? Yes, I think it's disgraceful conduct and it's got nothing to do with its legality. Uh, this is meant to be uh, a federal nation, a federal nation. I simply do not understand how the MDBA and any ministers who are affecting this conduct by the MDBA can regard it as in the national interest uh, that there should not be a complete sharing and unafraid exposure to debate and uh, investigation of all all the material, legal, hydrological, economic, agricultural, social, uh, that the MDBA needs to be on top of. And my own view is that it reflects very poorly on the Commonwealth, that it continues, as it has for about 100 years, to regard itself as standing apart from and immune from uh, the investigation capacity of the states. And my own view is that the states ought to do something about it, particularly by stipulating in every intergovernmental agreement that nothing will happen unless there is uh, an unconditional acceptance that the organs of the state uh, can investigate by compelling material from organs of the Commonwealth. Thank you. I think my time's almost... To my, oh, well, it is actually. So it's just uh, beaten by the clock, as they say. So I'll need to pass my uh, uh, time over questions to uh, now, Mr. Mark Benazia. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Walter, for appearing today. Um, in questions, I think to Mr. Sill, you, um, you you talked about, I guess, the the linkage between the Commonwealth and the state, and but also in your in your opinion, you mentioned two thousand and twelve. Um, that was a fairly significant uh, date, though, wasn't it? That the states essentially self-binded themselves to the Commonwealth, um, from which they can actually excise themselves within 28 days. Is that correct? I'm not sure I understood. Um, you, you're talking. 
Um, no, I'm sorry. So I, the, don't, I don't think I did. Understand. So the date, the the, the date twenty, the, the date twenty twelve, yes. particularly November twenty twelve, was when they signed that intergovernmental agreement, which essentially meant the states self binded themselves to to the Commonwealth um, and are able to excise themselves. I just wanted your comment on that with regards to your comments to Mr. Searle, where you said that, um, you know, potentially there could be injunctions on the state because of their not adherence. I, I don't know what it means to self bind. If you mean there was an intergovernmental agreement, what thereafter occurs with respect to the statutory effect of Commonwealth legislation, in particular the Water Act, is a straightforward question of law that has to be obeyed. And Commonwealth law is paramount over state law. I'm not sure whether that is getting at what you're saying. States don't get a choice about whether they comply with applicable Commonwealth legislation. They're bound. Um, you, you mentioned the 1912 Act um, in your advice, and, and we heard evidence on Wednesday from Horn Legal that the Part 8 renewals from 1912 didn't constitute a licence, therefore floodplain harvesting um, it was never licensed, therefore it was illegal. Um, in your view, though, were those Part 8 renewals not necessarily a licence, but at the time considered a property right that had to be transferred to the WMA Act of 2000? I'm aware of historical material, by which I mean what bureaucrats, etc., thought they were doing, which would actually strongly support what you've asked me to consider, that there was this unfortunate analogy drawn between permissions, formal or informal, under the Water Act and property. Now, as a lawyer, I regard that as very sloppy thinking and very unfortunate, but if I may say so, a forgivable notion that is such permissions are plainly valuable and we as humans in society tend to regard things which are valuable as property. That's not always true, obviously. Uh, and so I think you're absolutely right. There's been a, a tradition, a cultural tradition rather than a legal one, that has seen these things as property. One of the difficulties about seeing this property is that then it tends to excite people's indignation about it being taken away without compensation. And um, that is very unfortunate because as you all know better than anyone, um, so-called water rights are always adjustable according to whether it's rained or not. So, so just, yeah, sorry, Mr. Ward, just picking up on on, on that, if um, it was decided to essentially fully extinguish those Part 8 renewals and therefore there would be no floodplain harvesting, would there be a case um, for those people to... Um, I guess, apply for just terms comp compensation. No. Um, given the cultural. No. Yeah. no. That parliament would okay. have to provide for that. Yes. Okay. Parliament could provide for that, but it, no, there's no existing uh, uh, right of that kind. Don't ever forget that the states are not bound by the equivalent of the Commonwealth's 5131. So there's no just terms constitutional requirement binding a state. It depends upon statute from time to time. Okay, and just more on that interaction between the Commonwealth and the state, who who actually between the two has, I, I guess, the responsibility or the right to actually allocate water rights? Is it the Commonwealth or the state? <laughs> A small book could be written in answer to that, and I'm really glad that um, it remains a question in your minds. Uh, the short answer is, is both. That's a typical unsatisfactory answer from a constitutional lawyer, but let me explain. Uh, by means that I've tried to explain in the early chapters of my Royal Commission report, the Commonwealth has undoubted, I think, has undoubted power uh, in a very comprehensive fashion uh, to regulate um, aspects of um, the use of water in the, in the basin. Um, whether it amounts to regulating all aspects of that is open to doubt. On the other hand, the states unquestionably, subject to inconsistent Commonwealth law, do have full power to regulate uh, the resort to waters in, in their territory. Now, there are a couple of not particularly 
um, important constitutional provisions, that is Commonwealth constitutional provisions uh, that justify some footnote here, but not for today's purposes. But by and large, the Commonwealth has large powers, probably not on the face of things as comprehensive as state powers. But I think, as I have set out in my report, Royal Commission report, the Commonwealth powers are broad enough to encompass what they've done in the Water Act. And what they've done in the Water Act, of course, prevails over any inconsistent state legislation by reason of Section 109 of the Constitution. That's a really long winded way of coming back to where I started. Both have powers. It is not one to the exclusion of the other, but in the event of inconsistency, our, constitu our Commonwealth Constitution says the Commonwealth law prevails by rendering the state inconsistent state law inoperative to the extent of the inconsistency. Okay, thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank you. My time's expired. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Walker. We'll now go to questions from the government. Is that Mr. you, Mr. Faraway? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Mr. Walker. Uh, on behalf of this committee, the Clerk of the Parliament um, obviously sought the independent advice from you around the legality of floodplain harvesting practices. I just wanted to confirm in what capacity were you invited to appear before the inquiry today? I was invited by the secretary to the committee. When you say in what capacity, um, I've done a number of things which may have suggested I could say something useful, but that's for others to judge. Uh, that's fine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walker. So I would prefer Sophie Baldwin, the CEO of the lobby group Southern River Irrigators, wrote in the De Deniliquin Pastoral Times on the 14th of September uh, 2021 that the 230,000 levy that has allowed us to engage the services of Brett Walker SC, who is considered one of Australia's most formidable minds on water, uh, it basically goes on that his report is up and coming uh, to the New South Wales Up House Inquiry, confirms SRI's position, and that is that floodplain harvesting has never been legal. I just wanted to confirm for a bit of context uh, around that article. Have your services um, been engaged by SRI irrigators to provide a report to this inquiry? No, not at all. Well, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't mean I haven't had retainers from a number of different people and organisations, but there's no retainer from anybody except the, the clerk uh, on behalf of the committee for this opinion. Yeah, okay, so it's fair to say that your services haven't been retained by SRI to act to matters that are pertinent to this inquiry? For giving the opinion to this inquiry? Yeah, absolutely, not at all. No. There's, no, there's no private, but there are, I have a number of retainers or briefs uh, in relation to water and have had for uh, quite a few years. Um, but none of them, of course, involves the task of giving an opinion to this committee. Thank you. What did your independent advice to this parliamentary committee uh, and inquiry find around the questions it asked uh, to on on the legality of flood, uh, floodplain harvesting practices in New South Wales? Well, as I tried to explain in the opening statement, it's not possible without having facts uh, of particular cases and circumstances fully to explore the legality of what I'll call floodplain harvesting over, say, the last 100 years in light of the 1912 Act. Because the 1912 Act doesn't, in terms, address the question of floodplain harvesting. And if it affects it, it does so indirectly by addressing the question of the use of works for which licences and permits are required. That gives rise to the question whether it follows that every time one's rainfall permitted rainfall runoff dam happens to be filled as well by flood waters through floodplain flows, as opposed to simple rainfall runoff, that your subsequent resort to that water as a farmer or grazier, whether that's floodplain harvesting of a kind which is beyond the use for which the dam uh, was constructed. Now, that'll be a factual question to which it's not obvious to me at all. There'll be a simple yes or no answer 
consistently regardless of individual circumstances. So the 1912 Act, alas, does not, in my view, address the question of floodplain harvesting as such. And our tradition legally, of course, is that a law that doesn't address an activity can scarcely be regarded as one that has created an offence in relation to it. That would be absurd and tyrannical. Thank you. So just obviously you, you touched on obviously almost needing a legal profession to understand water policy and law, um, which not policy, not policy, oh, not policy, water law. You, you, you are the bosses of policy. Yes. Yeah. Well, trying to be um, the with water law, I suppose I would I would go on to say that in your advice on the 15th of September, you did say that floodplain harvesting was a legal activity and was not unlawful, though. Yes, I've, I've expressed what I've expressed. Uh, please don't misunderstand me. You talk about policy and law. Um, well, it's a it law. Be, it should be obvious from my opinion, as I hope it's obvious from my Royal Commission report. But floodplain harvesting is an activity that nowadays is crying out for regulation. And all regulation means that to conduct the regulated activity otherwise than in accordance with the regulation will be an offence or should be an offence, or at least should expose you to um, an injunction. Um, so don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying it should always have been lawful, far from it. I'm not saying it should now be unrestricted and lawful. That would be terrible. Um, but I am saying that I was asked questions about offences and crime is a serious matter. And uh, no, there are not offences that operate at the moment. So just moving on, obviously you're saying that we're crying out for regulation. And I made a note earlier, it was about 9.20, I think, um, um, you know, crying out for legislators to, to be involved. You just sort of said, obviously, also people are crying out for regulation. So when you look at environmental outcomes, in your view, how will more water flow to the environment if floodplain harvesting regulations are not in place and if it's not licensed, not regulated, not metered, uh, and, not, uh, and if there is no compliance enforced, how will we get more water flow to the environment? I think that's a really... That goes to the heart of the matter. Um, if if floodplain harvesting um, were um, simply allowed to develop according to local practices without monitoring or regulation or enforcement of limits, then I think it is obvious to everyone that there is likely to be a reduction uh, of an amount that is unknown but must be material in what I'll call return flows into rivers. Now, that's by no means the only environmental or hydrological consequence of unregulated and unmonitored floodplain harvesting, but it's one of the most obvious ones. And so, it's a way of answering your question by saying, of course, there will be an effect not just on the environmental um, aspirations that the Basin Plan seeks to advance, but also on uh, Indigenous enjoyment of flows and, uh, very importantly, consumptive use downstream. Um, I think it's no more complex than that if you prevent water that otherwise would have flowed back into a river from flowing back into a river, then the river won't be as full as it would have been otherwise. Just following on, Mr. Walker, what do you believe then would, uh, like, what are the native title rights, in your opinion, over water? Um, uh, as I'm sure you realise, that also is a matter that is dependent upon particular circumstances that would that require to be proved under the uh, Native Title Act um, according to particular circumstances. But there is no doubt, as that stat Commonwealth statute makes clear, that waters can be the subject of those traditional rights. 
um, they they don't amount to what in uh, terms of uh, settlers' law um, is ownership or control over water, but it certainly involves matters that can be described as they have to be in a in the determination of native title by respect to uh, use of water and uh, uh, social and uh, sacred significance of water uh, responsibilities as much as rights but you can't generalize it all depends upon the individual determinations for the individual claimants claimant groups um, but on any view of it and and correctly, uh, the Commonwealth Water Act, um, the Basin Plan, um, and I think now a social consensus uh, requires that they always be taken into account. In the South Australian Royal Commission, and obviously we note your opening, I note your opening remarks, and obviously in your capacity then as the Royal Commissioner, you, you say that licensing and uh, metering regimes for floodplain harvesting is necessary and remarkable that it has not been implemented in New South Wales. You also say that there is no objection in principle to the approach canvassed by, the New, South, by New South Wales that would require floodplain diversions to be licensed. Um, you know, it's a pretty clear sort of statement. Can you expand on that just a little bit for me and for the committee? Yes. Um... You've got to pinch yourself really to remember that it was in 2004 that by an intergovernmental agreement for the so-called National Water Initiative, uh, it was accepted that there needed to be, among other things, a close attention to floodplain harvesting. Uh, it was agreed in that that the states, including New South Wales, would implement such matters by 2011, it's ten, 10 years ago. And the things that required to be implemented certainly included the recording, that is the study and description, the licensing, that is the regulation by control with limits, and a robust compliance and monitoring system. And, and none of that has happened. So my comment is um, how terrible, what a great shame, and I do wish you would hurry up. Thank you very much, Mr. Walker. On uh, on that, people uh, got to stop disallowing it. <laughs> on that uh, unequivocal note, we have run out of time, I'm afraid. So thank you once again for appearing before this committee. It was much appreciated, as was the advice that you uh, furnished as well uh, earlier last week. So thank you very much. We have finished this session. We'll have a very short break. We will be back at 9.55 with Enra. Thank you. I just wish you well with what you're doing. It's very important. Thank you, Mr. Walker.
Hi Grant, just uh, checking. I can see your video and you nice and clearly. Kate Famine here. Um, just checking your whether you can hear me okay and whether we can hear you. You're coming through loud and clear, Kate. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Good. We'll just um, give it another few seconds until we tick over and members are back. Checking, Mr. Barnes, that you've got the uh, the cards, the words for the oath or affirmation as well. That's a good question. No, I, I do not have them before me, beg your pardon. Uh, I do now. Thank you for the reminder. Okay, no worries. Okay. Welcome to this, welcome back to the next session with the Natural Resources Access Regulator. Um, we have Mr. Grant Barnes, who we have to uh, ensure you're sworn in, Mr. Barnes. So if you could please state your name and position title, swear either an oath or an affirmation, the words of which you have. My name is Grant Barnes. I'm the Chief Regulatory Officer for the Natural Resources Access Regulator. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Barnes. Would you like to begin by making a short opening statement? Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Firstly, may I acknowledge that I join this inquiry today from Gurungai lands, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. The Natural Resources Access Regulator is an independent statutory body, and NRA is independent in that its operations, including compliance and enforcement, are not subject to the direction of politicians, to bureaucrats or to external entities. Unlike most other publicly funded organisations in New South Wales, the agency that I lead is accountable to an independent board. Both the board's independence and limitations on ministerial input are enshrined in the Natural Resources Access Regulator Act. Independence is a core component of the recommendations made by Mr Ken Matthews prior to NRA's formation. Mr Matthews advocated that decisions about compliance and enforcement should be independent of water policy making, water planning, water regulation making and water delivery services for customers. The NRA Act confers significant powers and discretion on myself as Chief Regulatory Officer and on the Board. Given these extensive powers, an accountability framework is in place to ensure those powers are used appropriately and legally. These mechanisms include the Board Charter, Staff Code of Conduct, and ethics and integrity obligations. Further, NRA is subject to the oversight of the New South Wales Ombudsman, the Audit Office of New South Wales, and the Commonwealth Inspector General of Water Compliance. Assertions made by some submitters to this inquiry that question our independence are strongly refuted and cannot be left to be stand unchallenged. As such, and under the instruction of the Board Chair, the Honourable Craig Knowles, these matters were referred to the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Barnes. We'll now go to questions from the opposition. Uh, Mr. Sell, you're kicking off again. M. Chair. Thanks. No, I think oh, it's Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Thanks, Mr. Jackson. thanks, Chair. My apologies. Thanks, Mr. Barnes. Um, Rose Jackson here. I, I wanted to ask um, in relation to the um, ambiguous legal status um, of floodplain harvesting, that is one of the, in fact, it's the first terms of, term of reference of this inquiry, um, and the pre-existing Crown solicitor's advice that I'm sure you're aware of that essentially suggested that the practice was probably illegal. Why did NRA exercise its discretion not to undertake any compliance work in relation to floodplain harvesting? So, um... Our goal is that water law is complied with 100% of the time. Uh, we do so to ensure that the many water users who do consistently apply, uh, comply with the law uh, get a fair go. And so during the first two years of our operation, a flood event was something that many people could only have wished for. Now, as the drought began to break, the use of Section 324 temporary water restrictions by the Minister of Water and her delegates provided a clear mechanism uh, to protect first flush events and enable enforcement. NRA has actively managed 
and monitored all Section 324 orders imposed. We did so using a combination of boots on the ground uh, and eyes in the sky, thousands of square kilometres of floodplain and thousands of storages were assessed. We were very pleased with the rates of compliance were consistently high. Now, for example, uh, 561 storages were remotely monitored in the Lower Macquarie and in the Namoi over a 10 day event. 57 sites of interest were identified. Following more detailed analysis, 10 storages in six properties were referred for in inspection. Five landholders were found to be fully compliant with the law. One land landholder was found with irregularities related to logbooks, and they received an official caution. In the absence of temporary water restrictions, we have further developed our remote monitoring capabilities as previously described, as I will uh, describe later on, if able. We've deployed this technology during all flood events in 2020 and 2021. Of the most recent events, we determined no irregularities with the first two that we monitored. We did detect activities of interest during the analysis of an event in 2021, and we have referred 26 clusters for investigation. These matters are being actively investigated. The full range of enforcement actions are available to us should we find breaches of the law that are substantiated by the evidence and where the criminal standard of beyond all reasonable doubt is probable. So your assertion is that you have undertaken compliance activity, but at this point, no one has found to be non-compliant as opposed to you have not undertaken that compliance activity in relation to floodplain harvesting in the first place. Is that correct? So I've given you a detailed answer as to how we actively monitor and surveil flood events um, using both a combination of boots on the ground uh, and our eyes in the sky program. Um, we are able to detect with a high degree of accuracy the movement of water, the abstraction of water, the storage of water and the use of water. Now, using that technology, we do take action uh, and we've taken considerable ones over the course of the last three years. Uh, so, for instance, uh, there are two components to floodplain harvesting. There is the use of the infrastructure and then there's the use of the water. So it's with respect to infrastructure, um, this has been a focus for us for um, since our inception. We've undertaken 852 investigations regarding the unauthorised construction or use of a flood work or water supply work. 338 investigations have been finalised with a determination that a breach of the Water Management Act has occurred. These relate to unauthorised levies, channels and banks on the floodplain. 200 of them relate to unauthorised flood works. Now, of those 338 matters where we finalised a determination of a breach, we've issued 205 directions, 155 formal warnings, 149 penalty infringement notices and have undertaken eight prosecutions. I could go on and describe the work that we've undertaken um, with respect to water allegedly taken without a water access license. Similar, 714 allegations have been made. We have finalised investigations with a determination of a breach in 232 instances. We have applied 286 sanctions. These are 122 formal warnings, 75 penalty infringement notices, one financial sanction under Section 60G, two enforceable undertakings and 12 prosecutions. I can ensure the committee that we take very seriously our role to enforce the law. We do so credibly. We do so on the basis of the evidence and we do so in a manner that holds ourselves accountable uh, and, and transparent. So I'm taking it um, from the evidence that you've given so far, and, and I think perhaps the um, comment that you made in your opening statement that you reject evidence that um, NRA acts under the instruction or with the direction of DPIE in relation to compliance on floodplain harvesting. Is that the, is that, is that the evidence that you were alluding to when you said that you've made a you've referred that to ICAC is that 
what you were referring to? Uh, that is true. Uh, there has been commentary uh, in the media. There have been written submissions to this committee. There have been verbal statements made that call into question the independence of NRA. Uh, I refute that absolutely and uh, believe, as does my chair, that matters that go to questioning NRA's independence should be referred to ICAC. We've made referrals ourselves. That is the independent body uh, that is uh, able to make those adjudications uh, and we leave it with them. Perhaps, I mean, might might just ask this last question and then um, give my colleague, Mr. Beach, the opportunity to ask some questions. Perhaps you might describe in your terms then your relationship with DPIE, because obviously you, you do have a relationship with them. They do provide information to you. Um, you're in correspondence with them. That So how, how, in your words, in your terms, do you describe your relationship with DPIE and the information that they are providing to you? So quite simply, the department is the agency that makes the rules. Uh, we are reliant on them to do so in a robust uh, manner, in a credible manner, in a means by which we can then perform our task to enforce those rules. Uh, water regulation is incredibly complex, as, as no doubt the committee um, understands through its inquiries into floodplain harvesting. Uh, we have a statutory obligation to deliver an effective, efficient, accountable and transparent uh, regime for water compliance. We are highly reliant upon the department uh, to enable us to do that work. Uh, in addition, uh, I myself and my staff are employees of the department. Uh, we rely on the department for HR advice, for financial advice, for ICT support and otherwise. But in terms of the work that we do in compliance and enforcement, that is absolutely independent of the department. Uh, the decisions that the board and I make about what actions we take in enforcing the law are ours and ours only. Uh, 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 Mr Beach, you can jump in, I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, um, thanks, Rose. Thanks, Mr Barnes. Can I, I just, I really have just one, one question and it relates to, um, uh measurement metering um the, the you know the gauging stations within within river systems um and the capacity that that provides for you to undertake your compliance work what what investment needs to take place uh to make sure that if floodplain harvesting were to be regulated uh that we actually have that measurement regime in place that would assist you with your compliance work no, uh Thanks, um, Nick. Look, as a, as a um, regulatory professional, the, 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 the absence of the licensing framework uh, for floodplain harvesting, as was envisaged by government policy from 2013, is problematic. It's problematic for water users and it's problematic for the regulator because the critical elements of the licensing framework is the imposition of clear and enforceable conditions on the activity. The framework also proposes metering requirements that enable adherence to those license conditions to be monitored and enforced. So whilst I appreciate the debate persists as the legality of the activity, what is absolutely beyond dispute is the fact that the status quo is absent enforceable license conditions and devoid of robust measurement and monitoring requirements. So activating the floodplain harvesting framework will set the rules for how and how much water can be accessed from the floodplain, it'll do so in a way that ensures certainty for license holders and makes clear their legal obligations. It's imperative that if this activity was to be licensed, that it comes with robust monitoring and metering requirements. Absolutely essential, Nick. Okay, thank you. I'll hand over to uh, Adam Searle. Um, thank you, Mr. Barnes, for coming along, Adam Searle. Um, Mr. Barnes, I think you've been provided a bundle of documents by the Secretariat this morning. Do you have those? Uh, yes, I received an email from the Secretariat uh, uh, yeah, four minutes before 10 o'clock. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. Could I ask you to open that bundle of documents? I've got some questions that relate to them. Um, the first page is an email from Dan O'Connor at DPIE to Jim Bentley at DPIE and others. 
And I understand that you're not the author of this document, or indeed it seems that the recipient, but nevertheless, the, the, the tone of the email suggests a great degree of closeness between DPIE water and NRA. It, it talks about uh, NRA exercising its discretion and then it says we, brackets, DPIE water slash NRA will need to have a clear position on this as soon as possible. Now that does suggest a great degree of synchronicity at a policy level between your organisation and DPIE water. How do you explain that if, as you say on your evidence, that you uh, are a fully independent body? So um, clearly I'm not the author. Uh, I am no. identified along with a number of others uh, as a CC. Uh, Jim Bentley is yes, the primary yep. author. Sent um, rather late at night, wasn't it? Um, yes, it was. I don't recall. Yeah, have it these days. <laughs> I don't recall receiving the email myself um, at the time. Just reading it quickly here. Uh, look, I, I mean, I, I just suggested, at least from a from a DPIE water uh, perspective, yeah. they seem to regard uh, NRA as a kind of adjunct of DPIE water. That would be a fair reading of that, wouldn't it? Uh, if it's a fair reading, it is an incorrect imposition on on NRA. We are not a partner with the department when it comes to enforcing the law uh, in a fair and firm transparent and accountable manner. That is uh, my responsibility and that of the board. Absolutely refute that, uh, that there is any imposition here as to our independence. Uh, the, the author Mr. has Barnes, written an email. Barnes, did there. you challenge that at the time? Did you write a response saying, uh, what's this we? Uh, so just let it go. I, I, I've received this document from you just just minutes ago i've read it uh, i don't okay. i'm happy for you to take this on notice but i'm just sure. interested to know whether you challenged that supposition on the part of mr uh, of dpie water perhaps we can move on to page three sure. um it refers at page three to two cases where this has occurred is that a reference to floodplain harvesting breaches and can you provide us any details of that or do you just simply not know you need to take that on notice as well. I'll take that on on notice. I see it, it's reference to a Sydney Morning Herald article, so that would uh, yep. require me to do a bit of um, yeah. investigation. If you could come back to us on notice as to where those what those two matters were and where they're up to. Certainly, happy to. Okay, um, page four uh, refers to uh, an early draft of the board papers to be discussed at the executive. Um, and the following pages, uh, page six sets out the, the the policy or the problem issue, which is the uh, prime the minister's office water users and broader community asking NRA to make its position clear in response to the disallowance of the exemption by the upper house. Page seven outlines a number of options for the board, um, and, op and then the following page, page eight has an analysis, a sort of pros and cons of those three options. Can you tell the committee which option uh, the board adopted and why? Uh, look, I'd, I'd have to take that in notice because it'll be in the in the minute of, of that mm -hmm. meeting. Um, but what I certainly can say uh, on the record now uh, is the board expects uh, myself and my office to provide them with free and frank advice. Uh, we have done so, uh, I believe, in this instance. Uh, it came at a time uh, immediately after the disallowance when there was considerable uh, and numerous requests to NRA for it to communicate what it was going to do as a result of the disallowance. Uh, the board sought advice. That advice was pro provided in a written form, some of which um, you have presented to me back now. Uh, and as I say, I can give you the answer to what option was progressed uh, when I check the minute, and I'll take that on notice. Okay, of the three options, the first option was that NRA could indicate that as floodplain harvesting is now not exempt and licences and approvals are not issued, taking water in this matter is potentially a breach of the Water Management Act. But the second option would be, was that as a temporary measure, NRA requests that those taking flood water consistent with floodplain housing policy, identify their intent. Um, and then the third option was that 
allowing the take of floodplain harvesting by water users with a registration of interest lodged with the department in line with the government's policy. And you see the pros and cons there. Um, you saying you don't recall which option NRA adopted? So what, what I can say, because uh, I, I don't clearly don't want to mislead the committee, so with respect, I will um, give you an absolute assurance by um, a question I noticed as to what option uh, I can uh, testify today that uh, NRA has done uh, in this instance, as we've always done, uh, we've enforced the law and the law as it currently stands on, on the books. And um, in my previous answer, I've demonstrated uh, to the committee uh, just how extensive that enforcement of the law has been. Uh, the agency I lead takes its role very, very seriously. Uh, and we have shown in 31 instances, for instance, uh, prosecutions being taken to the court. So with respect yeah. to floodplain harvesting, uh, with the disallowance and the uncertainty that um, that brought about, uh, we obtained uh, legal advice. That legal advice was required uh, to support the carriage of investigations that were underway. It was also used uh, to inform our compliance approach. Uh, from that point, uh, we continued, as I said before, to actively monitor using some uh, very sophisticated technology, the movement, abstraction, storage and use of water. As a result of that monitoring, um, I advised before that there have been 26 instances uh, where we uh, believe there could be a breach of the law related to floodplain harvesting activity. Those instances have been referred to investigate to my investigators, and they are investigating those matters right now. And a full range of enforcement tools are available to us and will be deployed uh, once we've substantiated a breach based on the evidence that we've obtained. Okay. I think my time is about to run out. Can I ask you to look at page 20 of that bundle? Uh, which is a letter from you to Ms. Baldwin of the Southern Riverina Irrigators, and also look at page 18. There seems to be a discrepancy between the advice you provided Ms. Baldwin and your own internal uh, advice about how many storages greater than 1,000 megalitre megalitres uh, were being referred to. Can you explain to the committee what that, why that discrepancy was there? That is. It was a very different number you provided to Ms. Baldwin than you appear to have been provided internally by Mr. Johnston. Um, I'm scrolling rapidly. I'm reading as quickly as I can. Um, I'm going sure. to take that one on notice if I may, sir. Sure. Um, I think my time may have expired, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I move to questions from the crossbench. Um, Mr. Barnes, just to be clear, just to, in terms of the last question from Mr. Searle, the just wondering how, like in terms of internal um, advice in relation to a number of structures um, that Southern Riverina irrigators were asking was in the Northern Basin. Just wondering um, how, I think you told them, I think you, you said internally that there was greater than 560 storage storages over 1,000 megalitres and 840 storages under 1,000 megalitres. You, you wrote to Russell Johnston in your department and then a few days later, you wrote to Southern Riverina Irrigators and told them that in fact, the, there were only 373 storages greater than 1,000 megalitres and 693 storages less than 1,000 megalitres. I mean, I, said, I know you said you'd take that on notice, but you should surely um, there's some kind of light you could shed on why we lost several hundred storages um, in those few days between internal communications and external? I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation that explains the, the discrepancy. Uh, but again, look, I'll need to take that on notice with respect. I've only just got these documents. 
I wanted to turn to an opinion piece that was published in um, the land on the 12th of October. The opinion piece is called um, the opinion piece is called uh, clearing muddy waters. Um, you're aware of that opinion piece? Yes, I wrote it. Okay. Did um, why did Water Minister uh, Belinda Pavey's office have to approve that opinion piece? So we have a protocol with the minister where we uh, give notice to them of an intention to engage with the media. Uh, now, I think you're referring to an email that uh, I, I have seen where a, uh, an employee, uh, where someone not employed by NRA has inferred that the minister will need, the minister's office will need to review the documents. That, that is an error. That is not the protocol. And the practice, as I say, is the communications that come out of my office are constructed independent of the minister, and it's in, done equally independent of the department. Uh, we own our voice, and we have the means uh, via the protocol of communicating directly to the minister. We do, uh, as you'd appreciate, in terms of no surprises, give notice to the minister's office uh, when op-eds are being done, when media releases go out, when I speak with Michael Condon in the New South Wales uh, Country Hour. They do not uh, review and they do not um, endorse or check off our media engagements or releases. So that opinion piece did not go to the minister before it was published in the land? Uh, so let me be clear, it went to the minister for the officer's information. It was not reviewed by them. Uh, so it, may, it was read by them clearly, uh, but any advice uh, that's inferred that, that suggested that they had an, uh, an influence over that text, I, I strongly refute it, did not happen. Okay, so in that opinion piece, you suggested that the 2020 disallowance by the New South Wales Upper House of the floodplain harvesting regulations created uncertainty and led to an ambiguous environment. How did the disallowance create uncertainty? The, this, this act, the Water Management Act, is Byzantine in its complexity, uh, in its construction, uh, in the multiple hierarchies of sharing plans uh, down to various instruments. Uh, the complexity inherent makes it very difficult for water users to understand their obligations, to consistently comply with them. It is difficult for us to monitor. It is difficult for us to enforce. It is a complex beast. Um, a licensing framework that is envisaged removes considerably that complexity, making it much clearer to water users what are their obligations, much clearer to us about how we can enforce those. That is what I'm referring to. Thank you, Mr. Bunn. So in other words, before the disallowance, I don't think there was any certainty. So before you, I think you just d described um, an uncertain environment in terms of the regulatory framework for floodplain harvesting before before the disallowance. Anyway, it, but Sorry. your opinion piece suggests that it was a disallowance that created uncertainty. No, no yeah. So, so what was in my mind when I wrote that is uh, water users who had been actively participating uh, in, in preparing for the enactment or, or the the conferral of these licences had been engaged for many, many years. It had been policy and still is of the New South Wales government since 2013. So there was a clear pathway to licensing this activity um, that provided some clarity and some certainty. The disallowance um, was, was what, I'm, what I said at the time, uh, created some ambiguity and some an uncertainty as to when or if uh, that, that uh, the activity would ever be licensed. So on the 18th of May 2021, NRA put out a statement to um, irrigate, as I understand, that said any landholder considering floodplain harvesting may wish to seek their own legal advice. Again, was this coming in conjunction with Minister Pavey's office? No. So did Minister Pavey know that you were putting that out at that time? Uh, so the protocol we have with the minister's offices is we give notice in advance of, of an intention to engage with the media via a media release or other ones, and I can 
just assume as uh, that we were consistent with that protocol. Can I just check though, this isn't a media statement. This is a statement to irrigators. Does Minister Pavey have to check the correspondence that you right. as the independent regulator have with irrigators and landholders? No, absolutely not. So do you think that this statement was checked with Minister Pavey before it was issued? Uh, not, not to my recollection. It would be highly unusual if, if that was the case. So the this was a statement that said that any landholder considering floodplain harvesting may wish to seek their own legal advice so why is nra as the regulator telling farmers to seek their own legal advice when it comes to floodplain harvesting uh, because at the time uh, we were getting repeated calls uh, both directly and via the media for NRA to make statements as to the legality of floodplain harvesting. It is not my role as a regulator to provide legal opinion. My, my job is to enforce the law. Uh, I leave questions of legality to the lawyers. Uh, it is not for me as a regulatory professional to provide that legal advice. We also thought it was prudent uh, to do so because of the very complex and often bespoke circumstances that water users and landholders have when they're um, accessing water, the way their infrastructure is set up, uh, how it's used and deployed is, is really um, uh, quite often is quite unique. There is typically not the standard answer that one can provide that fits all. Hence, the advice at the time, and, and we would continue to do so, that if, if there was any doubt that a water user might have about the legality of their own uh, own operations, they should seek legal advice. So, so if a farmer has their own privately obtained legal advice that says it's okay for them to float, um, undertake floodplain harvesting, does NRA then just leave them alone? Uh, can you, and can you imagine, like, just I'm trying to think of all the different landholders seeking different private legal advice. And what, how on earth NRA can be the independent regulator enforcing compliance with the law if you're you, if you're encouraging 600 or so or more landholders to seek their own private legal advice? So, in the, in the absence of clear statements to legality at the time, uh, and repeated requests both directly and through the media for us to clarify the situation. We made it clear at the time, and I'll do so again today, that it's not our role to make declarations of legality or otherwise. That is for the lawyers to make and and my and and and, and, and others, not not for us. Now when it comes to our investigations, uh, they are done on a case by case basis, uh, considering the individual circumstances that are presented to us, the evidence that we collect, and, and also an evaluation of the numerous discretionary factors uh, that, um, that are before us. We use that information to determine um, what course of action we take when we substantiate a breach of law. Whether a, a water user has taken legal advice before or not um, is a matter for them uh, and not for us. Thank you, Mr Barnes. My time's expired. Mr Mark Benazio. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Barnes. My questions uh, r relate to metering, um, in particular the current metering reforms, and then obviously how that will translate into metering floodplain harvesting if and when uh, regulation is passed. Now, you've recently reported that 45% of large irrigators in Tranche 1 didn't have accurate meters. However, there seems to be around 411 missing sites that you failed to report on. So how many irrigators are we talking about there in that 411 missing sites? So we report the number of works, not number of sites, not number of approvals, not number of entities, not number of landholders, not number of water users. We report the number of works. Now So how many works are, how many works are missing then that you can't so find? We inspected 715 works across the period of April and May. We did so as part of our compliance campaign for the non-urban metering rollout. 
Now, water users in that first tranche, those with works greater than 500 millimetres, um, were obliged to comply with these regulations from 1 December 2020. Now, we promoted our approach to compliance to stakeholders in the years leading up to that first deadline. We made very clear what our expectations were uh, and we were very fair and continue to be so in terms of encouraging water users to demonstrate best endeavours. Now, three months after that first deadline had elapsed, we advised stakeholders that our compliance campaign was commencing. We began with a desktop audit, which was then followed up by a phone survey of water users. And then we undertook the field inspections of those 715 works. The additional ones uh, not inspected at the time were works that were subject to ongoing investigations, were works that were owned uh, by the government and maintained by Water New South Wales, and a couple of works that we hadn't yet got on farm to inspect. Uh, of the works that we did inspect, that's 715, we found about half of those were out of scope for the first tranche because they were either inactive, that was they were never constructed or had been decommissioned, or we found a small proportion where the size of the work was smaller than what was on the approval. So of about the 360 odd that were in scope that we did um, inspect, 45% of those at the time were unable to demonstrate that the meter met the accuracy requirements specified by law. Okay, so you've re you, you've reported that 36% of those of those sites or the customer details were actually incorrect. So what's being done what's been done about this given that you utilize water account data from Water New South Wales and they essentially have a they've got a, essentially a 36% error rate in their data. Why aren't you publicly taking them to task over their <laughs> their tardy um, accounting? You know if if yeah, you know, if we go back to your statement to the chair where you said you own your own voice, one would assume that you would take Water New South Wales to account for providing you with faulty information. The the uh, accurate details in the water accounting system uh, is is an absolute necessity. Uh, now the onus to keep details accurate is on the water user. Uh, they have an obligation to advise uh, Water New South Wales. Um, as to the contact details, uh, they're also obliged to keep their uh, various approvals and licenses uh, up to date. And there's mechanisms through Water New South Wales by which they can do that. Uh, I can absolutely assure you that we've communicated uh, clearly and on, and on numerous occasions uh, to Water New South Wales our findings, uh, both in terms of the uh, accuracy of contact information uh, and in terms of the accuracy of, of the various uh, water approvals and licenses. Now, this information that we've conveyed to them is something that they already knew and uh, have uh, made numerous commitments uh, to work with water users to address, and they're continuing to do so. Okay, so what are your steps going forward in terms of managing um, compliance? And if we go into trench two, where you're looking at possibly up to upwards of 7,500 to 8,000 um, works that you will need to inspect, um, you know, how many of them do we know are active or actually have a pump or pipe? Do we have those figures? Uh, so we're we're working on on that at the at the moment. Uh, we are we, we our working assumption is the uh, proportion of inactivity of inactive works that we determined in tranche one will be uh, similar in tranche two, uh, and we're using some uh, pretty sophisticated uh, mathematical algorithms and so on behind the scenes to um, to come to a, a more accurate determination. Uh, it's of our, clearly it's, it's, it's an interest of us because we want to deploy uh, on farm where we know a high likelihood that the works are active rather than going to large proportions of inactive sites. And what's that mathematical modeling or data telling you in terms of those, those percentages that may be unaccounted for or out of scope? Uh, that it's high, it's, uh, that there are a, a large proportion of works um, 
that are not active despite what's shown on the on the works approvals uh, and you might know this colloquially is, is um, the sleepers and dozers is there's, there's lots of instruments out there held by water users that that haven't been activated for various reasons or at some point in time have been decommissioned uh, and simply the task of informing water new south wales of that fact tagging the work as inactive hasn't been done why hasn't it been done uh, look, I, I could speculate. Um, uh, lots of reasons. Uh, well, do, you, do you think Water New South Wales has a responsibility to follow that up? With, I think the, know, based on their their, their data, the, their county data. The onus is on the water user to keep their contact information up to date. If I was to move house next 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 month, go somewhere else, I'm obliged to update my contact information on my driver's license. Uh, these are simple and well understood obligations uh, that extend um, quite commonly in many regulatory regimes. Now, yes, but there's, all, there's also an there's all, I'm going to stop you. There's also an obligation of the agency where those details are held. If that person does not adhere to updating their details, there are consequences. And it seems like Water New South Wales is either not giving you the job of enforcing those consequences of inaccurate details, or they're not doing it themselves. There is a corresponding responsibility of Water New South Wales to follow up um, that inaccurate data. Yes, there's an obligation of the individual user, but Water New South Wales also has an obligation to, you know, I guess, issue consequences for a fa you know, that failure to oblige. I don't detect a, t a, a question there. That sounds a statement. Well, the, well, well, do you agree with that statement? Uh, that Water said, New South Wales also has a responsibility, um, like other, like Service New South Wales, like the Firearms Registry, other agencies. If you don't, inf if you don't update your details, there are consequences. Whether they're fines, uh, infringements, whatever, there are consequences. And it seems Water New South Wales aren't fulfilling their responsibility um, in in doing that. Do you agree? Oh, I think there is a uh, angry little uh, triangle where Grant Barnes was. <laughs> that is like the spinning wheel of death for uh, the old computers. Grant, can you hear us? Doesn't seem so. Okay, well, the secretary will be trying to get Mr. Barnes back. Um, just pause for a second. Sorry about that, folks. There he is. Okay. Happy okay, Mr. Barnes, did you get the last? Did you get the last question from Mr. Benaziak? Uh, if it was in relation to uh, Warden New South Wales and, and what they were doing with respect to updating user information, um, yes, I did. Uh, and my answer was that we have informed New South Wales of, of, of our findings and, and they, are, um, they, they are taking action. What is that action they're taking, Mr. Barnes? I think time has expired, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Sorry, no, no, it hasn't. I've got 45 seconds remaining here. Keep going, Mr. Benaziak. So what action are they taking, given that they do have a responsibility as an agency, like other agencies, to actually um, deal with people that aren't keeping their data up to date? What action are they taking, to your knowledge? I'm, I'm very happy to speak to the actions that NRA are taking, uh, both in metering and if we got back to floodplain harvesting, I can answer questions in relation to that. I cannot speak for Warden New South Wales. I'll pass to the government. Uh, the government. Okay, who's um, Mr. Faraway again, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, and good morning, Mr. Barnes. Um, I just wanted to confirm if you can just answer just some some facts or get some um, of these numbers uh, onto the record. Um, how many farms currently floodplain harvesting would have metering, and how many farms currently floodplain harvesting will need meters if they're issued with a license. So the information that, that I have 
uh, and that was referenced before by way of a letter to Ms Baldwin was that 373 storages greater than 1,000 megalitres were being assessed for water supply work approvals. Uh, and there were 693 storages less than 1,000 megalitres that were being assessed for water supply work approvals. Um, all those storages would require uh, uh, monitoring and metering. Uh, and there is, and the regulation that was disallowed specifies uh, as to what require what those requirements would be. Um, Mr. Barnes, are there any farms currently floodplain harvesting in the northern valleys who will not receive a floodplain ha floodplain harvesting license? And do you think that these farms um, would need to remove these floodplain harvesting infrastructure without the license? Uh, the, the first part of your question, I, I suggest you hold that one over for my departmental colleagues who are managing the, the, the policy. The latter part, what might one do? Uh, look, the, the circumstances I've said before uh, 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 can be complex and specific to, to farm. One of the things that, that I understand quite clearly, uh, these storages aren't exclusively used for floodplain harvesting. They form many purposes. They can hold high security water, supplementary water, they can be um, uh, stock and domestic water, all sorts of things. So a storage that may not be part of a floodplain harvesting licensing regime um, doesn't necessarily see it uh, needing to be removed, particularly um, if that storage um, is, is authorised uh, uh, under the Act. Okay, thank you. Um, do you think that more water would have gone to the environment if um, if floodplain harvest, floodplain harvesting regulations had been not disallowed. Yes. Um, well, so just moving on to some particular areas, do you think that the Macquarie marshes and Guida wetlands receive more water than they currently do if the government issues licences uh, as they are currently proposing? In particular, obviously with the with Macquarie marshes and the Guida wetlands. So, in the absence of a licensing regime where there are conditions on um, its use, constraints on volume, in absence of that, uh, I think one can fairly conclude that there is water that um, was grown, that was used to grow crops that could have been uh, in the Macquarie marshes or in the Guida wetlands. Uh, Mr. Barnes, in your opinion, would you believe that more water would have gone to the environment if the government policy to license and meter floodplain harvesting had been in place for the last 12 months, for the last year? Yes. Uh, you released, uh, or NRA released a media statement saying Terrell National Park needed to undertake metering on its works approvals uh, for the large banks on its former irrigation farm. My question is, Mr. Barnes, will Terrell need to be metered if it has works which direct floodwaters away from the river or into, into storages? And are you aware of what meters will be installed at Terrell? So we conducted an extensive investigation into the operation at Terrell uh, and determined and, and uh, communicated publicly uh, that uh, there was no breach uh, of law in the operation. Uh, we did, however, uh, believe it appropriate uh, for uh, measurement of uh, the water use on site to be imposed, and we have done so by way of issuing a formal, direct, a formal direction to the National Parks and Wildlife Service. That direction requires them to install uh, metering equipment uh, uh, by, by, within a certain period of time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barnes. What is NRA's current staffing and funding levels? <clears throat> point of order, point of order, please, uh, Madam Chair. Um, the point of order has been taken. It's just to do. I, I, I fail to understand how these quest, this question is within um, the terms of reference of um, of this hearing. Um, if the government wanted to do a budget estimates with NRA, this would be well and truly within 
um, those questionings, but my, I'd ask the government to ask questions about the terms of reference of this hearing, not the ins and outs of the workings of NRA. Well, to, to the point of order, Madam Chair, we're talking about the legality, obviously, of floodplain harvesting. We've got the, uh, the regulator in front of us who would be responsible for regulating this licence if it was uh, uh, implemented, and we're asking about their funding and staffing levels and resources uh, within their agency to possibly regulate this if it's licensed. How is that not part of the terms of reference? How does that yeah. not uh, a question that's not allowed? Thank you. I've, I've, yeah, I'll, um, there is no point of order. Continue on with the questioning. So would you please represent the question? Yes, yeah, certainly, Mr Barnes. Um, I just wanted to know what is NRA's current staffing and funding levels? So uh, staffing, uh, we have uh, 187 staff spread across 21 office locations pre-COVID. Uh, that number uh, is a substantial increase uh, over the former compliance and enforcement agencies before our formation. Um, Budget-wise, uh, we uh, have a budget around the $27 million mark. Um, if you require uh, an absolute figure, I'll take that on notice because I don't have the finance paper in front of me. No, that's fine, I suppose. And uh, in the in the event floodplain harvesting licensing is implemented, you, you feel that NRA is, is capable as the regulator um, to, to have the resources to, to regulate it, essentially? Uh, yes, I am um, confident. Um, it, it will, of course, depend on, on what regulations, if they um, are uh, put up again, what modifications may, may occur. But based on, on our understanding of them prior to disallowance, um, there would be a requirement on us to actively monitor uh, adherence to the conditions. And part of that would be done with boots on the ground, deploying staff. Part of it would be done by maintaining our Eyes in the Sky program. So, Mr Barnes, obviously, you've in your opening statement and your submission, you, you have talked about Eyes in the Sky, boots on the ground, uh, and how you conduct investigations. I'm just interested if you could expand on how the satellite technology, as satellite technology is used by NRA. Uh, certainly, uh, and uh, I uh, had have submitted to the committee some documents that describe it, um, one by way of a presentation, and we've also uh, prepared a, a video uh, to, to step the members through it. Uh, but quite simply, uh, we have access to satellite imagery from NASA and from the European Space Agency. We have access to uh, LIDAR information. Uh, that's laser information from Geoscience Australia. Uh, and with some pretty uh, cool maths, mathematical algorithms and some really, really smart people uh, inside of NRA, we've um, constructed uh, a means of actively surveilling the movement, storage, access and use of water. Uh, we have constructed a dashboard that allows us to do that uh, almost automatically to run that surveillance. Uh, and that's maintained over the Northern Basin at the moment, uh, over 300,000 square kilometres, uh, which is you know, Germany, France combined. Uh, it's incredible technology that we've got. And again, uh, members of the committee may want to take a look at that presentation uh, and the video just to see for yourselves uh, the, the technology. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. So just following on from that, in your view, with the technology that is available to NRA, um, are you able to tell where floodplain harvesting takes place now and across the state and to what level of accuracy? Uh, yes, and to a high level of accuracy. Okay. Um, so do you, I suppose, do you, there's been much talk about floodplain harvesting in the north. Do you believe that floodplain harvesting is occurring in the south? Uh, yes. Uh, NRA has said, following the disallowance last month, we understand water users and landholders across the state are facing uncertainty regarding floodplain harvesting. I just wanted to touch on again, um, uh, you, we spoke about this earlier, there were other questions, but 
just to reiterate the uncertainty, uh, what you meant by that uncertainty from NRAIL's point of view. So what I meant from that uncertainty is that uh, landholders uh, and, and, and water users in the Northern Basin have been participating uh, in the Healthy Floodplains Program for many years uh, with an understanding that it would culminate with the issuance of licenses. Those licenses would come with obligations, including the requirement for activities to be monitored and measured. Uh, those licenses bringing those clear obligations forthwith would allow us to ensure that uh, those obligations were being uh, met and, and enabling us to enforce them. So all of that uh, is not here at the moment, uh, hence the reference to uncertainty. No, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Barnes. So that's, um, I think you've answered everything that I wanted to, uh, to ask, so I'm fine, thank you. Unless there's other government members that have any questions. Okay, so it's um it's ten fifty. We've got this session until ten fifty five. Are there any other members that um wished to ask any questions of Mr. Barnes? Well, actually, uh, there is one other question. If that's all right, I can ask to do Mr. Barnes. Um, and you may need to take it on notice. I'm not sure, but would you be able to explain the difference between the floodplain management plans in the north? Um, versus the south or, or, or the difference of what the plans are north and south? Uh, I think that question's one best uh, held for my departmental colleagues. Thank you, Mr Barnes. I actually have one just about the emergency works regulation. Um, I just wanted to know how does NRA ensure water has been returned to the environment that is captured under this regulation? So the, the emergency works regulations enable entities to respond immediately to dire situations that can have a detrimental impact on life and property. There is an obligation of an entity to inform NRA in advance of the activity being undertaken to dewater and to do so 14 days later once that activity uh, has, um, has concluded. Uh, it's expected at that 14 day period that the entity um, describes uh, the volume of water taken and how that water was returned to the environment. Um, it's our expectation that most water that has been re re removed would be returned to the groundwater source, uh, either through reinjection or infiltration, or released to the stormwater system. So that's actually in the that that's um they that's a requirement, is it? Uh, it's an expectation that that we have and 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 communicate to to those seeking to access the exemption. So just to be, okay, just to be clear, when you say it's an expectation that you have, that's not actually in the regulation because I, I, that's the first time I think I've heard about that 14, 14 day uh, expectation as you say. So just to be clear, not in the regulation, but you're saying it's an expectation that that happens. So I'm. Uh, drawing from information that is on the website, uh, that is um, structured by way of, of uh, questions and answers. Uh, the As to what's in the regulation or not, um, I would take that on notice. Uh, it may be helpful if I may just to say, since that regulation uh, was uh, put in place, we've received 34 notifications. All of those were in the coastal residential or metro areas. The majority of those were to address uh, failures in the sewerage system. Uh, and most of those exemptions were sought by water, state-owned corporations or local councils. Okay, thank you, Mr Barnes. If there's no other questions, well, thank you very much for appearing before the committee today. Um, the Secretariat will be in touch with any uh, thing in relation to questions you may have to uh, taken on notice. So thanks again for appearing. The committee will now have a short break until 11.10. Thank you.
Welcome. We will now just do a quick sound check to make sure we can hear you all okay and you can hear us. So I'll just uh, start with where are we? Uh, Claire, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, Kate. Can you hear me? Right. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Christine, hi. Yeah, morning, Kate. And how are you going? I can hear you well. Excellent. Um, same. Uh, Peter, where are morning. you? Yep, hi. Excellent. You're coming across loud and clear and Michael. Morning, Kate. Morning. All right. Wonderful. Just give it. Uh, Christine, hi. Yeah, morning, Kate. And how are you going? I can hear you well. Excellent. Um, same. Uh, Peter. Welcome. We will now just do a quick sound. Yes, yeah, very strange. Um, we can hear you all okay, and you. Secretariat are onto that. The technical people. That was um just my voice coming in about twenty seconds after I spoke. So we might just wait and see if that happens again before we kick things off formally. I think we're okay. All right. <laughs> okay, let's begin. Uh, welcome to our next session with New South Wales Irrigators and Cotton Australia. We'll begin by swearing the witnesses in. So if you could each please state your name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation, the words of which I believe have been emailed to you by the Secretariat. We'll start with you, Ms Miller. And then, sorry, um, with New South Wales Irrigators and Cotton Australia. We'll begin by swearing the witnesses in. So, if you could each please state your name and position, title, and swear either an oath or an affirmation, the words of which I believe have been emailed to you by the Secretariat. We'll start with, with the, Ms. Miller. My name is Claire Miller. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the New South Wales sorry, Irrigators Council. Um, New South Wales Irrigators and Cotton Australia. We'll begin by swearing the witnesses. I in. think if we just pause. If we just um, we are just going to stop the proceedings. The words of which I believe have been emailed. Need to sort out these um, difficulties. Ms. Miller. My name is Claire Miller. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the New Claire, South Wales. Can I can I check with all of the witnesses that um, none of you were actually playing the live stream on your computer? Since I have been alerted, no, maybe the issue. I might have had it on, so I've just okay. I think uh, I think I think that's the that's the gremlin in the in the system, so to speak. All right, we will let's go back to swearing you in, uh, Ms. Miller. Right. No. My name is Claire Miller. I am the chief executive officer of the New South Wales Irrigators Council. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Ms. Freak. Hi, my name is Christine Freak. I'm the policy manager at New South Wales Irrigators Council. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Holt. My name is Peter James Holt. I'm a special counsel at Holding Redlick. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, and Mr. Murray. Uh, I'm Michael Murray, General Manager of Cotton Australia. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the, the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Would uh, any of you like to begin by making a short opening statement? Firstly, I'll go to the Irrigators Council. Is that you, Claire? Uh, yes, that's me, and I, I will make a short statement. Thank you, Chair. Um, we represent 12,000 water users across New South Wales. We have levy payers and member organisations in every basin valley. Our members everywhere are overwhelmingly family owned and operated farms, growing cereals, fibre, dairy and fruit, to name a few. 
The broadacre farmers are mixed croppers. They do not just grow cotton or rice, but wheat, barley, canola, soybeans, and many other crops as well. The MDBA defined it well. Floodplain harvesting, if well managed, allows for water to be taken and stored when it is plentiful and used later when water is scarce, without needing to extract water from the river during periods of lower flow. Floodplain harvesting is in that way the most sustainable form of water take of all. The CAP and the Basin Plan SDLs apply to water take as a whole. There are not separate CAPs for floodplain harvesting and for general security or any other form of take. They are taken altogether. So that means if there was no floodplain harvesting, farmers can still use water up to the SDL, but it will mean that more is taken from rivers under other existing licenses and rights. And we think this is the worst outcome for the environment, for connectivity and for downstream communities. Now, some big scary numbers get bandied around with floodplain harvesting, but I'd like to put those into perspective. Annual average current take in northern New South Wales is an estimated 350 to 390 gigalitres. Using the MGBA's water balance tables underpinning the basin plan, that means floodplain harvesting in northern New South Wales amounts to just 3% of the average 12,100 gigalitres of northern basin inflows. That licensed volume, or the license volume, will cut that estimated current take down to 259 gigalitres if the IPART pricing determination last week is, is any guide. And that means reducing floodplain harvesting take to about New South Wales floodplain harvesting take to about 2% of northern basin inflows. So 3% down to 2% and more than 100 gigalitres returned to increase the undiverted 70% portion of the pie for the environment. That's what we're arguing about here. Now, I, I know many of you may be thinking, well, that's, that's fine in a wet year like this, but what about in the dry years or average years? The take will be a much bigger proportion then, except it won't be because it doesn't flood in those years. Floodplain harvesting happens when it floods. The committee has been bombarded over concerns about critical human and environmental needs in the Barb and Darling, cultural water, or management of the Menindee Lakes, to name a few. None of these concerns, they're all extremely uh, legitimate, but none can be solved through floodplain harvesting regulation because this reform is about flood management. These other issues can be only solved through better drought management policy, and cultural water requires a whole program on its own to address two centuries of injustice. Now, work is already underway to improve drought management policy. This work must be completed by the 1st of July in 2023. It's written in black and white in the Border Rivers Water Sharing Plan, and we expect that will cascade through the other water sharing plans. This work will improve connectivity right down to Menindee. It will protect first flush events so that drought baking floods are not touched until it is clear downstream targets will be met. Rules such as the individual daily extraction limits and resumption of flow are already in force in the Barb and Darling. New South Wales Irrigators supports this work. We want it to progress as quickly as possible and these issues to be addressed. But we don't think floodplain harvesting regulation should be delayed in the meantime, so the practice continues unregulated and unlimited. That is in no one's interests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Miller. Um, Mr Hull, did you have an opening statement as well? Just briefly, if I may, um, just in terms of setting the context, um, my name is Peter Holt. I'm a special counsel at Holding Redlick. I'm recognised by the Law Society as an accredited specialist in planning and in environmental law. I worked for the Department of Planning for 12 years in a variety of senior legal and policy roles, and I've been in private practice since 2016. I've advised a number of the landholders and certain peak groups on the implementation of the floodplain harvesting licensing framework under the Water Management Act. Um, I've also followed the debates and had an opportunity to review a number of the submissions and the advice of Mr. Brett Walker, SC. Also, an opportunity to listen to him speak earlier today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Murray. Do you have a short opening statement? Uh, if I may, um, as part of my role, I oversee water policy for our industry. I've been an irrigation farmer in the Southern Basin, an executive officer for Guida Valley Irrigators based in Moree, and have worked on water policy for Cotton Australia for more than a decade. I think my first conversation regarding the volumetric licensing of floodplain harvesting would have been with then Natural Resources Minister Craig Knowles in the first part of the last decade. And I've continued with each water minister since, be they Labor or Coalition. Cotton Australia is the peak advocacy and policy body for Australia's 1,400 cotton growers. 
Typically, two thirds of our annual cotton production is grown in New South Wales and one third in Queensland. While cotton is often regarded as a dominant crop across the Northern Basin, it's not the only crop grown or irrigated within the North. And cotton is also a very significant crop in the Southern Basin, where we've seen significant growth mainly in the Murrumbidgee over the past decade, including the construction of three cotton gins. To be very clear from the outset, cotton growers support the volumetric licensing of floodplain harvesting, well recognising this will lead to a significant reduction from the current level of annual average take, and that we, along all irrigators, along with all irrigators, must be compliant with the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and the large number of associated pieces of federal and state legislation. While I've not been able to listen to all the witnesses to this inquiry, it seems to me that the vast majority of participants are in furious agreement on this point. And the sooner licensing is implemented, the sooner regulatory control will be firmly in place and irrigators can plan with less water, but a greater degree of certainty. It also seems to me that many participants in this inquiry have linked a whole lot of water-related issues to floodplain harvesting. The reality is that genuine issues such as climate change, indigenous water rights, connectivity, etc., relate to all forms of water take, and as such as they as much as they relate to floodplain harvesting, and are therefore more appropriately addressed in a wider water, water forums. I think we should be very mindful that the volumetric licensing of floodplain harvesting represents the last phase of a long, sometimes torturous, frustrating process that, that we have seen for all water licenses in New South Wales being converted to volumetric licenses. This process started in the 1980s and gathered pace with the introduction of the Water Management Act 2000. There is no doubt that the equitable volumetric licensing of floodplain harvesting has taken far longer than it should have. But with tens of millions of dollars spent, it is also the most modelled, most ground truth, most reviewed, most consulted, and most thorough volumetric licensing process in New South Wales, and I strongly suspect the nation's history. From a strictly cotton perspective, as an industry, we're committed to ensuring that whatever water is directed by entitlement holders to cotton, it is used as efficiently as possible. And we're very proud of all our industry participants who since 1992 have given a 48% reduction in how much water is used to grow a bale of cotton. And we are committed to continuing this trajectory of improvement. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now go to questions from the opposition. Mr. McBeach, is it? Yes, yes, thanks, Kate. Uh, thanks, Chair, sorry. Um, my first question is uh, directed probably to uh, Ms. Miller with, from the Irrigators Council, um, and it relates to some information that we, uh, the committee uh, heard on Monday regarding the sufficient or inadequate, probably is a better word, inadequate gauging uh, of the, um, the Northern Rivers um, and its impact upon being able to measure the water flows. Uh, do, Ms. Miller, do you think there needs to be some, a, a greater investment in um, in the in the gauging and metering of the rivers uh, and its tributaries in the north, I would absolutely agree with that. This regulation will bring in metering for floodplain harvesting, and that's going to be a really important source of the you know the vital data that we need to make sure that the resource is being used sustainably. No one is taking any more than they should, and it will inform future available water determinations uh, to make sure that take total take of water stays within cap and um, sustainable limits. But where we're really missing out here is the, me the measurement of the total water balance across these landscapes. Um, now, there's, there's not enough gauges through the rivers, throughout the Northern Rivers as it is now, to really sort of track where water is going um, and where sort of there are natural or other losses occurring. Um, and we particularly don't have a great sort of, you know, we can only measure what's going down, down rivers. And then um, hydrologists make best estimates of how much water is then out across the landscape. And um, I think from yesterday, you would have seen footage of, um, you know, when you had your virtual tour, a hell of a lot of water is out there across those floodplains. And we don't really have a good sort of grip on how much there is out across the land, out across the um, floodplain. So you can actually then sort of get a better sense of, well, how much is really being caught by floodplain harvesting against the total volume that's that's moving across the landscape. That gauging is throughout the river system is also absolutely essential for drought management activity. 
uh, or drought management policy to address these concerns about connectivity and to make sure that rules and protocols to improve water flows in those you know, dry years ensure the critical human needs and uh, downstream targets into Menindee, all of that picture um, can, can be done. You know, we, we absolutely do need much more investment engaging and, and measurement right throughout the system. Um, and so that uh, that information you're talking about, uh, the, the sort of transparent data collection processes, doesn't that then better inform the modelling? Don't, don't, aren't we able then to um, put much more accurate information into the into the models that are being used? It will put much more accurate information into the models. Um, obviously, the models that have been put together to inform the regulation for floodplain harvesting are using the best available information. They are extremely robust. Um, now we can argue about uh, modeling methodology, go backwards and forwards. My experience with modelers all in the same room is, tends to come down to a you know, conversation about my model's bigger than yours. And when you say to all of them, yep, okay, that's fine. If you did it this way and you did it that way, what material difference do you think there would be in the results? And you'll find generally they go, oh, you know, it's, 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 no, we're all the ballpark. We're in the same ballpark. We just think that, you know, there's better ways to get there. Um, so, yes, you, you will have information that comes into the models and will, um, and will better inform those that is good, but it's not a reason to sort of stop and say, well, we're not going to regulate floodplain harvesting and then we won't have the information, at least from that source. And most of the information that you need is in fact coming from better gauging and measurement throughout the river system. I think Christine wants to add to that. Yeah, thanks, Claire. So the only way to improve confidence in modelling is through actual data. And the only way to get that actual data is by putting in place a regulation that requires everyone who floodplain harvests to meet up that more to take. Now, I would add that there's a sense of urgency um, and um, time immediacy on this as well, because at the moment we are in a wet year. Next year is likely also going to be a wet year. And shortly after that, we'll be going into another dry phase, just knowing the, the boom and bust phases that are typical of the Northern Basin. Unless we get some actual data on floodplain harvesting coming in soon, we will be having the same conversation about modelling confidence in another five years. So there is a sense of immediacy around how we need to go about getting this actual data in place, and that requires a metering regulation to do that. Um, thank you. Now, because time is limited and there's a few of us sort of trying to eat off the same table here, uh, so to speak, um, I just want to, well, I've got one last question before I hand over to, uh, I think it's uh, my colleague, uh, Rose Jackson, and it relates to the 1994 cap and how, and whether floodplain harvesting, as it was proposed in the regulation, would have been within the 1994 cap, or whether it was actually going to be new tape, but it was above the 1994 cap, um, and whether or not it is your understanding that, that it is actually within the cap. So our understanding, and we have had, um, you know, we've talked to the MDBA, um, and I've been involved in, you know, the basin plan reforms and things since their inception, um, you know, way back in 2007. So um, our understanding is that floodplain harvesting has always been incorporated into cap models. It's also also always been incorporated into the water sharing plan uh, models. Um, so it is definitely part of that equation. And always has been. It's very disappointing that the MDBA has not um, chosen to appear before the committee so that you can directly ask them. Um, but what I'm talking about here have been um, accepted <clears throat> accepted processes um, right throughout this reform. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're all very annoyed about Christine the MDBA. Oh, sorry, Mick, just quickly. Um, in addition to that, um, the entire objective of this reform is to reduce floodplain harvesting down to the cap. That's what all the available evidence suggests will occur through the proposed policy. So we have no reason to believe that won't be the case. I would also add that compliance with the limits is assessed by not only New South Wales, but it's also assessed by the MDBA at the end of every border year. And we have recently seen the SDL compliance report come out very recently. Um, and if there is an issue that does get identified, and make good provisions are put in place. Every water sharing plan has over usage provisions. So in the very unlikely circumstance that there would be an increase in take that goes above limits, there are mechanisms to very quickly pull that take back down. Thank you. Like, We're annoyed about MDBA as well. But so, um, you know, the MDBA yeah. is unequivocal. You know, 
they understand, you know, they've said to us, you know, existing CAT models have all been thoroughly reviewed and approved and the process that's being followed by New South Wales is exactly the same process that's been followed by all of the other basin states. Okay, and now I'm handing over to Ms Sharp, not Ms Jackson. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming along today. <clears throat> I've just got a quick uh, two questions relating to the same thing. So one of the outcomes of um, getting um, the licensing regime in place is essentially establishing that there would be um, compensatable mechanisms for um, those that have licenses. Is that correct? Uh, Christine, I'll throw this one to you since you're the one with the master's degree in environmental law. <laughs> so that ultimately comes down um, for what the impact is going to be. Um, generally, when water is reduced from these licenses, that's known as an available water determination or AWD. Water users for all types of water licenses are very familiar with having the AWD or the water allocation adjusted based on how much water is available in the system. That is not compensable. Um, we are we have seen a significant increase in general, significant decrease in general security reliability, for example, um, where irrigators only get access to, say, 50% of an entitlement, or we've recently seen the reductions to the AWDs for supplementary water access, um, that's not compensable, no. Thank you. There's been quite a lot of discussion about that, which just leads me to the next point. Um, I'm just wanting to know how, um, my understanding is that there's been an anomalies committee as, as this process has gone through over a long, a long period of time, that there's been um, you know, essentially a process that's gone through, individual farms have worked um, with the department through this anomalies review um, process to actually get, um, you know, what they believe to be uh, ac more accurate data in relation to their take. Could you just take us through um, how that has operated from your point of view? Uh, before I just go to Christine on that, I would just say that the um, this committee's um, activities are confidential for a very good reason. They're dealing with you know individuals. Um, we are not party to that committee's deliberations in any way, shape, or form. Christine. Yes, yeah, sorry, I wasn't suggesting that you were. I'm just trying to, from your members' point of view, the process that that's operated under. Um, so that committee does deal with the exceptional circumstances, so to speak. So the people that do need to have reviews undertaken. Um, there's a number of people on that committee. I have not been involved in the processes, so um, that question is probably best directed to the department later today. Thanks. That's uh, Ms. Jackson. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Sharp. Um, I wanted to ask about a reference um, that you made, Ms. Miller, um, in your opening. Um, statement, but was also in your submission just about the importance of um, the role that uh, river connectivity and downstream targets might play in ensuring this system works effectively. And I particularly um, want to draw on that point that you made that it's obviously easier to have these conversations in very wet years um, when we have flooding. Um, but in drier periods, um, how can we ensure that the sort of smaller floods that or smaller wet events that we have in dry years, um, which can often be particularly important first flush events after a dry period. Um, how can we ensure that the environmental and social needs of those lower down in the system are met um, in those circumstances when water is more scarce because we are in a dry period? I don't wish to preempt the really important work that's already underway um, through the um, the connectivity review that the um, the department has already started, and I did refer to um, that work being completed by the first of July in 2023. Um, that work includes a very diverse stakeholder represent representative group, um, which has people on there from right across the um, the basin and in, um, and many um, indigenous representative so it is um, it is, is very diverse very representative so I don't want to preempt their work because the issues that you're talking about here will be dealt with through that work based on you know sort of good good policy good you know the best data that we have um, to look at where there may be a need for um, changes in rules or protocols um, I would imagine that some of those uh, rules and protocols could be looking or expanding on or whatever I don't know. But for example, we already have the resumption of flow rule 
that suspends extraction until you know in dry periods um, in the Barwon Darling um, when those first you know sort of flows start to come through um, until a certain target is reached at um, Will Canyon. Now we saw that in action for the first time in January this year, and um, and actually the forecasts were well over what the um, the target was. So I, I would sort of say to the committee to take some comfort in that. It's not a lot of comfort for our irrigators because that's water that they're foregone that they could have accessed. But nonetheless, um, their access was suspended until you know the department was or the Water New South Wales was confident that a certain volume would be passing um, Bill Kenya. And as I say, in the event, it ended up being a much larger volume and the river kept running strongly past that sort of period, that 10 day period. And a lot of water got down into Menindi as well. There's also current rules now that have um, you know, only been enforced for just over 12 months now, individual daily extraction limits on irrigators um, in those dry periods and things to, to sort of you know, try to improve that connectivity. So we would expect all of that work to be done and based on science and evidence over the next couple of years, and we support that. Uh, can you, I mean, I suppose, you know, can you understand though that because those issues around connectivity um, and those downstream targets are so important for the people who live and work in those communities, that the fact that that's a little bit disconnected from this process because it is part of that sort of separate river connectivity process does raise some questions or some anxiety about how extraction through floodplain harvesting might impact on them. I mean, I, can you understand how people might be a little bit nervous um, about oh. the disconnect between those two things? Absolutely. I understand why they're nervous. I'll just throw to um, to Christine. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think what we have to acknowledge here is that this reform that we're talking about is a flood management policy. And a lot of those connectivity measures are drought management policies, and you can't solve drought problems through flood policy. Um, so with that acknowledgement, no, obviously these strategies are incredibly important. Um, they're important to our industry as well. Um, and I'll just bring to the committee's attention the first flush that occurred um, in March 2020, which was then followed by an independent assessment. And that provided a range of recommendations on how to improve first flush management. Um, we support the recommendations that came out of that and the department now is undertaking a very significant work program on that, as Claire was referring to. Um, that panel assessment actually addressed a lot of these issues around sequencing. So what we have to recognise here is that stakeholders are in pretty broad agreement here that drought management needs attention and Irrigators Council at the time of that first flush event actually was on the record calling for better downstream flow targets as well um, because we needed certainty around when those water sharing plans were no longer going to be suspended um, and when normal water sharing access rules would resume. Um, but that is a drought management conversation. Well, what the after that assessment found on the matter of sequencing. And I will quote, they said that it is vital that these reforms continue relating to floodplain harvesting, not only for reasons of achieving better water management generally, but also because they will help improve management of future first flush events. The work we have suggested can be carried out alongside current work programs to improve connectivity, complete the rollout of floodplain harvesting licensing reforms, and then they continue to name another, a number of other reforms as well. So, so it really does come down to a sequencing matter. I don't think we can accelerate that process on drought management because, as Claire said, it does have to be subject to the science. Um, but given that we are in a wet period at the moment and given this reform to floodplain harvesting has been going on for so long, it is crucial that a licensing regime can come into place at the earliest possible opportunity. Can I just add to that, um, um, Ms Jackson, is um, I absolutely know why, you know, I, we've just been through um, a terrible, terrible drought. Um, and people are, of course, are traumatised by that experience. And I might say they were traumatised throughout the Northern Basin. Um, you know, the, the Namoi River <laughs> was a dry riverbed as well. Um, people didn't put crops in, they didn't grow anything. No one had any water throughout the system. There were not any secret floods somewhere that people got water from. So it was a really stressful, terrible time that really highlighted the desperate need that we have to, to work on drought uh, management policy and improve all of that. Um, so given the experience that everyone has just been through, of course, they're going to be anxious to see some kind of to see a resolution in that um, and to feel confident, but that process is underway. Um, and as, and, you know, in the past, it's always been it rains for five minutes and, you know, no one thinks we need to talk about drought policy anymore. 
but as Christina said, um, that process is in fact underway and it's a really good time for it to be underway while things are wet and while people are actually able to relax a bit and to you know, get on with farming and get on with their businesses. It's, it's the ideal time to be doing this. Thank you. Uh, opposition's time has expired. We'll move to the crossbench. I'll kick off with a couple. Um, just wanted to go to uh, a question around the official CAP models that are essentially within the CAP and within the MDBA, if you like, or within the CAP, let's keep it at that, versus what DPI are saying are CAP scenarios for various valleys. And I wanted to go to Guida in particular, just as an example. So the official CAP model for Guida lists the CAP as 346 gigalitres. DPI is now stating that the extraction limit of the CAP scenario model is 431.4 gigalitres. That's 81.4 gigalitres higher than the official CAP. From your perspective, why is that happening? Ms Miller? So um, this is a question that you should best be putting to the Amara Darling Basin Authority and to DPI. But um, our understanding is these differences are due, due to, you know, basically the models get updated um, to take in new information. The number that you're you know, referring to there, if you go back to 2011 reports on, um, on CAP and trans, you know, so forth, and I can send these to you if you, if you like from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, is um, they go through there the differences in outcomes in, you know, for different models that are being used uh, to determine CAP. Uh, it was interesting to me to sort of see in there that, um, you know, there was a difference between what, at, at that time, they acknowledged a difference between what the MDBA model was was presenting and what the models in the Guida water sharing plan were presenting um, and somewhere in the scope of what you've just described right there. And the differences came down to differences in the period of time that was being covered by the different models and a few other bits and pieces. The really important thing, though, to remember here, um, this comes down to the CAP models that are being used by New South Wales have been accredited by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. And it's in a process that is no different to the same processes that you've, uh, have been applied in other states. And numbers in CAP do move and, and reflect best available information. Um, that has been the case ever since this process started in 1995 um, and has continued through the basin plan and is a you know, there's sort of a continuum there into how they, they measure BDLs and then ultimately SDLs from that. I'd also add to that, Claire, that updating limits does not mean that more water can be taken. What mm -hmm. it does provide is a better estimation of the levels of take um, under the cap. And I think the cap has been probably, um, if I may say, poorly understood throughout um, some of the presentations to this committee. Um, just to clarify, the cap is not a fixed number. It is a description. And that description is about the um, the volume of diversions that could occur based on a particular development scenario. And that is subject to modelling inputs. And at the time, it was widely acknowledged that floodplain harvesting was not well understood and there was not much data on it. And it was expected that that would be updated. And that's why there was $52 million spent on getting more data about that to better understand what those historical levels were. I would also add um, that it's nothing extraordinary for the cap to change. It has happened in other valleys for other forms of water take. It has also happened in other basin states. So Queensland is going through a similar process of floodplain harvesting and their BDLs have all um, been amended as well um, through a similar process to what New South Wales has. Um, I've also been informed that the re-estimated modelling has actually produced lower levels than the accredited cap modelling in New South Wales as well. So it's not something that we share a concern with. I'm sorry, Ms. Fairman, you might have been on mute. I didn't hear that um, that comment. Sorry, you are correct. Um, did either of you listen to Mr. Brett Walker's evidence this morning? Yes. Uh, yes, we did. And you're aware that in that evidence this morning, as well as in his report to the South Australian Royal Commission into the Murray-Darling Basin, he said that ultimately the MDBA's proposal to increase SDLs by reference to increases to BDLs is unjustifiable and that the Water Act intrinsically links SDLs to the ESLTs for each water resource. 
the Water Act does not mention BDLs at all. He's pretty unequivocal that, in fact, the BDLs can't be uh, increased in the way that is occurring um, and being approved by the MDBA. So this goes to the heart of an argument um, which was put through the, um, the Royal Commission, the South Australian Royal Commission, that argues that the Basin Plan is not lawful because it is inconsistent with the Water Act and assumes or you know, contends that uh, the Water Act requires an ecologically sustainable level of take is first established and that the Basin Plan reflects that. And then it comes down to an argument about what should be the ecologically sustainable level of take. Um, so does that mean the water recovery target should have a two in front of it or a three in front of it or a four in front of it? Um, that is a very labyrinth theme and deep legal argument. The bottom line here is that all of the states and the Commonwealth agreed to the Murray-Darling Basin Plan with its formula for, uh, for baseline diversion limits in it and with the sustainable diversion limit formula attached to that and that that's how they would proceed and that the sustainable diversion limits with the volume, you know, the attachment or the volume of water recovery to achieve that, that that was a representation of the, a fair representation of the ecologically sustainable um, level of take, taking into account socioeconomic impact. So it is a triple bottom line approach. I think if you're, you know, you're really asking an agreed process that's nearly 10 years old that all states and all Commonwealth signed up to with base, with the baseline diversion limits and with the SDLs, South, uh, the North of New South Wales should walk away from that. No other states have walked away from it, even South Australia, who commissioned the Royal Commission. But you're asking New South Wales, you should walk away from that agreed process and go it alone. Thank you, Ms. Miller. That is absolutely not what my questions are uh, implying at all. But, um, can I ask, so within 1994-95, I understand that the storage levels in terms of gigalitres was the storage was around 600. Is that correct? I'll throw to um, Christine for this one. Um, would have to take that on notice, Ms. Barman, but it's actually, it doesn't really matter because the cap is about the amount of diversion, which could be occurring at that point in time, based on the levels of, of infrastructure, which includes storages, dams, channels, the whole lot. Um, so it's, it's not about the actual development itself. It's the diversion at that level. Hang on. So, okay. So it's not about the diversion itself. Just trying to get this straight. So if there was like 600 gigalitres in 94, 95, which I understand is 600 gigalitres of storage, and there's potentially anywhere from 1100 to 1700 gigalitres of storage now in the northern basin that doesn't matter like just it's not so, about the levels of storage that can take the water when it floods which is clearly a hell of a lot more if it's 1700 versus 600. Uh, so so that's it's, it's I, all about modeling instead of the actual storages so it's about the level of diversions um, at that level of infrastructure. And that was a decision by Ministerial Council that the cap should restrain diversions, not development. So if there was further development, that could occur, but that would have to be offset by purchasing water from other developments or through water efficiency. So just to, just a, and a question in terms of just quickly in terms of how your how your members work then. So they don't divert if they have 1700 gigalitres of storage, they therefore don't use whatever that, say, the additional 900 or 800 gigalitres of storage, they don't divert water into there when it floods the additional water. Is that what you're suggesting? So first, they don't have 1,700 gigalitres of storage. They have about 12, from memory, it's around 1,300 gigalitres of storage. So Which that's the first thing. More than double, storages yeah. are, and these storages are also multi-purpose. Um, so these storages are also used to, um, to contain water that they get from general security allocations because the way that it works up there, you know, to reduce river losses and so forth is that those releases are put out in block releases from the dam. And if you don't have on-farm storage to, to take it as it goes past your farm, then you, you, you can't access that um, general security allocation at all. So these storages are there um, reflecting the boom and bust nature of the system up there so that they can store water from supplementary access under those licenses, also store water that they access under um, set general security licenses, um, and they can also put flood water into it as well. 
Thank you. My time has expired. Questions from Mr. Mark Benazio. Thank you. I'll just uh, start with you, Ms. Freak. You, um, just touching on what uh, you said in questions to Ms. Fairman. Um, to your knowledge, how long has the MDBA and the New South Wales government known that the cap has needed to be, um, I guess, adjusted or you know ha has to be moved around to accommodate the floodplain harvesting data? To your knowledge. Since the very beginning, it was acknowledged that a number of forms of water take needed better data to understand them. So since its inception, that has been um, always planned um, and the ministerial council documents at the time can evidence that. Okay. Um, so, so really it's, it's been a failure by government in, in actually getting this done in getting the proper, getting the proper modeling, getting the proper data um, to, to better inform the cap. Well, this reform has spanned a very long time and too long, in our opinion. Obviously, it did require time um, in order to do that work and to, to do the, the very, very thorough process, which has gone through by surveillance monitoring um, on farm surveys, on farm inspections to get that information. It has taken too long um, in our point of view. Um, and that's all the more reason why um, now that that data is available, now that the 52 million dollars has been spent on data, um, it's time to bring it into the framework. Okay. Um, I might just throw to you, Mr. Holt, with some legal questions. We've heard a lot of commentary over this inquiry about, you know, where these water provisions are, are, are vested, whether they're in the state or the Commonwealth. Um, and I just wanted to get your view of whether the floodplain harvesting water is actually being vested in the state or is it still a property right of landowners? I think if I uh, pick up where Mr. Walker left off. I think the state has uh, changed the Water Management Act in 2014 to ex exert, if you like, its ability to control um, water on the floodplain. Um, I say that having done that, it hasn't yet um, put in place a licensing framework. So it, it has given itself the ability to do what it needs to do as part of the implementation of the floodplain harvesting framework, but it has not done that. And in terms of coming back to property rights, uh, I think Mr. Walker made the point that while water is valuable, it is not a form of property. Uh, my understanding of the way this system is working is that a common law right, a residual common law right, if you like, um, is now in the process of being transitioned into a statutory license. Um, so in that way, it is consistent with what has happened in the past for, say, for example, for groundwater, that is happening now. Um, and I would also point to the fact that these are expressed under the Water Management Act as replacement licenses. So the question is, what is it replacing? Uh, it is replacing the ability of a landholder to some extent use water from the floodplain for their purposes. In terms of how is it being replaced and how is it being transitioned? Well, there's an acceptance that there's gonna be a license and conditions and the, and the monitoring framework which is what uh, Mr. Barnes referred to earlier. So we're seeing a common, law, a residual common law right become a statutory license. Um, there is an acceptance on the part of the government that you know rights come with entitlements, and that entitlement is to use and take for the purposes authorised by that license um, the water under the terms of that license. So I see this as a state in transition. I think there's a recognition that even though these are not property rights, they are valuable. Uh, and that we are in the process of issuing replacement licenses, if you like, to use that water. So that's part of what's happening here. Do you, th do you think it would have been more prudent in, in your legal opinion to actually get the regulatory machinery in place before we started this transition? Because it seems like picking up on what you're saying, it seems like the, this common law right is now stuck in what could be better determined as a, a a bit of a regulatory warehouse, and you know how long can it stay in that in in that place? Um, you know, I would agree question. with you. I, I see us as being stuck in transition. Uh, part of the reason why we are stuck in transition is, of course, because um, the Legislative Council disallowed the regulation. But there are a number of things that the government, in my opinion, needs to do to fully implement the licensing framework. So, Mr. Walker, in his opinion. Uh, referred to the fact that certain proclamations uh, operate within the bed and banks in regulated river systems. Um, there are the provisions in the Act for those proclamations to be amended. There 
is the requirement to make the necessary transitional regulations to allow the granting of the replacement floodplain harvesting licenses and of course the water manage the water sharing plans in the new south wales context also need to be amended to pro make provision for the water sharing rules if you like and allow an allocation to be used for floodplain harvesting and then ultimately licenses need to be granted to license holders one of the problems back to your point about property and equity is that at the moment where we are there is an inequity in the sense that it's accepted that floodplain harvesting is unlicensed and unregulated and the new south wales government is now telling people that as a consequence of being unable to impose a regulatory environment take in the way that it's being modeled suggests that um, the amount of available water so the available water determination for uh, uh, license holders who have supplementary water licenses has been reduced as a consequence. So I suppose those people who have supplementary water licenses can feel a little bit aggrieved that the amount of water that they're otherwise being allowed to take is being reduced as a consequence of being stuck in transition. Whereas I think everybody's saying what is a fair situation is that the long-term growth in the extraction referred to by Ms. Farman earlier should be reduced by the amount of water that's being able to take under floodplain harvesting licenses. At the moment, those with supplementary are wearing the cost of the unconstrained growth of floodplain harvesting, and there is an inequity in that. Okay, thank you, Ms. Alt. That's very helpful. Um, just I'll throw, I've only got two minutes left. I'll throw to you, um, Ms. Miller, um, just picking up on your comments and in your opening statement about who you represent, um, and you, you say that you've got irrigators all across New South Wales. And I was just wondering whether there's any nuances or differences in in your members um in the southern basin um about this proposed regulations and licensing um do they or are, is everyone agreed within your um association that it should be licensed and it should be under cap um is that is that the position or is there some nuances in 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 the um your different members no our members all agree that um, we need to get on with the job. Enough of the, you know, legal uncertainty here. Enough of the tit for tat on different legal opinions. Get on with it. They support floor plan harvesting being reduced, licensed, metered. They support the rainfall runoff exemption. Um, I think you uh, all committee members will have seen um, our Collie Amberley farmers in Collie Amberley, you know, speaking for themselves about why they want to see the rainfall runoff exemption go through as well. So, um, yeah, that's rather a long answer, but uh, no, our members are in agreement. All right. All right. No worries. Thank you. I think that's pretty much close to my time. So I'll throw it back to the chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Benaziak. We'll go to questions from the government. Mr. Faraway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, first to Ms. Miller. Um, what rule changes have been made in the past three years in the Bow and Darling, and have any of these rules, or how have these rules changed river operations, in your view? There's been an, um, a number of rules that have changed in the um, in the Bow and Darling. So I talk about the resumption of flow rule. That one has come in um, on the first of July, um, 2020, as did the individual daily extraction limits. And these, in practice, mean that irrigators forego water that they would otherwise be allowed to access under the terms of their licenses and the water sharing plans. Um, now, at that time, that 10 days when they were, um, they had their extraction uh, suspended in January, <clears throat> that had a um, direct bearing on a number of crops. You know, you can imagine that's a time where the crops are being finished off. It's very hot. It's very dry. Um, it wasn't a great thing for the productivity there, um, but they've worn that. That is a change where um, they've been put at a disadvantage with no compensation. Um, and also in the last um, three years, um, there's been changes in the rules applying to um, when they can access water under class A licenses, that in effect means they basically can't access water almost at all. Um, it's very, very restrictive. So there's been a number of changes that have um, affected access and without compensation. Okay, so a question again to Ms. Miller and um, to also um, uh, any of your colleagues from the, the Irrigators Council. Do you believe that more wa water would have gone to the environment if the government's policy to license and meter floodplain harvesting had been in place for the last year? Yes. Um, 
a question from Mr. Holt. Um, the committee chair, Kate Fairman, um, asked Brett Walker uh, this morning this morning's session, Brett, Brett Walker SC, several questions on the legality of floodplain harvesting, which were published online. Um, could those questions be considered, because it has been suggested um, that they, you know, could they be considered too narrow, or do you think that the scope was broad enough, in your legal opinion? That, those were the right questions to ask. So just following on from that, Mr. Holt, um, uh, do you agree with Brett Walker SC's advice to this committee that floodplain harvesting is not unlawful and is legal? Yes, I agree with Mr. Walker's advice and analysis. Okay. Um, Ms. Miller, I just wanted to move on from that to temporary licenses. Do you, you know, on behalf of the New South Wales Irrigators Council, do you think that temporary licenses are compatible with the National Water Initiative, which obviously all basin governments are signatories to? No, our understanding is that um, licences need to be um, perpetual and ongoing. Um, I will throw to, um, to Christine on this again. She's got much more expertise in this area, but our understanding is that um, licences are issued, um, they are permanent and ongoing, and that then the, um, the way that you adjust um, for the impacts of climate change, different levels of water availability under different climatic scenarios um, is through the available water determinations. And you can see this principle in action in every other water license type. For example, general security licenses, you have a license to a certain volume, but the amount that you actually get allocated and are allowed to use depends on how much water is in the system. And um, so that's where we've seen, for example, um, reliability in the Murray general security has dropped down to 48%. Um, and in the Namoy, it's dropped down to 39%. And that's a reflection of drier, war the drying warming trend being reflected in the actual available water determinations. I'll flip to um, Christine. Thanks, Claire, and I'll throw to Peter shortly. But in addition to changes to the AWD, um, the other reason why temporary licences are just not needed is because water sharing plan changes um, and amendments occur frequently and they can occur. Um, there's also regular reviews of water sharing plans which are conducted by the NRC um, or Natural Resources Commission who provide recommendations on what amendments are required. Um, so any of the, the changes that um, a number of stakeholders have been presenting, they can all happen under the permanent licensing regime. So there is simply no need for an interim licence. And Peter. Sorry, can I just sorry, just before Peter hops in, can I just add to that too? Is if you were if if you wanted to go down this path of interim licenses, if you were issued them for five years, what would you learn in five years? There may not be a flood in that time. You would need, you know, what would you learn if you issued them for 10 years? Well, anything you learn needs to be repeatable. So then you're gonna to have to wait for your next cycle. Uh, it it starts, you know, when you've already got provisions in the, you know, the current sort of regulatory framework to review um, water allocations um, and licenses and things, I don't see what you gain by going down this path of interim licenses. Peter. Well, I just, just make the point that, you know, the proposal here is that the water sharing plans are amended to incorporate um, certain rules. Um, what we are anticipating here is a sort of a hierarchy, if you like, that a long-term over allocation is addressed by initially the reduction in the ability to take water um, from floodplain harvesting, then moving on to supplementary and then into general security. So at the moment, that system is is not operating, as you would appreciate. Um, so at the moment, the long-term extractions are being managed not by rules within the water sharing plan, but by um, reductions in the available water determinations for the coming year for supplementary water access license holders. Uh, thank you for those answers. Very helpful. Um, so just back to you, Ms. Miller. I suppose on behalf of the Irrigators Council, are you aware, uh, and it was sort of touched on earlier, but to confirm you're aware that obviously floodplain harvesting does occur in the Southern Basin? Um, we do believe that to be the case. Christine, did you have, Ms. Freak, did you have any further to add on that, an opinion um, on that? So, yes, it is the case. Um, that's largely because of the way overland flow is defined in the Act to also include rainfall runoff. Um, and I have to note that the policy is a statewide policy, but it's just being applied to the five northern valleys in the first instance. Um, but the rainfall runoff component, um, that's particularly important for irrigators right across the state because every irrigator um, or every landholder is required to manage their runoff. Um, and that's an environmental requirement to prevent potentially contaminated water. 
um, leaving the property. If I could but, briefly, I, I just make the point that Brett Walker referred to the puzzle. Uh, I see it as more of a mosaic. What we are talking about here is the implementation of a tighter, more restrictive policy framework on the northern valleys. Um, but we would anticipate that that same policy framework would be rolled out consistently across not only the southern valleys but also other parts of New South Wales with the consequential amendments to the, the water sharing plans and the proclamations um, and the ability to access the exemption. So I, I think we're heading towards a consistent system. Obviously, the government's priority is, is still on the northern valleys. Um, thank you. Back to you, Ms Miller. Um, how are the floodplain management plans in the five northern New South Wales MDB plans the same as those in the southern New South Wales basin? And I suppose from your point of view, what are the key differences? I would have to take that one on notice unless Christine has um, something she can add there. Um, I'm not aware of them you know, being materially different. Um, you would have to have the same policies applied to all floodplain management plans. But uh, Christine, would you like to add to that? I'm not aware of any differences, so I might throw to Peter. Uh, the, I, again, I'm not aware of any differences, but what I do know is that the time and money and energy of the policy work, including the preparation of new floodplain management plans, has been directed to the preparation of floodplain management plans for the northern valleys. Uh, again, in terms of what I would expect to happen is that consistent approach would be adopted there. there there may be, again, I say maybe, um, existing plans in place in the southern valleys, and you'd expect to have those plans re reviewed and refreshed, uh, adopting a consistent policy position to what's happened in the north in more recent times. Um, thank you. So, uh, just uh, this is opened again to, to any of the panelists, but uh, any of the witnesses, but. We've touched on it earlier with earlier witnesses, but I just wanted to know, for, especially from the Irrigators Council, about what your view is on what how other states regulate floodplain harvesting and just to expand on what you think works, doesn't work and, and how they're doing it. Um, I So floodplain harvesting as far as I'm a Victorian, um, as far as I'm aware, doesn't occur in Victoria um, or in South Australia. So that would bring it back to Queensland. Um, I would have to take that one on notice. My focus is on regulating this practice in New South Wales. Um, would you like to add anything, Christine? So Queensland's going through a similar process to license for plain harvesting. They're due for completion in 2022. So New South Wales was scheduled to be the first state to have floodplain harvesting brought into their water compliance framework. Um, um, but yeah, we'll see what, how that goes. We just go to Mr. Murray, I think, yeah. wanted to jump in. Uh, yeah. Uh... In Queensland, floodplain harvesting is known as overland flow, and it is largely being regulated by actually licensing storages. So you have a, a storage license, it is surveyed, it's got a volume, uh, it is allowed to receive overland flow water, and that's how it's largely being regulated to date. There is a process where at least some of those have been converted to volumetric licensing, uh, and, and that, that work is ongoing. Um, thank you. Uh, question for Ms Miller. Does any element of the floodplain harvesting policy as it stands have significance uh, for water users outside of the northern New South Wales Murray-Darling Basin? I think you may have actually touched on maybe like coriander irrigation earlier. It might be relevant to that or? Um, so uh, do you mean has it got relevance outside the northern basin? Correct, yeah. Correct, yes. Um, so the rainfall runoff exemption is extremely important. Um, right across the board, all irrigators have rainfall runoff from their properties um, and uh, require an exemption. Otherwise, they are caught between two, you know, basically, which law would you like them to break? Um, they're required to keep water on their properties um, to, in order to protect the health of rivers and ecosystems. Um, and without the rainfall runoff exemption, though, then they could be pinged for taking um you know taking unregulated water for which they don't have a license so that um that applies everywhere across the state um and we would expect that you know the floodplain harvesting regulations um would be applied statewide um so the process that has been gone through for the north will be gone through in other states um you can't sort of really have two separate systems that don't you know in two different parts of the, the state 
Um, just, just sorry, do you mind? Just from my perspective, again, I see that exemption as as part of the framework that's being implemented. That that exemption makes a lot more sense um, once we have visibility over the changes to the water sharing plan. The government's position is that it is seeking to regulate um, rainfall runoff, and in doing that, it, it in my opinion needs to provide for an exemption of all sorts. Uh, and again, I suppose what I'm expecting to see is other water sharing plans. Again, back to Mr. Searle's point earlier, the state has exerted its control over water on the floodplain. It's now progressively implementing a licensing and monitoring and evaluation framework for that water. Why wouldn't it do that uh, in coastal New South Wales, which Mr. Barnes referred to earlier, as well as in the South? Mm. Uh, thank you. This question is open to anyone, including Mr. Murray, um, if he wanted to sort of answer it will go first as well but I have asked this question of quite a few stakeholders uh, and witnesses to the hearing but would you agree uh, the, would the, any of you agree that uh, with Central Darling Council the Southwestern Water Users Association Gray and McCrabb and other Menindee locals when they state that the policy around the 640 uh, 480 gig rule has not delivered good outcomes for the lower Darling communities through its management by the MDBA um, I might jump in. Um, I think that the management of the Mandy Lakes does need to be looked at. It, it's kind of the pivot between the, the joins, the, um, the northern basin to the southern basin. Um, so these rules, uh, it, there's a question here about it's not just the inflows that are coming into Menindi, but what do you do? You know, how quickly does it get drawn down? You know, in 2016, Menindi was full like every other storage, you know, the whole basin was underwater with the floods. Um, and yet by 2017, the MDBA had made a decision to drain it. Now, that had a direct bearing then on you know, drought because the drought meant no more inflows came in and they left nothing in reserve there to um, protect critical human needs and environmental needs. And we had those terrible fish kills. So, you know, there is a real question here about the management of the Benindi Lakes. And it's, it's a two way street here. You know, it's not just what comes in but also what is drawn out. Now, the 482, uh, 486.40 rule, um, that's just a question of who controls the water that is in there at different times. If it's above 640, then the MDBA takes control and it becomes part of the shared Murray resource under the Murray-Darling Basin Agreement, um, reverts to New South Wales control at um, 480 gigalitres in there. When it's under New South Wales control, however, um, are roughly about, a, from memory, 100, 150 gigalitres still goes down the Lower Darling and into the Murray, and um, in that sense, becomes part of um, is, is part of New South Wales Murray resource. Um, so you are still getting water going down there um, for the purposes of, of you know Murray allocations or offsetting New South Wales commitments to South Australia's minimum flows and so forth. It's just a question of who's got control at different times. Um, just a final question, because I'm nearly out of time and it's open to everyone, but clearly, you know, I would ask from, from the, the industry groups you're representing, you know, how would you describe the standoff that we've got in New South Wales, where we've got, you know, the vast majority that have said that they want to see floodplain harvesting license metered, they want to see the compliance enforced uh, and the works which are illegal removed. Uh, and this has been going on for 20 years. Um, we've heard that very clearly um, through the inquiry. Do you all believe and, and that it's beyond time um, and that basically we're at a point where we all need to get on with it and uh, and move on with what successive governments have promised um, and, we, and, and we do need to deliver this? Absolutely. And... Um... Yeah, you know, I don't think you can overstate just how much work has gone into this process compared to any other uh, process. It was a state-based process around licensing. Yes, modelling is never good enough. Gauging is never good enough. Data is never good enough. But there is far, far more available today after spending, and I'm not sure whether the number is 17 million, 20 million, or 57 million on this process, and a good number to, to know. But there's been a huge amount of work done. As an industry, we know we're going to lose access to water. We, we accept that, but we do need the, the, the improved degree of certainty from licensing. With that licensing comes the metering, the measuring, gives people like Grant Barnes the ability to go and do his work clearly, it gives irrigators the framework to know exactly what they can do and exactly what they can't do. So, yes, 
you go back into Brent Walker's um, advice, and he and he talks about the whole um, whole tone, if not the law of government, was accepting of floodplain harvesting, encouraging of floodplain harvesting. It's it's time to nail this final major piece of work for the um, Water Management Act 2000 and let everyone get on with it. Thank In you, Mr. Murray's comments, if I may chair. I would just say that this is a very a principle about some very fundamental basic principles of good water management. I mean, having every form of water take metered, that is just fundamental. Having every form of water take having to comply with the state's limits on water take, that's fundamental. And with the basins limits on water take as well. Um, we are the stakeholders that are most negatively impacted by this reform because we are losing one third of the water access or those who floodplain harvest are as a result of this. And we've had the difficult conversations with those who are going to be impacted. And we have come to the point where we are here in good faith, accepting of this reform to happen. And as Mr. Walker said earlier, um, this is an incredibly significant, important reform, and it's remarkable that it hasn't already occurred in New South Wales. But now stakeholders are all at the table in furious agreement that we have to get this regulated, and there's significant agreement about doing that to the 94 cap as is proposed. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much uh, to our witnesses for appearing. We are at uh, out of time, unfortunately. So thank you so much, and we will now break for a lunch break and we will be back at 12.55. I'll just remind all members to please mute and turn your video off until then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, just a, a quick informal welcome to our next uh, witnesses. Just doing a video and sound check before we kick things off formally. So I'll just um, see how we are. Let's see, in order of uh, so Ms. Bradbury, Emma, I can see you okay. Can you hear me okay? Do you want to say that again just to check your sound? Yes, and I yeah. have a looped feedback. That's because I've got the video running in the background. Sorry. Thank you. No, this is what we do this for. That that's uh, a common uh, common common issue. Um, Jane, how are you going? Okay, all good here. Thank you. Oh, perfect. That's great sound. And Phil, Philip. Hey, good. Okay, all good. Thank you. Good. Okay, great. That's great sound as well. Okay, yeah, it's 12.55, um, so we are back from lunch. We will kick off this next session with local government by swearing you all in. We'll start with you, Ms Bradbury. If you could please state your name and position, title, and swear either an oath or an affirmation, and I hope you've all got those words in front of you. Thanks. Uh, I solemnly, explicitly, and fully swear and affirm the evidence now about the time in truth, the whole truth. Now, Ms. Bradbury, I could barely hear you. So, um, something is uh, you may either need to lean extremely closely to your microphone or just work out, make sure you know where that is on your computer. Could you just sure. say a few words again? Yep. Uh, I solemnly, yes. sincerely, and truly declare, et cetera. And please feel free to call me Emma. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. That, and that's fine. So we've got we've got you sworn in, and that is a lot better. Um, we'll go with uh, to you, Councillor McAllister. Thank you. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. And Councillor O'Connor. Yep. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Phil O'Connor, Mayor of the Bewarana Shire. I swear that the evidence now I'm about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Okay, short opening statements. Uh, Emma, do you have a short opening statement? And I assume all of you have one, is that correct? Yep. Yeah, okay, we'll move through. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to address the hearings today. Um, I am the Chief Executive Officer with the Murray-Darling Association, which is a key body for local government. The MDA acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of all the lands across the Murray-Darling Basin and all First Nations of Australia and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. The form of floodplain harvesting is a complex issue. It's seeking to balance competing needs and interests, the needs of the floodplains and the connected waterways and the interests of those who depend on them. The needs of the rivers and the lands can't be compromised without impacting in turn the interests of the communities, the economies, and the individuals that rely on those waters. They're all connected. It is evident that the needs of the rivers and waterways, the floodplains and the downstream systems are currently compromised. Without effective reform of the current legislation, this will only become more acute. That reform must be clear, consistent, and accountable. And some things aren't complex. We have an interconnected system and it is in crisis due to over-extraction. That is a reality. We have climate change creating greater extremes of conditions and that needs to be factored in. And we have towns, communities, farmers, businesses that need clarity, certainty and consistency out of this reform so that they can adapt and invest and innovate for the future with confidence. And that future will have less water. The MDA's submission seeks to strip away some of the unnecessary complexity and we've provided recommendations that if adopted will create transparency, and reliability for all users. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor McAllister. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you now from Aurora Country um, and uh, acknowledge um, their continued and uh, enduring connection, deep connection to country um, and um, uh, pay respects to elders past and present. Um, uh, and uh, also um, extend that respect to all Indigenous uh, people now on the call or in the future uh, as this transmission. Um, and 
by country, I include all things connected to that country and for today, especially speaking about water, which transverses, nourishes and replenishes more than 30, 40 First Nations countries across the Murray-Darling Basin, as we call it. I especially want to highlight the uh, apparent unity of good neighbour custodianship, which underpins all Indigenous resource uh, management, but especially in terms of water. And I thank all who have helped by sharing their wisdom around that with me. I'm here as a councillor representing Wentworth Shire Council, which extends across the far southwestern corner of New South Wales, from the South Australian border along the Murray River border with Victoria to just before Euston and up through the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area to just above Poon Kerry, some 26,269 square kilometres in total. I thank those members who have visited our shire uh, to understand and hear from residents um, and see the impacts directly. Uh, and I thank also members for inviting um, uh, this evidence today. Although the time frame outlined in council's submission reflects the relatively recent past, there are issues and consistencies in policy direction over a more broad time frame, which have compounded to bring us to this point. In the grand scheme of things, however, the practice of unfettered growth, aided and abetted by policy decisions founded on the false premise of too much water going to the environment, and the false dichotomy of irrigators versus environment has real and quantifiable impacts on our people and place. I've tabled an excellent report which came out after the submission from Council called The Politics of Evaporation and the Making of Atmospheric Territory in Australia's Murray-Darling Basin by Sue Jackson and Leslie Head. The reason I've done that is I would have referred to it in council submission had it come out a few days earlier. Uh, and there's a lot of information in there that is relevant to particularly the accounting, which is couched in, um, in consumptive terms. Um, uh, uh, also, I'll just uh, foreshadow that I'll take any questions on notice relating to the schedule or the appendix, um, which is attached to council submission, uh, the facts and figures in there and take them back to the appropriate director of council for a response, if that's okay. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Mayor Aquana. Yep. Thank you, Kate. And you know, thank you to everyone uh, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I feel like I'm the mayor of Bewarren. I've been mayor for Six odd years. Um, I was born here, born on the Bacara River, and um, lived on a lot of other rivers here, on the Berry, the Colgo, and the Barwon River now. Um, and I've just witnessed such a mess the situation is of our river systems. And I grew up, and um, you know, it was plenty for when I was a kid, and plenty of water. There are six rivers that run through our shire: the Colgo, Berry, Bacara, Narran, and the Bogan, and the Barwon. And the land out here, I don't know whether a lot of people know this, but it only falls at 50 millimetres per kilometre. And um, that's the fall of this land. And over 10 k's, it, um, you know, it only falls half a metre. So you can imagine, uh, you know, water that can be diverted with a very small bank out here and diverted for miles. Um, you know, and, um, and that, you know, and every flood is different out here, so they say. And with development from Queensland and upstream, I know that Queensland, we haven't got any say what goes on up there. Um, I have seen this water that, um, you know, it's gone places that has never been before over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And um, there's been, uh, you know, thousands of sheep, you know, that have been killed with the diversion of this water that sends a flood in a different direction nearly every time that we do get a flood, which is, you know, not that often, but there is landholders that have, you know, lost thousands of sheep where they didn't expect the water to be diverted to because of these banks. And, um, you know, in, in my opinion of this and of council is that floodplain harvesting should, should not be allowed in any form. And I'll make that very clear. Um, it can never be measured properly. And, you know, it uh, accurately anyway, and um, floodplain harvesting will only benefit one industry, and there's a lot more industries and a lot more people that that live along these river systems and out on these floodplains, and not any upstream of here, downstream of here. And I've just seen it deteriorate so much. And um, and you know, like it's going to be if it's approved to the detriment of a lot of other farmers that live along these systems. And you know, it'll only benefit one industry, and that is the uh, irrigation industry and no one else, then it, it'll be a detriment to everyone else. And I feel very strong about that as everyone knows. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll go straight to questions from the opposition, Ms. Rose Jackson, I think. Yeah. 
Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, um, everyone, for coming along um, and your written submissions and um, your opening statements today. Um, I wanted to ask a question, um, I think, uh, to um, Ms Bradbury, although others can, can feel free to jump in if you have views. Um, I mean, one of the things that you mentioned in your um, submission, in your opening statement, um, is, you know, things like, for, import, for example, the importance of including um, the most up-to-date and future modelling in relation to climate change, for example, um, and, you know, once we have better measurement and monitoring of, of what water is being taken and where, that might also um, inform future decisions about what a licensing regime may look like. Do you have any views about the best way to construct a licensing regime that allows for those kind of things to be taken into account in the future? Um, there's been suggestions, for example, about interim licences. There's been suggestions about sort of permanent licences, but with um, adaptive management or amendment framework built into that. Um, there's been suggestions that those things can be adequately managed just through um, annual water determination. So there's a range of ideas about how some of that additional future information might be considered um, and brought into the regime. And I just wondered if you had any views about those options. Um, thank you, Ms Jackson, for the question. Look, I think one of the things that we really need to achieve out of this report is certainty. So I'm, I'm really concerned that over time we've tended with this particular legislation or the reform of it to try and put the cart before the horse and to create solutions to a whole host of problems embedded within the legislation rather than looking at the foundational issues, which is that we need to establish a sustainable level of take that enables our systems and, and of course, their dependent economies to be sustainable. How do we do that? The first thing we need to do is determine you know, what does that actually look like and then build a regulatory framework around that. Now, I think there's, there are sufficient examples of regulatory frameworks around natural resource management reforms in other areas, whether that's fisheries, um, uh, forestry, uh, water in other areas, you know, th these are global issues and there are global solutions to them uh, that, that would enable us to create a regulatory framework that is consistent, that's reliable and that actually addresses the needs of the system rather than the gaps within the current legislation or framework as it sits. So I guess that in short that I don't have, and, and I would love to be able to sit down and actually develop a regulatory framework with those who have better expertise in this space than me that looks at that. But I think it is about cutting back to the simplicity of what is the issue and create a regulatory framework around it that addresses that need. And I think it's, it's reasonably well mapped out in, in um, the Water Act but the regulation has overcomplicated itself and now we're in the current position. Yeah. Um, I suppose I might direct my um, next question um, to councillors McAllister um, uh, and Oka. <laughs> um, I just wondered, you know, what we've had, We've heard evidence, you know, from academics um, and others in the environmental movement about some of the environmental consequences when we don't get this right, um, some of the environmental consequences when we over extract water from the system. But I thought it might be a little bit useful for you to talk about some of the social and community impacts. It's mentioned in your submissions, obviously, and you've mentioned it in your opening statements, but just talk a little bit about what happens to communities and to the people that you represent when we get this wrong and when the water doesn't flow um, and when those communities downstream aren't able um, to access water um, in the way that they used to historically. If I may go first, thanks, um, thanks Ms Jackson for the question. Um, it has had a deleterious and compounded impact on our community over a very long period of time. Uh, trauma, they can be um, a, a compound and vicarious uh, beast, uh, so as well as uh, having continued experience of the trauma of not having not only the amenity but also the um, the industry and the community um, togetherness that, that 
you know, healthy flowing rivers bring. Um, it, it also can be something that when spoken about, those who hear uh, are also traumatised and, and re-traumatised um, in the telling to the extent that um, certain people, and, and I won't identify them, have uh, mentioned that they can no longer speak about the impact on their industry, on their um, personal mental health, because their family will no longer allow it, such as being the level of deep depression um, and over a continued period of time, um, post-traumatic stress disorders. Uh, we've had um, uh, skin irritations, um, the continued, um, I suppose, uh, filling without proper cleaning, and, and not that that's anybody's fault, but it's the nature of cyanobacteria that uh, once it infects, there, there needs to be very deep cleaning to food uh, grade standards um, of, uh, you know, the receptacles that that uh, that hold the water um, has led to, uh, in, in children, um, antibiotic resistance, which can impact them into the future uh, whenever they have, um, you know, it, an infection uh, and, and in the current climate, that's terrible. Um, speaking to uh, our rate payers in Queen Kerry, there is an eight-year-old child, again, I'm not going to mention people, uh, who cannot swim because the river has either been too low or running dangerously high that will not permit children to swim. Now, this is just a couple of examples, but there are so many, and I could go into it. Um, there is not enough time to address all of the impacts, but they are very serious. Um, and this is, you know, 2021, for goodness sake. Um, there is a lot of third world um, conditions and diseases, uh, including bacterial meningitis, which should not be occurring in this day and age um, due to not providing adequate, safe, clean, critical human water needs for an extended period of time. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jane. Um, yeah, well, just, you know, being here and living in this community and you see how uh, how different it is when the rivers are running in the in the community and not and especially um, how it just fills fills people up here and um, they're just totally different to people that have been here for a hell of a long time when the rivers are running and this is our chance here um, now to to make a good decision and um, you know when the rivers were dry and I'll say that here there was that many people when the rivers weren't running, fighting, um, families arguing that never argued before. Um, it just affected so many people. And when the rivers started running again, this is on the social side of it, it just brought peace and and happiness to this community. And I and I tell you what, it's a lot easier to handle in my position and look after this community when um, when there's a lot of happiness and a lot of happy people here. And as um, you know, there's um, we only got two big farms in our shire. There's a hell of a lot more upstream, and and this is you know this is our chance. And and economically, I'll just say that years as we were growing up, there was that many fishermen, and the you know the pubs were full, and people used to come out boat loads, twenty and thirty in each group, and the town really you know flourished and. And there was a lot of money getting around, you know, from these people coming. Now you're lucky to see two or three fishermen, you know, come in six months, you know, because of the river's help. But it, it's our chance to make it come back to what it was. So, thank you. Uh, you go now. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Rose. Uh, so my question is to each of you, um, essentially, um, and it's uh, it arrives from uh, reading the Warren Council's um, submission. So we might start with uh, Mayor O'Connor in answering this question, but it's it's to do, you, you, you're very forthright, um, as is, you always are, but you are very forthright in your submission uh, in regard to the non-tradeability of floodplain harvesting licences. And uh, I just, I'd love to get each of, each of your views about um, the, the, you know, the capacity to trade floodplain harvesting licences or not to trade them. So we'll start with uh, with Ocker. Yeah, thank you, Mick. 
Um, yeah, I do feel very strongly about this because I have seen evidence of water being traded um, in the past, you know, with um, extraction licences. And um, there was a flow coming down the river um, which hit the A-class pump threshold at Colorenabri and the licence um, up there had used all its capacity of water. So they transferred a licence from Burke upstream to use that water and we ended up with nothing again. Um, from that A-class extraction. So this will be exactly the same if it ever gets through of uh, trading these licences up and down the system. And I just can never see it working, Mick. I just can't see it. And as you know, Mitch, I got told at one meeting they were going to measure the water with gauge boards. And I did bring up at that meeting, I said, did everyone ride a horse here, did they? Like fancy measuring, you know, the capacity and, and the flow rate with gauge boards. Like, um, you know, there's just, it cannot be measured properly, mate, and, and trading just should not be allowed. Thank you. Councillor McAllister. I'll just very briefly echo that statement. We heard from Rachel Strawn um, and, and others in, in our shire as well. Um, the, uh, as, as we've heard, uh, you know, the, the nature of floodplain harvesting is geographically unique, so it cannot be traded. It does not make sense. We've already seen the market result in a concentration of licences to very few owners of high-class licences. We've seen um, uh, industry move upstream to access uh, more regular flows. The Lower Darling used to be the highest uh, security uh, water in the Murray-Darling Basin, sadly not the case. And we've seen Tandow move its licences from uh, the Lower Darling to the Murrumbidgee, I think. Uh, and um, you know, we've, we've seen what impact that has had. Moving um, the financial resource around uh, does not work for a resource like water, which is um, uh, connected to the land that must pass through the land and not only across the top of the land, but also through the groundwater as well. Um, there are considerable um, concerns around uh, the way, you know, letting the, the market decide the, the need or the availability of a resource, which is a uh, critical uh, human right, in actual fact, survival need. Thank you. And Emma, did you want to say, respond to that as well before we move on with questioning? Yeah, if I could, if I could add to that, um, please, Madam Chair. And, and I guess it's to pick up on it and really uh, emphasise Councillor McAllister's point where in, she makes the point that, that uh, water is quite unique as a natural resource in that its fundamental requirement to uh, deliver any benefit at all is in location. So there are other natural resources where we can have regulatory frameworks that enable them to be moved, traded, shifted, et cetera, and they will still continue to deliver value inherent in, in what that trade represents. Water, to, you know, fresh water is absolutely unique. As, as Councillor McAllister said, it, it has to be at its location for it to add value to businesses, communities, economies, commodities in that space. So again, I think in terms of looking at the, at the regulatory framework, you've got to look at not only um, floodplain harvesting, but also the market itself in terms of its, its uh, regulation of the market and how that interacts in relation to floodplain harvesting to ensure that we don't one lever here and have an adverse consequence by not pulling a, a corollary lever over there. And, uh, you know, the NDA's view is very much that the market must maintain the first principles requirements of our water being available at its sustainable, you know, where it needs to be. Thank you um, very much, uh, Emma. And I just uh, just um, you do need to speak a little bit closer to the microphone. We we caught it, but I'm just um, uh, hopefully Hansard did as well. So uh, I'll just kick off with a few questions, if I may, from the crossbench. The first, I'm just looking at um, your submission for Wentworth Shire Council, Councillor McAllister, and. I think this is an important point to capture for this inquiry. You brought to our attention 
the fact that in two thousand in August two thousand and seventeen, the then Water Minister Niall Blair gazetted a Barwon Darling Valley floodplain management plan, which gave him the power to approve flood works built illegally, even if they do not comply with requirements prior to the plan. So I think it's kind of worth exploring that a little bit, but you also say in here there remains very concerning issues about which structures were approved and whether they have been assessed against cumulative downstream impacts. So two parts to the question, the fact that that happened and um, do you, you know, do we know how much was approved then? And why is it important that these structures uh, are assessed in terms of the cumulative impact downstream? Thank you, Ms. Fairman. Um, and we, we were cautioned, council was cautioned very strongly against using the term illegal, uh, because as we've heard, and there's been considerable discussion around the fact that something that is not yet enacted in law, um, you know, is, is not necessarily legal or illegal. It may well be unlawful simply because there hasn't been a, a law, uh, for example, slavery was never illegal until there was a law making it so. Um, so the fact that there was retrospective approval um, of uh, works without um, what I would deem to be appropriate uh, environmental input or assessment um, and in particular, one, one thing that uh, our council have been calling for consistently right from the get go is the cumulative downstream impacts, which seem to be um, not even registered on the radar until we continually brought it up. Um, there is a di direct link uh, when, um, in terms of the, the second part of your question, um, sorry, it's gone. That's okay. I do just want to explore that a little bit further as well, maybe also with um, Mayor O'Connor as well. But the issue, of course, with with all of these storages and works that have been built, as I think you alluded to in your opening statement, is the impacts that they have, of course, not just say on the river downstream, but all around them in terms of environmental impacts and impacts on neighbouring landholders. So you you have argued that you don't think there should be any floodplain harvesting. Is is that correct? But if so, those structures need to be um, looked at in more detail in terms of the impact that they're having all around them. Is that the case? Yes, um, I can go first there, Joan. Sure. The, um, yeah, that's that's correct. And, and with saying, as I said, you know, with the fall of this country, you don't, you know, a grader can create a structure and even a road can send water for, you know, 10, 20, 50 kilometres where it's never been before. And I know we can't take all the roads away and do that sort of stuff. But, you know, just, you know, upstream of here and north of here, like the banks that have been built to, to transfer water from the river um, out to the fields, uh, you know, 15, 20 foot high, and of course, when it, you know the river's big and it gets out of there and it sends water in places it's never seen before, and that's not natural and it's not helping any of the you know the existing floodplains that have been there for thousands of years. So it's um, you know it's changed so much over the last you know 30, 40 years as we know, but um, you know we've got to try and fix it if we can. And if we do approve this, it'll just get worse and worse. It, I can't see it getting any better. It'll just make some people richer and detriment to everyone else. Thank you. I have another question that um, in relation to drought and climate change. So we've heard from a number of witnesses and submissions that things such as the big massive drying out of the Darling Barker River was essentially an impact of, of you know, droughts and, yeah. and climate change. What are your thoughts on that? Um, let's see, it might go to you first, Councillor McAllister. I think um, Council have addressed it very well in their submission that um, the Natural Resources Commissioner did state in the draft report that um, the man-made drought has pushed the Lower Darling into, uh, sorry, the, the, the man-made, well, the, the mismanagement of the water resource has pushed the Lower Darling into drought three years earlier than it should have. Um, that statement was amended in the final report, but the sentiment remains and the evidence is very clear, particularly when we look at the subsequent reports, the Vertesi, the Academy of Sciences, etc., 
there is um, a lot of evidence. Uh, I'm happy to report also that there is a flow going down the Anna branch today. The Great Darling Anna branch also gets missed out, as does the Lower Darling. We're very excited to hear about that because it is, is well needed. Um, and that's an area that's been sort of ignored for far too long and is vital. Um, all of these areas, the Menindee Lakes, the Great Darling Anna Branch and the Lower Darling are significant ecological communities which populate the entire Murray-Darling Basin with native fish at, at the very least um, and all have been recognised. And uh, yeah, that's probably enough. Because yeah, I just wanted to explore that a little bit in terms of the area within which you all live. I, I, sometimes it's treated as though if the if a little bit of water is sent down the river and the Anna Branch the, and a stream here and there, that's that's it. That's that's good enough. But in fact, the history and the ecological requirements, it's like a floodplains, and without the ability for the, the water to be spilling out over those floodplains as well, it had a, has a huge environmental impact. Um, is that right? Would any of you like to comment on that as well? Like it's not just the water in the river itself. Yep, um, if I could go first. Okay, they, um, yeah, you did right on that. Like there used to be, you know, when the, when the floods would come out and go out along the billabongs and, and um, you know, spread out for, you know, 20 kilometres down these channels and, you know, on the crayfish and the fish that used to come up them and, and they don't exist now. And all the, you know, like the um, crayfish, all the crustaceans and all that are gone, um, you know, sort of 20 to 30 kilometres north of here. If you go to where the, you know, there's an Arundel Creek and the Hospital Creek that went out of the bar and I've only seen them run once in the last 20 odd years. And, you know, the, and then uh, the Narrow Lake is in, you know, in part of that system as well on the Narran River. And it's really impacted in the Northern Rivers, especially. I know I said before that we can't control what goes on in Queensland, but growing up as a kid, them rivers flooded across them plains, all the Colgo, Berry, Narran and, and um, Wakara Rivers, and they nearly join all them rivers up for, you know, um, every few years it used to happen, but now it doesn't. And I know we're looking at this system in the middle of it being New South Wales, but um, you know we can't control what goes on north of us. But that's a major problem as well that needs to be looked at by the federal department. Thank you. I might need to jump in. I'm sorry, my time's expired, and we do have very limited time. So I'll go to Mr. Mark Benaziak. Thank you, Chair. I, I might start with you, Emma. Um, on page three three of eight of your submission, you make a recommendation about the carryover, the 500% carryover, and we've heard some considerable concern from people over that. But you say um, if it is to be allowed, it sh you should exercise the highest levels of precautionary principle. What does the highest levels of precautionary principle look like in, in your eyes? Can you put a, a quantitative figure on that? Sure. Um, thank you for your question. And if I can just clarify, uh, the submission recommends that, and it may be ambiguous as it's written, but just to really clarify, uh, we argue that the 500% carryover should be scrapped outright and that if, in fact, any carryover at all is to be allowed under the regulation, it should exercise the highest levels of the precautionary principle. And I think, um, that, and no, we don't have a proposed figure. I think that needs to be determined considering in consideration of all the facts um, at that first principles level. And the first principles being we need to have a system that is sustainable for our ecologies, our communities and our economies. In, you know, and, and I mean, based on what we see legislated in the Water Act, in that order of priority, so there are principles in place that will determine how we calculate what those carryover requirements are, because they all go back to um, established principles that are that are quite clear. So um, we don't have a particular figure, but um, it, we do argue very strongly that the highest levels of precaution need to be taken on on all extractions, but certainly on carryover. Okay, thank you. I might just go to you, uh, Ms. McAllister. Um, on page on page two of your submission, you you, you talked about the the first um, 
regulations regarding floodplain harvesting. And you talk about how it happened on the Friday, 7th of uh, February with no prior notice, um, no consultation, and you know, and it imposed a restriction, which was then lifted almost immediately. Um, do you think because it was done in such, I guess, an underhanded way um, that it really damaged public trust in DPI's ability to manage this, this, I guess, you know, highly contentious issue? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Benaziak, and I'll wholeheartedly support your contention that it was an underhanded way. Indeed, Mr. Walker spoke about the need for clarity, um, and I think uh, clarity of purpose is uh, really a, an express requirement when making policy. We, we know that as councillors when we're writing motions. Um, you know that as legislators. Um, the, the fact of the matter is uh, there, there needs to be um, an expression of what is the purpose of the legislation, why is it coming into effect, and what does it propose to achieve. Um, the, the fact of gazetting regulations at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon and then lifting them three days later, um, we were still parting water to our communities until May. So we still had no critical human water needs actively met. That means real on the ground water that people could access for drinking and for brushing their teeth for another uh, February, March, April, May, three months at least. Um, so the, the fact that, uh, you know, not only could um, floodplain harvesting and supplementary licenses be um, activated, A, B and C class licenses were being activated. Now, our, our growers on the Lower Darling did not have water and they had licenses. Um, there's a, an inequity there, but there's also a failure and, and it is a state power of the constitution to provide water to its, its people. Um, it's unfair that the burden of cost and the burden of provision of critical human water needs must fall to local councils. And I'll just I'll just quickly throw to you, Mayor Connor, because I've only got about two minutes left. But I'll pick up in your comments um, from from Mick earlier about I guess you don't think it can ever be truly measured. We we just heard evidence today from Grant Barnes from Enra, um, where he said he Enra already has the ability to measure it now through very very clever people and and satellite technology. Um, so can you? Can you can you exp explain wh why NRA seems to think they can measure it? Um, and and you are obviously quite adamant that it can't be measured accurately. And if if it can be measured via satellites, why why is there a need for um, you know part of the regulation to in, you know, to have metering and measurement? That uh, seems contradictory to his statement. Th that's exactly right, Mark. Um, you know, like, why do we need all these meters? I just, you know, I'm an irrigator as well, and I just, you know, put meters on my two pumps at the minute. Only A class, you know, they're only small, but, and I think that exactly the same thing, like, if they've got all this technology, and as we heard about, you know, before the, um, before the, the show called, you know, the pump show on Four Corners there, that they could have done all this and found out all about what was going on in the river system with this cube data, and yet, yeah, the word was that you can't use that imagery for any prosecution, and um, yeah, it's just a flat rot. They'll never be able to measure it, and if they think they can, I'd like to be able to go and if they can measure a, a ground tank with say ten megs in it, and then right, I will go and pump it out through a meter, and if they're right, I'll believe it. I think that's I think that's my time, but thank you. Yeah, that's the that's that's the buzz. We'll go to questions from the government now, um, Mr. Ben Franklin. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and um, thank you all uh, for being here today and um, uh, for your service to your local communities. Obviously, local government's critically important um, to you, and um, many say it's closest to the community, and so we really appreciate what you do. Um, can I start by picking up something that Councillor um, McAllister um, mentioned briefly, which is, of course, um, water now going down the, um, uh, the Darling Anna branch, and to pick up on Ms Jackson's comments of her original question, which is, um, what negative impacts have there been from a lack of water, I guess? Um, can I flip that and ask, um, what does it mean for locals, for example, that that um, that all that water is now going down um, the Darling Anna branch? And, and 
I guess, can you give us an, a, an, any further information about what um, um, what the flooding, recent flooding in the high rivers have meant for communities down along the river? Um, perhaps we might start with um, Councillor O'Connor and then um, move on to Councillor McAllister um, and Ms Bradbury. Yeah, well, it's been, um, as I said before there, Ben, thank you for the question. And, and it, um, you know, with how much um, the pe people of this show are really appreciate it. And as, as you know, we're the highest, um, you know, percentage of Aboriginal in any shire, you know, 64%. And, you know, with the census could be 80 and they're really connected to this river. And then, and, um, you know, over the last 12 months of the river hasn't stopped flowing and, and it's just made so much difference in this area and, you know, and, and economically too, I suppose, downstream and upstream, as I said, we've only got two big farms here, where there used to be, you know, nine um, A-class farms that, um, you know, grew citrus, grapes, melons, pumpkins. And um, yeah, there's none of them now operating because they can't, because as soon as it gets into the A-class height and then there's no guarantee that it'll get there and stay there long enough to use it again. So. Yep, this um, this water is just an absolute blessing that's going down there, and isn't it unbelievable that it's been running for that long? Is it just that someone's watching what's going on now, or keeping an eye on things? I just it's a you know I've seen a lot of rain like this over the years before, but I haven't seen the river run as long as this for a hell of a long time. Councillor McAllister, thank you. I, I agree. It's it's definitely been a sell for a community that's been fighting long and hard for far too long. Um, there's there's been an opportunity to express a lot of grief that has been held in for a very long time, um, which is still percolating within community. Unfortunately, with the uh, the, the incidents of COVID in uh, Wilcannia, Menindee and Broken Hill, uh, not Menindee yet, I think, hopefully, um, and Broken Hill, there's there's been no opportunity really to get up there and see it. But I would urge members, uh, especially those who have been there and seen it at its worst yeah. time to come back and see the, the very real and impactful difference. Uh, I had a quote today given to me that was um, that, uh, you know, the, these pulses now, the, the flows that will be sent down both the Lower Darling and the Great Darling Anna Branch are pretty much trying to put a heartbeat back into a patient that's in a coma. We don't know yet whether the smaller native fish stocks will recover. We have had good initial signs of uh, Murray cod breeding, of uh, golden perch um, young of year uh, fattening up and getting ready for the big swim down the Anna Branch. But we won't know for at least another 10 years whether those populations will survive the, the lifespan of a golden perch being 15 years. Um, there are now uh, existing stocks which are around that uh, 10 to 15 year old age. But the, the other thing about our native fish is they have evolved, they've co-evolved with the Indigenous people of this country in the, uh, you know, the, the flooding and drought cycles that we, uh, that we have regulating an entire... Sorry, Ms McAlter, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you. It's just I only have limited time and I'm going to ask a few questions about fish in a moment, if that's okay. Um, uh, Ms. Bradbury, did you have anything to add on the social implications of, of the rivers running um, and particularly the Darling Anna branch? Yeah, I do. Well, not, not necessarily particularly the Darling Anna branch. And I can't speak to local conditions and local responses because, you know, the Mayor and Council and Callister are, are much more well placed to do that. At a basin scale, though, one thing that we have found is that since these flows have, uh, have connected, we're seeing a far higher level of compassion and empathy from upstream communities than I've seen in previous years. And I think, you know, the, the really critical desperation that we saw in the previous drought where communities, not just remote and west of the divide, but communities were getting down to day zero in terms of their, their uh, town water supply and availability has created a, um, a greater level of empathy and I think that is something that needs to be uh, explored and reflected in, in the legislation because we are yeah. starting to see a, a, a level of social cohesion that I think is absolutely essential to the reform and, and it has to be built. Thank you very much. Councillor O'Connell, you just mentioned um, A-class licences. Um, so what's, could I ask what your view is um, uh, on the increase in the commence to pump level? Um, do you think that was a warranted change? 
Um, the the is a uh, worse one that happened than that, Mark. Yep. Was, was the um, was the change of the pump size, and I pushed really hard to um, of late to get that change back. On A class, it used to be a maximum of 150 mil, and of course, you know, like that's the lowest. You know, it's the best license on the river, but it's only it was a maximum of 150 mil, and they push and push the the big big pump big pump owners to get that change so they could extract that water out of 36 inch pumps, 42 inch pumps. And of course, when you do that, the river drops so quick and the little farmers, that's why there's no farmers here now that can grow any you know, vegetables or citrus or whatever, because it can't stay in the A-class pump, pump threshold for long enough to be able to use that water. It has been in the last you know couple of months that has been in that height, um, but there's nowhere to put that water now in the storages and there's you know there's farms here that are on their third crop in 14 months because they can and you talked well before about the carryover water like and if you've got a you know 10,000 meg license well as soon as it ticked over the first of June you get extract 30,000 like what's the use of having the the extraction limit on the license when you can triple it in the first place so is it your position that you think that um, people should people who own A class licenses um, that they should have those basically see cuts to those licenses to protect the environment and yep. to um, and obviously basic um, landholder rights during periods of low flows? Yep, yep. And then if that got taken back to a maximum of six inch for A class licenses, it would it would just make so much difference to this river system, especially here and upstream. And that water on the low flows, which is so many more of them than high flows, and that water would be protected to get down and do the job it was meant to do downstream. Could I move on to the fish that I was just um, mentioning before with Councillor McAllister? And I'd be interested in your views as well on this, Councillor McAllister, as well as Councillor O'Connor. Um, the Western Weirs strategy, um, do you think that that should replace fixed crested weirs with larger gated structures um, with fishways in places like Pooncarry and Menindi? And will Kenya, Burke, and Coloranabri? Um, as as I was um, saying before, Mr. Franklin, thank you. I'm sorry for cutting you off. I just knew that I was about to go there. Uh, that's that's great. Thank you, and, and thank you for keeping me to time as well. Um, the uh, regulating the Darling River uh, is not going to fix the issue. As as I was saying, the the uh, native fish stocks have and and mussels and mollusks and smaller fish that we still don't know whether they're going to actually recover, um, have evolved uh, to um, spawning cues uh, through pulses, the, the heartbeat of the river as it were. Um, having larger weirs holding back more water may well provide secure water security for towns. It's also been used to surcharge um, weirs for the purpose of irrigation. Um, having uh, weirs which um, fish can traverse is a much um, better uh, environmental outcome. Um, for example, and, and my first reference in, in the submission is to a, a um, Murray-Darling Basin Authority report that uh, refers to a report by Clayton Sharp and, and Ida Stewart that suggests uh, 3,000 megalitres a day for at least 20 days of Mungandai to support regular local spawning clues, uh, cues, etc. Uh, it would drown out Mungandai weir, and that needs to happen. And it's those low flows um, that have not, you know, the data hasn't been collected properly, but the, the Darling River needs those. We cannot have our river system drying out to the extent that it takes three times as much water to reinvigorate um, a, a dead river, essentially, because uh, losing connectivity is going to create an, an extinction level event, which we still don't know the, the you know the science, the, the science is still out about whether we will have full recovery of native fish stock, and and they they populate we know from the Menindee Lakes uh, all the way up and down um, the Darling and the Murray Rivers throughout the entire Murray Darling Basin. So uh, what happens in in the nursery in the womb of the Murray Darling Basin, as the Menindee Lakes is often referred to, um, does. Uh, reflect health throughout the entire system and, and systems must be connected for that to happen. So would you say, Councillor McAllister, sorry, Councillor O'Connor, I'll come to you in a second. Um, we, need, we need to do more to get rid of feral pests like carp and improve passage and habitat and screening 
um, when it, removing graving, grazing pressure and combating thermal pollution in headwater storages? Do you think that, is that an outcome that we should be looking for? We can continue tinkering around the edges, but the bottom line is we need flows. We need the flow to go all the way to the end of system. We need end of system targets, and we need to make sure that the downstream environment, communities and critical human needs are guaranteed before irrigation can occur in, in the northern part of the basin um, as per priority of use. Um, Councillor O'Connell, sorry, you were going to say something. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Yeah, I'll just use our fishway here as an example of, um, of uh, people having a no idea what they do and whatsoever. Um, we had a, when the idea was to put the fishway in the, in the Brewarana Weir, um, there was a few colleagues going back in the time that said um, Brewarana absolutely doesn't do anything with its water. Biggest weir pearl up in this system, as everyone knows. Um, when they put it in, they put it on the outside of the bend. They done everything wrong, what they could possibly do. And we had a big protest down there to fix that. And everyone knows here that native fish swim in the channel of the river. They swim on the inside of the bend. They don't take the long road around. And fisheries seem to have way too much say and without the knowledge of the local people. And, and that went ahead where they put it. Um, and a lot of people say they've never seen Murray Cod jump over rocks in their life yet, you know. So with what they've done there, it's just one example of that. It was, um, you know, and you look at all the other weirs that are a lot bigger than Brewarana Weir in height, and no one touched them. I'll use Burke for an example. If you have a look at the Burke Weir, it hasn't got a fishway in it, but they went for Bree, Bree Weir Pool, so they could lower that level, right, 600, and take the water out of our weir pool to accommodate to another industry and take it downstream. We pushed and we got stop logs to be able to put in it. And now we do, we've got to follow protocol of um, the river heights upstream before we can take them logs out and put them back in. We wanted an automated electric control on it. There wasn't enough money after the 2.3 million to build the fishway. So it was about just trying to take our weir pool because we got told we do nothing with it. We were trying to look after our water and keep some here, and um, yeah, and we it's just been an absolute mess, and the, the fisheries there that pushed that, and um, I won't say that anyone was on the take in it, but it was, it should have never happened, and why this one weir to put the fishway in when everywhere along hasn't got a fishway in it yet, but Bree needed to have this fishway, and it was nothing to do with the fish. Thank you very much, Mayor O'Connor. With that, unfortunately, we are out of time for this session. We never have enough time to ask the questions that we want to ask, but thank you um, all for the work you do in your part of the world. Um, we will stop for a short break. We'll be back at 1.55, which is our final session for today with government witnesses. Thank you. Thank you all. See you all. Thanks, guys. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Hi there. Just to welcome our next witnesses who have joined us. Just before we um, get you uh, sworn in, I will just check everybody's um, check everybody's sound. So if we can start with you, Minister, you're hearing. I can. We can see you. Okay. You're hearing me. Okay. Beautifully, Kate. You've done really well holding this. I've um, been watching in and out and um, done a good job. So my opening statement is. Hang on, no, 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 no. We're not ready to do that. No, sorry. We'll just. Um, I just need to. I, this is just informal. I just want to check everybody's sound. So, Mr. Bentley. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Mr. Connor. Yes, I can hear you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, yeah. Mr. Brown. Yes, I can hear you. Great. Okay. All right, so we will um, begin just by swearing in the government witnesses. Of course, uh, Minister, you do not need to be uh, sworn in. But, so if we start with you, Mr. Bentley, if you could please state your name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation, which I think you might be trying to hurriedly find. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> I think I've got it, I've got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, James Michael Bentley. I'm the Deputy Secretary of Water in the Department of uh, Planning, Industry and Environment. And I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much. We'll go to you, Mr. Connor. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so Dan Connor, I'm the Director of the Healthy Floodplains uh, Project Delivery with Department of Primary Industries and Environment Water. Uh, I'll take the oath, please. I swear that the evidence given by me now uh, about to be given by me now shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much. And finally, Mr. Brown. Uh, Andrew Anthony Brown. I'm a principal modeler in Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. Uh, I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thanks so much. Okay, Minister, now is the time for that opening statement. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to address you all today um, and you know, acknowledge the enormous amount of work you've all put in over this week uh, dealing uh, with this issue. And, you know, it's it's my belief that for too long we've had vested interests um, and paid lobbyists who have been able to muddy the waters on floodplain harvesting by disseminating and promoting misinformation and outright mistruths on this vital reform. reform. And I think the committee seeking the legal opinion of Brett Walker SC has been a seminal moment in an honesty around this debate and this conversation. And I think, and I hope that we can put the concerns about legality behind us and get on with the job of licensing and metering floodplain harvesting, which I might add has been the objective of successive governments of all persuasions for more than 20 years. The advice puts the impetus squarely back on the shoulders of the Legislative Council to remove their opposition to the government's floodplain harvesting regulations. Put simply, licensing will transition the historically legitimate take into the modern water licensing framework within sustainable levels, significantly improving the environmental protections for water resources and their dependent ecosystems. It is the only way to ensure more water will stay in the system to support downstream communities and the environment. For example, in the Guaida Valley, we expect to see upwards of 140% improvement in some of the environmental water requirements for water birds in the iconic Ramsar Western listed wetland area. Importantly, the reform will also allow us to maintain the economic viability of many industries that contribute to our economy and sustain us for the production of food and fiber critical to human needs. This means maintaining and supporting jobs in regional communities. Stopping floodplain harvesting would not lead to reduction in the amount of water that could be legally taken in the Northern Basin. These limits are set through water sharing plans and the Basin Plan, and it would take legislative change to amend them. However, licensing floodplain harvesting will allow us to restrict the practice where this is necessary to comply with water source legal limits and improve its measurement. Because the floodplain harvesting regulations have been disallowed, we are unable to reduce 
this form of take where its growth has called has re resulted in legal limits being exceeded. Instead, we have needed to reduce allocations to supplementary water licenses to control this growth. Ironically, if the practice were to stop completely, this would simply place more pressures on our rivers and creeks to supply the water historically taken from the floodplains. I trust that the members of this committee can all agree that this would be a bad outcome for all stakeholders, especially those downstream. Northern Basin Irrigators understand the need for this reform. They have accepted that in some instances their overall water take will need to be significantly reduced. Yet they are prepared to install the necessary infrastructure to comply with the rules. We should be supporting these irrigators and farmers and encourage reform for the sake of all water users across the state. Licensing is the key to improve management of our floodplains. Measurement and compliance won't improve without it. Uh, I also uh, am hopeful that the other jurisdictions of South Australia and Victoria will take our lead uh, and take our, uh, our management on this so that uh, the, all of the basin states are complying and acting appropriately. Thank you very much, Minister. Thanks for keeping that uh, nice and brief. We'll move to questions from the opposition. We're going with Ms Rose Jackson. Thanks, Chair. And thanks, Minister um, and uh, representatives from DPIE for coming along today um, and making quite a bit of time to talk to us. Minister, I just wanted to start off by clarifying. Um, a spokeswoman for you made a comment in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 20th of September um, in reference to the inquiry um, and clearing up some of the misconceptions, as you mentioned in your opening statement. Um, and she indicated that this would put us in a position to be the first state to measure and license floodplain harvesting by the end of next week. Is it your intention to license floodplain harvesting by the end of next week? Is, is that an accurate statement in relation to um, your intentions? My intentions is to uh, continue. Um, the, uh, I'd like to get the support of this committee, actually, to be honest. Um, you know, well, I we'd like to give it to you, but that time frame, well, we we might be we might be interested in giving it to you, but that time frame isn't isn't going to work um, in terms of the time frames of this inquiry. So I'm, I'm interested if that is what you're intending. No, how no, that does interrupt that community. What I'm intending is to use this legal advice by Brett Walker to get us all to a position where we can actually just get on with the job of measuring water. And as Grant Barnes, I understand, said from NRA earlier today, we would have actually had more water in the wetlands if this regulation, this licensing had been in place and hadn't been overturned by the upper house. I really just want to get on with this in a, a non-political um, and factual way. And I think Brett Walker's uh, evidence and I think his, his statement um, that you sought gives us clarity of purpose to get that done. And I do want, I would like to, to, to see a more bipartisan approach on this. That's good to hear. And so I am just taking from that that I should and I and other members of this committee should not expect to see licensing proceed next week or in a very short time frame. Is that that's not consistent with well, the approach that you're taking? Not, I don't think from the evidence this week that we need to wait an inordinate amount of time. We need to give clarity to, to those communities uh, and those producers. Um, and I think you've all given an enormous amount of your time this week. We need to move on um, and do this so that all stakeholders, environmental stakeholders, farmers that want the certainty can get on with what they're doing in a way that is respected. Um, and I'd be very happy um, to get an indication from the committee what your thinking is. One of the things, I mean, you're absolutely right, that we have received a range of evidence around people looking for certainty in this space. I think that's that's a really accurate um, assessment of a lot of the evidence we've received. I mean, one of the problems that has come up, though, um, and even you know, DPIE in, in previous briefings to the members of the committee have made this clear, is that there are some things over which we just don't have certainty right now. And some of that is the actual volume of water that has been taken in floodplain harvesting and where that is occurring because it's not currently being metered and measured 
Um, that's not something which we have certainty over right now. Another thing over which we don't have certainty is the impacts of climate change um, on water availability into the future. We have some idea, we have some models, but that's not something over which we can have certainty. And so one of the things that's been raised is this idea that over time, as we might better measure um, and better monitor how much water is being taken and where, as we might continue to gather more evidence um, and better science about the impacts of climate change, that that might have an impact over the type of licensing regime that we put in place now. And there's been a range of different evidence provided as to how better certainty over those things might change some of the licensing regimes. There's been suggestions of temporary or interim licenses. There's been suggestions of frameworks put into the licensing regime for adaptation or amendment later on. There's been suggestions that those things aren't necessary and that that can sort of be quite easily managed through just the you know, an, annual water allocations within the licensing framework. Do you have a view about how we might build into any model that we put in place now additional information that we might gain down the track as a result of better metering, better monitoring and better climate science, for example? Those conversations are going to go on, Rose, and they're going to go on for the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. But that doesn't mean that we're going to have lesser conversations by actually quantifying the amount of water we're taking in the floodplain within the cap. I, I don't disagree. Those conversations will take place, but we're going to have better conversations with better information by licensing and making sure we're within the cap. Right. As I said, so assume... Assume in my question that a licensing regime is put in place. Assume that that is supported and, and there has been a lot of evidence from a range of different stakeholders that that is the way that we should proceed. Then the question is, this is not an argument about whether we license floodplain harvesting or not at this point. The question is, how do we ensure that built into that licensing regime, we can include that science that we get. Yeah, I mean, some of it's going to be 30, 40 years down the track. Some of it may be five years down the track. We might have a better understanding of how much water is being taken and where, and whether that is environmentally sustainable, in fact, or in fact, whether it's not. That might be information that we have a better understanding of in a short period of time. And how, what assurances do you think we can give people now that any regime we put in place will be properly responsive to that? Well, that is a lot of what you're discussing would actually come in to our water sharing plans and, and when they're rewritten um, and how they're, um, how they're arrived at. And Dan, I'm going, Dan O'Connor, I'm going to pass to you to, to talk about the practicalities of the benefits of us having this licensing regime to understand what water we've captured to be able to feed into future conversations. Thanks, Minister. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely measurement and monitoring is really important to improve management through time. So one of the key sources of uncertainty I think you're alluding to, Rose, is is around the data that we've got to calibrate our, our model. So we've used obviously multiple lines of evidence to get, give us the best picture in our models of current and historical floodplain harvesting. We could always have better information and absolutely measurement data is, is, is the cream on that on that crop. Um, we probably need about five years of measurement data to, to really make a step change in, in, in those models and, and improve them. So that's one of the key sources of information that will go into improving models through time. The second key source of information that goes into improving those models is really understanding of how much of floodplain water, when you turn the tap off on floodplain harvesting or restrict it in some way, returns back to rivers and creeks as well. So they're two really important uh, bits of model upgrades that we've, we've, we've got on the books at the moment. We've got a tender that just closed last week, for example, that we put out to the open market to increase 
uh, to go to market to develop a method. So this is this is world leading uh, work. There's no river system model in the world that represents the return of floodplain back to rivers and croaks. So we've really gone to the market to help us develop a method. We've got to collect the data. Once we've got that information from, then we can start to upgrade our models. We think that's a two to five year work program. Make commitments to do that in in the floodplain harvesting action plan, and and by reference to that tender process that's just closed recently in the open market, you can see the commitment to the government to move down that path. So they're, I guess they're the two key things um, in terms of improving information that would come out of the licensing regime. So we see, a, I guess, a step change in our model capability and model upgrade about that five year mark, bringing in place the measurement data that we've, we've, we've obtained during that period, but also that return flows information into our modeling framework as well. Thanks, Dan. Um, I mean, Minister, back to you then. So, you know, once that work has occurred um, and, you know, some of that, that better um, or more, more robust information, you know, starts to become available, we've received evidence that, you know, as part of the assessments of what licensing regimes might look like into the future, that some kind of independent or scientific or expert oversight or involvement um, might in, give greater assurance that, in fact, the water that we're, you know, the, the t take of water that is occurring is environmentally sustainable um, and, you know, is consistent with the priority of use requirements. Um, is that something that you're open to? I mean, I know that that is something that has started to be included in other um, water sharing plans. Is that something that you would consider um, as part of the floodplain harvesting licensing regime? I just... Are you saying when that work gets done, once we start licensing it, is that what you mean? Yes, so that's right. And once that, once yeah. that more accurate information is, you know, I guess the question is who is then receiving that information and making decisions about what, what it means and what its impact is. And there's been the suggestion that some kind of independent scientific or expert oversight or involvement in that would be a useful thing. Look, once we get the work done to regulate and we get some better figures and we've licensed it, you know, that data and that information is open to the whole of New South Wales. I'm into open data. I'm into open accountability and it should not be held by one group or another. And once you have that information out there, the community is going to have to make some decisions if there is a really relative impact um, of climate change. Uh, we're going to have to have those conversations as a community and a society about, uh, you know, what water goes to communities to sustain jobs and communities and, and what goes to the environment. What do we need to do to store more water? All of those conversations need to be done on open data. And yeah, of course, I'd be, you know, that will be a fundamentally good thing once we license floodplain harvesting. Um, that that data is captured and put into the mix. So we've got better information. And that's good to, to know, um, and it's it's very important. I agree that we have transparency over the data. Uh, sorry if I wasn't clear in my question. I was referring not just to access to that data, but actual decision making and assessment about the impact of that data. So building into the licensing regime, as has been done with some other water sharing plans, for example, independent scientific expertise experts playing a, a specific role in advising, but perhaps not even advising, perhaps also directing how the, how flood, for example, the floodplain harvesting regime can be consistent with an environmentally sustainable level of take going forward. So it's not just about their access to the data, it's about them actually being embedded and involved um, in the decisions that are being made. I'm not sure what you're talking about quite in terms of an independent scientific group that directs a, a certain amount of water. I mean, we are going to have to deal potentially with a situation where there's less water for the environment with climate change. Um, but, you know, I'm confident in the years forward, we will have those important conversations as communities, as societies about what's sustainable. Um, and, you know, what we need to sustain ourselves as towns and communities 
uh, in, in food and fiber, but as well as we, you know, ha all have a desire to ensure that our environment is operating in the best way it can with a potential reduction in water. Yeah, I mean, as I said, well, I, I think that part of what is important here is ensuring that when those decisions are being made, that they're not being compromised by things that are not relevant to assessments about, for example, what is environmentally sustainable. And I think we know in the history of water, the recent history of water policy in Australia, that factors irrelevant to what is, for example, environmentally sustainable have influenced decisions about how much water can be taken. And so people are looking in evidence that we have received, people are looking for an assurance that there will not be a compromise um, of what is environmentally sustainable by other factors, be they political or otherwise. And so what assurance can you give built into the model that, that those, those things won't be factors that influence the way floodplain harvesting might be licensed? Well, water sharing plans are really the platform for those type of conversations and they're part of our legislative framework. They're part of Murray-Darling Basin and 2.0. So you know, those conversations are going to happen as a matter of course, and we're just going to make um, the ability to have those conversations better with the data we have. And, um, and I again, call out the, the desire and the need for other jurisdictions, South Australia, uh, Victoria and Queensland to have some of the same rules and, and the same evidence base and the same honesty around the conversation is what we have. I might just ask one more question now and then um, throw to my colleague, Ms Sharp. Um, but I wanted to ask as well about other evidence that we've received in relation to things like the use of downstream flow targets or flow triggers um, as a mechanism to ensure that um, the take of water is environmentally sustainable and consistent with priority of use um, provisions um, from the Water Management Act. Is that something that you consider to be a useful and important part of a licensing regime? I think as much water being connected through the Barker into the Darling is vital, which is why, you know, we've got Menindee Lakes filling, you know, uh, filling over, you know, full to the brim. Um, and delightedly, uh, we've got some water releases going down the Anna branches down the lower Darling, which will be incredible for fish breeding. Um, that's why as soon as I became water minister, I wanted to rail station to be part of that connectivity. It hadn't been. We bought it for the Commonwealth had bought it for $23 million 13 or so years ago. And, and we weren't getting that 15 gigalitres of connectivity of water. Um, that's why I'm pushing for a change to the sustainable diversion limit um, program so that we can keep more water in Menindee, keep more water in the in the darling with our, our western weirs projects there are lots of ways that we can do that and i support them all and also acknowledge that really if we are, if we look at the analysis look at the data and and no one wants to believe it but if on average we'd have only be increasing um our water into the murray by about one percent on average if we were to abolish floodplain harvesting altogether and then, as we, as I pointed out in my introductory comments, you put more pressures on the creeks and the rivers. But my point is, yes, connectivity into into the Barker and the Darling is is really, really important. And there's some really simple things we can be doing, which I'm fighting for within the Murray Darling Basin Plan. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that in the history of white man, that we know the Darling has been drier more times pre 1950 pre-development than post-1950. We're never going to be able to solve that issue completely. It is up to whoever makes it rains to solve that 100%, but we should all work towards better connectivity, fighting for more water to stay in, in Manindi Lakes rather than rushing some of the decisions we've had in the past few months from the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority down into South Australia and Lake Victoria, which is already overflowing. There's lots of things we can do and I'll continue to fight for that every day of the week.
And just to be clear, is one of the things that we can do put specific downstream flow targets and triggers within the floodplain harvesting license regime. But I agree that's not the only thing we can do, but it is one of the things that we can do. And so that is something that you are open to and that you would intend to include downstream flow targets and triggers in floodplain harvesting license regimes? I think that's not going to solve the connectivity issue. As I've just pointed out, on average, only 1% of um, water that flows into the Murray, which goes, you know, it goes through the Darling, down the lower Darling, then into the Murray, comes from floodplain harvesting. Um, I'm I'm prepared to look at whatever evidence we have and what and and support whatever projects we can, because most of the water that flows into the Darling actually comes from west of the Darling, down the Warrigo, which is what you're seeing at the moment. That water hasn't come overflowed from from the wider, it stays in the wider wetlands, stays in the Macquarie marshes. Most of the water comes from the, the far northwest, and that's that's got to be the target of what we can do in terms of infrastructure to keep that water in a way back that we can then put back in, like at Terrell Station. I mean, yes, I accept that it's not going to solve the problem entirely, but there has been a range of evidence that has been provided to this committee that access rules in relation specifically to event based management when there is when there is flooding events particularly when there is smaller flooding events and particularly when there are first flush events after extended dry period that those can that that access management active access management in those periods to ensure that until certain downstream targets are met water is not taken upstream can be an important part of that Absolutely. activity work. And yeah, so I'm Absolutely. just clarifying you accept that and would support that being embedded in the floodplain harvesting license regime. We accept the first flush events. We did more than accept it. We instituted the rules around it. We had a first flush event. It was the first time ever that we'd actually put it into the statute books. We had a first flush event, um, you know, is it last year? You, you know, when we had the rains, finally, there was a first flush event. Of course we support that. Okay. I might hand over um, to Ms. Sharp um, now and perhaps, although Penny, I probably haven't left you a lot of time. You can come back. Sorry. In the next section. <laughs> no time. Sorry. Now, I think we're no out. I'll come back. I'll come back. I've let you no time. time. You can start the next block. <laughs> Hey Penny, for what it's worth, your your hair is the only hair that looks good in lockdown. You, it's good. Thank you, thank you, Minister. Um, can I just just clarify something that you said earlier? You indicated that climate change would mean there would be less water for the environment in the future. Could you just clarify what you mean by that? If, if, if some of the predictions are true, there could be less water, the environment for everybody. So it and doesn't mean be other less terms. water allocated to the environment in terms of no. water sharing plants? Less water for the environment because there's going to be potentially less rain. But there's also going to be at other times bigger storm events. So it, I, I didn't mean cutting water from environmental allocations, Kate. I was referring to less water because it could be hotter and drier. Okay, that's uh, that's good to very good to to clarify that, um, Minister. I just wanted to to check on the uh, your department and officers' relationship with NRA. And I just wanted to to firstly check on um, with communication. So does, does, your, does your office check on communications that NRA um, publishes and, and puts out? No, Kate, I'm gonna just make a statement and then I'm gonna to pass to my officers and officials to, to outline. And this would be something I'm sure, and I've had conversations with Craig Knowles, the chair of NRA, 
grant bonds would probably be one of the most significant and capable independent public servants I've ever worked with. And I don't think a misinterpretation or any suggestion that he doesn't act 100% in compliance with his duties and obligations is a slur. He um, is a first class public official um, and I'm going to now pass to, to, to Jim Bentley to talk about the, the emails that have, that um, were raised earlier. Okay, I suppose just the, the question, the first question is why did your office need to approve that opinion piece that was published in the land by Grant Barnes as um, point of order, the Madam Chair. Point, Sorry, Madam Chair, point of order. I, I just, we do have a lot of time with the Minister and she did want, um, her, um, her public servant to provide further information. Frank, and then Mr. Bentley can answer it. That's fine. I, yeah, that's fine. Thank, thank you, Chair. As the Minister says, the Minister's office does not approve uh, and media releases and announcements that NRI make. Uh, further, let me say that I've been in this job two years and three months. Never on one occasion has Grant Barnes ever asked my approval for any decision of his that's related to a, uh, a regulatory or compliance or enforcement matter uh, he has never asked me and even if he did i wouldn't i, I, I wouldn't give that approval because it's not my job and it's not his job in terms of uh, the uh, the particular uh, example that was being referred to earlier with the uh, email you know so sometimes someone who is not as heavily involved with each of the individual parts of the agency or an independent agency like NRA can make a human error in saying that this would need to be approved by the minister's office because many things do need to be approved by the minister's office. This didn't and it wasn't. We do not refer, I mean, NRA does not refer those things to me, to my staff or to the minister's office. They sometimes need help from the department because their staff are employed by the department and we give services to them. We work very closely together with them. Grant and I work very closely together because I need to resource him. So when IPART decided not to fund them, not to fund them completely, I have to advise the minister on uh, what recommendations to make to ERC about their funding. So I have to understand how they work. That's why we work very closely together. Never once have I interfered in, and nor has the minister, to my knowledge, interfered in their decision making and never once have they asked me to review it. What about what your they... departmental officials then? Uh, what about them, Jen? What's well, the question? So the email I have in front of me, which is um, from one of uh, from an NRA, I assume a comms person at NRA, does say, and it's been, and it's sent to people within DPI, um, and it's as well as NRA, and it says, please see attached final copy of the land off ed to be pitched today after approval. I have actioned all feedback, but person's name, please give it a read within DPI. This person's name is please give it a read and let me know of any further changes as this is my first off ed, so still learning. So please let me know of any further changes. And then it comes back from DPI with further changes. Read Danielle's response, happy to discuss with yourselves and grant her advice that minister's office would need to approve an NRA op-ed. So this is from somebody within DPI that the minister's office needs to approve an op-ed. It was also sent by NRA staff. So there's not just one staff that doesn't know the ropes, there's quite a few staff within DPI, it seems, that believes that uh, anything issued by NRA needs to go through the minister's office. Well, as I said before, Chair, that did not go to the Minister's Office for approval. So the Minister's Office does not approve, does not expect to approve, is not asked to approve those things. But sometimes there's, there is human error in what gets written into an email. They were just wrong in that case. And as the, as the individual who said that you were quoting, who said, this is my first op-ed, so they were seeking a comms professional's advice about how to do an op-ed and all that sort of thing. It's perfectly reasonable to say, it's my first op-ed, can you help me with this? That's not sure. saying, can you improve the message that NRA wants to put out? That's an entirely different Mr. Bentley, With respect, I think it was, because it also came back. Like, the, 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 this email trail really does imply that there are several hands within DPI that at least think that the minister's office needed to 
approve this opinion piece by NRA that was going in the land, which was specifically, let's remember, something that referred to the disallowance by the New South Wales Upper House and that there was now regulatory uncertainty because of that. A very political message, actually. So it's not just one person. Are you going to talk to uh, the, the officials in this email and say that they had you know, that they've, they've stepped over the line or is it actually a protocol and a policy that this takes place, that indeed NRA has to have its advice, sorry, its public messages approved by the Minister? Um, Chair, as I said before, that is not protocol, that is not policy. Uh, the Minister's office does not approve uh, or review uh, such statements. I don't agree that it was a political statement. I, I, I know you questioned Mr. Barnes this morning about that. Uh, he was trying to explain that there was, I believe what he was trying to explain, and certainly when I listened to that question, there was uncertainty in the past. The regulations were put in place with, a, with the intent of removing uncertainty. The disallowance of the regulations then replaced, put it back into the situation of the same uncertainty that existed before. I don't believe that's a political statement. I think that's a statement of fact. Nevertheless, it's not policy, it's not protocol, and it does not happen that the Minister's Office reviews uh, the, the media releases of, of NRA. Okay. Nor do Thank I. you, Minister. Minister, did you or your office have anything to do? Did you see that op ed or did that come to your office? Because it does seem to say it did. Um, it didn't come through me, Kate. Um, in respect to questions that you might want to put on notice for my staff, feel free to do so. I don't have answers on their behalf, but I concur with what Mr. Bentley just said. Um, yeah, it. We don't see NRA press releases. We don't approve them. I mean, that's just a matter of fact. It's not the protocol. I mean, that that was essentially your answer. Is this the protocol? No, it's not. Could, could I add, Chair? Sorry, Minister. Uh, I hope I haven't spoken over you. But if I could just clarify, Chair, that the staff, uh, the DPI staff member, was spoken to after that event to clarify that in the case of NRA media releases, they do not go to the Minister's Office of Approval. So that conversation has already happened, and it was a one off uh, error that has been rectified. But the error was in the email, not in what happened to the media release. Okay, I just wanted to um, uh, talk about, just get your response in relation to the modelling now. Um, and was wondering if you could just explain uh, what is, why is the department pursuing a cap scenario and trying to get away from what is uh, the legislated Murray-Darling Basin cap for each valley? Minister? Look, I'm going to um, pass over to the modelling experts to, to go to the detail of that question. But we're operating um, within the cap. Floodplain harvesting is included in the estimates of the cap and the baseline diversion limit. So um, I'm going to hand it over to, to Andrew to, to talk to the issues of that question, Kate. I'm going to hand it to Dan. Oh, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Minister, and thanks, um, thanks, Kate, for the question. Um, so there's a bit in that, um, and I appreciate you've heard uh, lots of different advice. But I guess I'd start by saying, caps the oldest, the first, and the least stringent of all of the legal limits that are in place across uh, across the state at the moment. I think the strongest piece of evidence for that is if you look at the formula cap accounting arrangements. We've got cap credits, which for those that aren't familiar with the cap accounting arrangements, they're an annual comparison of the observed diversions versus what should happen in the model in that given year. There's 10,000 gigalitres of cap credits. In other words, since cap accounting started in 95, we've taken across New South Wales, 10,000 gigalitres less water than what those limits intended that would be d delivered according to the accredited cap models at that time. So just wanted to make that point, uh, I guess, clear up the front. The, I think the second really important point um, that we want to make out of this is the accredited cap models give diversion volumes that are nearly 100 GLs larger than the models that we're putting forward as part of this process, the revised modelling process. So across the three valleys that we're looking at, Guada, 
Border Rivers and Macquarie, where we've got results out in the public domain. Tabling those three sets of results up, the published accredited cap model volumes are 100 GLs larger than the models that we're proposing be established as new estimates of baseline diversion limits. There is absolutely a process that we need to go through to get those limits to, to, to be properly, uh, uh, I guess, reconciled, if you like, or accepted by the authority. The process happens as part of the submission of water resource plans. So, um, as I said in the initial statements, CAP is the oldest, least stringent first limit that was put in place in New South Wales. It is being replaced by BDLs and SDLs under the Basin Plan. In fact, once SDLs are in place across all Basin states, the CAP limits themselves and the CAP arrangements in Schedule 1 of the, of the Commonwealth Water Act will be repealed. That's, that's, that's the intention. That's what's happening. Um, I think so. So, like, um, well, like was explained, as as part of the process of bringing forward those new limits, we we submit them as part of a water resource plan, as every other basin state has done. The Commonwealth accept or or, or um, review, um, come back to us if necessary, ask for changes. The process is very similar to the cap audit process that was set up originally for those cap models. So, um, at arm's length from the authority, they commission. Um, an assessment of what the states have put forward. They conduct their own assessment and they ultimately accept or reject what the what the basin states have put forward. So this is a process that um, unfortunately um, New South Wales is, is last in the line of all of the basin states to put forward and have their water resource plans accredited. This is a process that every other basin state that's gone before us has been through. So what we're doing in New South Wales is not unique to New South Wales and it's definitely not unique to flood plain harvesting. Thank you, uh, Mr. Connor. We'll go to questions from uh, Mr. Mark Benaziak now. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, we heard evidence today, Minister, that both the MDBA and the New South Wales Government were aware, were aware that the cap had to accommodate floodplain harvesting since at least 2002. So I just, my initial question is, why has it taken 19 years to get to this point where we're making that accommodation? Oh, Mark, <laughs> I've been there too, and <laughs> we're nearly there. Um, I could spend the whole hearing talking about why we've um, not been able to do that, but let's just focus on what we can do. Um, Brett Walker's advice, I think, is a, is a big set of advice for all people in this debate and these conversations. Uh, it's it's really hurt New South Wales too. Uh, I think this North versus South debate uh, is is very parochial and, and and at times has been very febrile. It's 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 not helpful. Um, you have a United State of Victoria working together on fighting for their people. You've got South Australia fighting for their people. Queensland is fighting, and then our our people. You know, we're, we're divided in two and, and that's been the most painful thing to watch and witness. And that is why I was so exuberant when I, when I saw that advice on Monday morning, because somebody that maybe seemed to be aligned with, with a certain way of thinking has actually come forward and said, no, it's legal. Um, and, you know, it is an important tool in, in, in water management and, and being able to measure and manage it, all of those things. So. You know, I, I do hope that we can move quickly to give certainty to our producers, our farmers, um, and we can move on to the next set of challenges. And, and that's maybe keeping some more water in Menindee um, by readjusting some of the Murray-Darling Murray Blason plan rules. Um, you know, working off what we saw in those, those that you know, 2019 January, you know, that, that terrible event. Um, so that's that's what I'd like to be spending more of my time focusing on, and New South Wales as one working towards that. Well, let, let's hope that doesn't take 19 years, Minister. Um, <laughs> do you think that divide would have been eased if you uh, waived your legal uh, privilege and passed on the Crown Solicitor's advice earlier? Uh, look, I I, I think. Nothing was 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 going to make. 
the moment in time where this whole debate's changed, I think, is Brett Walker's advice to the committee that the chair asked for. That's the moment in time. And we can rewrite history, we can do whatever we want, but let's move forward and look at that moment in time. Okay. Now, Grant Barnes from NRA uh, today said he um, has the ability to measure through satellite technology and very clever people quite accurately floodplain harvesting. Um, now, this was disputed by the Warren and Mayor, but that aside, do you understand Mr. Barnes' statement to be accurate that he can, you know, NRA has the ability to measure floodplain harvesting uh, with satellite technology accurately? Um, if that was, I didn't listen to Mr. Barnes today, but if that's his evidence, um, yes, I, I do believe um, I would, I would stand by whatever evidence he gave. So if, if if that's the case, why wasn't why hasn't this data been used to improve modelling, and why why wasn't this data used to accommodate floodplain harvesting into the cap uh, quicker? I think a lot of this technology is quite new, Mark. But um, I might we've I had might satellites for years, Minister. A, a lot of the the ability around it is is quite new to to management processes. Dan, if, if, would you have a, a better answer for to 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 answer, Mr. Benazio. Yeah, look, thanks, Minister. I might start and then Andrew's got his hand up too. He might be able to add to what I'm going to say. But um, I, I guess um, we've got uh, the detail to get that really rich information on the ground is, is really resource intensive. You can get out there, you can you can put measurement equipment in storages uh, in situ and you can determine with a high degree of accuracy what's in there. Um, certainly as a first pass and certainly what we've done in, across this program is to look at the remote sensing analysis using Landsat first to see when storages were constructed, but then also LIDAR information, which looks in more detail about the storages themselves and their capability. That's definitely the data that we've used. And unfortunately that data does have a reasonably large error band on it. It's about plus or minus 30%. That's, a, that's quite different. That would be the first thing that NRA speaking on their behalf um, would, would use um, to detect whether there's been um, any water taken into storage, they would then deploy more accurate technology, which is site-based, to have a look at exactly how much the water that storage is holding. So what Grant was saying is technology that's really resource intensive that we, you know, you'd have to run literally people around every property every time it rained continuously to have a look at what's in there. That's why metering a measurement for us is really important. That is the technology that we'll be employing on individual properties. So real time, accurate, reliable, verifiable data being supplied back that's within uh, you know, a centimeter accuracy. That's why measurement's really important for us because it gets it on the scale that we need to. But a Andrew, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's pretty close. I just wanted to make a point that LIDAR is the key technology they're talking about here. And that that's not 20 years old, Well, probably the technology is 20 years old, but the Accessibility of LIDAR sets is quite recent and the capacity to do the kind of detailed analysis with it is also recent. Um, I think Mr. Barnes was talking more about detection of presence, absence of water. So in a compliance sense, he can tell quite accurately if somebody has water when they should not have water. Um, but it's another thing to put a how many megalitres of water in the storage. That, that has an error band on it that's quite distinct. Okay. Um, now, Miss, I know you said you don't really want to dwell on the past, but in hindsight, do you think that it may have been better to get this regulatory machinery in place first, get it better down before your department started transferring these 1912 Part 8 renewals um, over in, and trying to convert that common law right into um, a statutory, statutory license? Do you think we should have got the regulatory machinery in place first? and then started making the transfers rather than sticking them in a, a, essentially a regulatory warehouse. Um, Mark, you're right. I don't want to dwell on the past and it would have been perfect if the upper house had not uh, voted to disallow the regulation and we would have had more water in the wetlands this year. That's my answer. Okay, so um, we've heard evidence in this hearing um, about the environmental sustainable level of TAKE and SDL and how they're linked under the Commonwealth Act. But we've also heard that this ESLT is just a policy and is not legislated. So I'm just wondering, Minister, what's your understanding of it? Is it just a policy? And if it is just a policy, what actually what actual protections are there to ensure that that 
that states actually adhere to that. Did you say ESL? Yes, ESLT, yes, sorry. Environmental Sustainable Level of Take. I mean, we're trying to regulate it. That's what we've been trying to do. I've been trying to do it for two years. Um, and, you know, by regulating it, we understand it. We, we, we're we able to measure all forms of take. Uh, we sit in the carpet, you know, we follow the rules that are there um, that we are operating under at a state law coupled with um, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and our obligations and responsibilities there. Um, but you know, it... but what's your what's your understanding of of its ES, ESLT's relationship with SDL? Is it is it actually legislated or is it just a policy that sort of hangs there? It's part of the framework that we operate in. Um, Andrew, it's, uh, you, you might be able to, to better give information. Yeah, feel, feel, feel free to they're defer. All, they're all important aspects of how we uh, come to these decisions and work within the caps that we need to. Andrew? My understanding is that the ELST is a, an objective of the either the Commonwealth Act or the Basin Plan. And the SDL is the mechanism, the legislative mechanism for achieving an environmentally sustainable level of take. Okay, thank you. I think that's pretty much my time up. So I'll pass to the government for there, I think, or I'll pass to the chair. She can sort it out. Yes, thank you. I think your time is just uh, expired now. So we will go to the government for, uh, sorry, no, back to the, back to the. Yeah, back chair, to chair I, I was under the impression we were going to yes, do no, the no, government. No, no, good, sorry, yes, yes, yes. No problem. Um, so is it you, Penny? Yep. Yeah, Ms. Sharp. Thank, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Minister, does New South Wales remain committed to the Murray-Darling Basin Plan? We are still um, committed to the objectives of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, but we would also argue as a state that not everything is set in stone, that we need to be able to use latest evidence, latest information. We should be able to, to be able to change some of how that plan works um, if we have evidence that things could be better achieved. Um, and I'm very certainly um, looking at what we can do to, to make our own river system healthier with less carp, um, keeping more water in New South Wales and particularly in Menindi. And I think from your committee's visit out to that part of the world, that would be something that would be supported by the New South Wales Parliament. Minister, that's great. What happens if the changes that you want are not agreed to? Well, we're... I have a productive relationship with the other states, the Victorian Minister for Water. Lisa no, sorry, Minister. I mean, I'm asking you very specifically about the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and New South Wales commitment to it. Um, I think you gave a qualified commitment and I'm trying to explore um, the, what, what the limits of, of your commitment to the plan are. You cut me off from the point where I was going to explain that I'm working cooperatively with other states and jurisdictions to be able to potentially get changes, common sense changes to the plan that benefit New South Wales. Uh, and I'll continue to do that. I'll continue to ensure we keep as much water in the Menindi Lakes, that we continue to deal with the, the Barma choke issue, the amount of water that's racing through that part of the river system on the Murray. Um, I'm going to continue to get whatever investment I can um, of the $4 billion or so sitting in the authority to fix up infrastructure, to get better environmental outcomes, to get bigger anabranch overflows in New South Wales like that we're seeing on the Lower Darling today, thank goodness. Um, that was after some meetings that, uh, uh, that uh, we'd had in Canberra recently with Minister, thank well you. I don't, I don't have a lot of time and I would notice the Anna branch is getting water because it's flooded. Um, it's very good that it's getting water. They're very pleased about that, but I think I'd argue no, that the flood's more important than, than the meetings that you've had. Water today. Um, we've, we've released water today. That's why. Yeah. Um, my question then goes, we've had a lot of evidence and you would have, you're, you're, and look, it might be a question for Mr Connor. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the hearings this week about the cap scenario versus the cap and whether the cap scenario is actually accredited and approved by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. 
Um, are you able to give us um, some, clar some clarity around that issue? Was that, did, were you asking Dan that? Or well, I'm, ask, I'm happy for it to go to whoever. I suspect it's a Mr Connor answer, but uh, you've already touched on it before, but I'm happy for anyone to answer it. Thanks, it's Penny. It's sort Thanks. of outside the range of floodplain harvesting, but I'm sure Mr O'Connor might be very happy to help in, and assist in that answer. Sorry, did you just say that the CAP scenario that this entire thing is modelled on is outside the floodplain harvesting question? The, what you're, we're here to talk about floodplain harvesting Yes. Um, and the regulations, uh, and you know, wanting to move forward with that. That's what we're here today to talk about. That's what yes, the, and the cap and the modelling that's used the cap and the cap scenario is fairly central to that minister, Mr. Connor. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I, I mean, I think I touched on it before, if not, but I'll, I'll definitely expand on it here. So, um, the, the original cap models that were accredited gave a volume, which is 100 GLs bigger than the proposed models and limits that we're putting forward now as i explained the cap is the least the first introduced and the least stringent limits in place across new south wales and in, in fact the basin and it will be repealed shortly as soon as sdls are in place so we have got we are putting forward a, a new uh, a new, new model that is lower than the accredited cap model that's the key point it needs to go through an accreditation process, absolutely. That's the process that happens as part of the state submission of a water resource plan for accreditation. That's the process that the MDBA have advised they'd like us to go through. That's the process that every other basin state's gone through. We're not there yet, but I think the, I think we're pretty clear that the assertion that the caps are going up is, is incorrect. Our, our new estimates are, are lower than those old uh, original cap model estimates, but there's a process yet to go through, absolutely accept that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. So that's clear. It's not accredited yet, but you expect that it will be. Um, what um, assurances have you got that um, our, the CAP scenario model is consistent with um, the obligations that we have under the Federal Water Act? There's been some um, contention about that. So, so we're, I guess we're really confident. Um, we've been through a process, as I described before, the caps, um, and certainly at our original um, briefing session, um, the caps are, are a definition. They're essentially the volume of water that can be taken over the long term, given 93, 94 development and management conditions. Um, they were replicated in a, in a model early on that was accredited. We've tried to replicate or, or improve our representation of those conditions in this latest round of modelling. Um, as I said, it's indicating diversions overall that are lower uh, now than what we estimated in the past about 10 years ago. So the you know, trajectory is going, going down. Um, there is a process to follow absolutely, but we're confident um, that we're on the right trajectory here. The reason I guess that we're confident, to, to three key reasons. The models are giving results that aren't significantly different to, to the old models. I guess that's the, the first the first thing that we've um, we've implemented an independent peer review process um, throughout the development of this 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 reform, which is above and beyond the requirements to give us confidence. I guess that we're on the right path with this work. Um, that is something that no other basin state's done. The level of transparency, the level of documentation, and the independent review that we've subjected this process to ahead of submitting models to the, the basin state really sets a new standard for all river system models across the basin. So that gives us the confidence that we're definitely heading in the right direction with this reform. Yep. But no guarantees yep. at this point. <laughs> that, 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 that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you, um, Minister. There's been again one of the very contentious issues in relation to this um, inquiry has been um, that the hand, that the um, licensing regime will make um, the water take um, compensatable, and there's been some toing and froing in relation to how much that is or um, under what circumstances that will happen. Have you got? Have you been required, and do you, can you provide to the committee um, the amount of uh, money that you believe these licences will then be worth? Um, no, I don't have uh, information into particular licences or floodplain licences. But I'm not asking for individual ones. I'm asking for a global figure. We, I mean, we've been told two billion dollars, for example. Um, Dan, Andrew, do you have a, a total figure on, on what the department estimates that the license value to be? I think in the absence uh, of a, I mean, in the absence of a trademark, it's impossible to put a, 
a real number on any of that. We've seen we've seen extensively um, in with the enabling of trade through the southern systems, particularly that um, it, you can't. It's not realistic to judge these things, you know, in a, in an office somewhere. You have to wait and see what what a market thinks a product is worth. Surely, the tr surely through this process, Treasury has required you to put a number on that. Um, it's not clear to me why anybody thinks that there's a compensation risk here. I mean, we, we have, there's water sharing plans have a growth and use provision. If it turns out that we have um, issued too much license, then the growth and use provisions will cut in. There's one for CAP and there's also one for SDL compliance. And making a, an AWD adjustment for those rules is never compensatable. Lisa, my next question, which I think it's a policy question, so I think it's one for you, Minister. Um, what is your view about the licensing regime not being tradable? Uh, in terms of floodplain harvesting, yeah, it's um, because it's falling on on those on those plains where where it's being harvested, um, and as you know, aside from the Murray and the Murrumbidgee, um, that's the only areas where we actually allow trades, inter valley trades. Um, but uh, in terms of the policy of trading those licences, um, you know that that hasn't uh, fully um, been addressed in terms of, 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 of because we haven't had a licensing regime to, to allow that to happen. So sorry Minister, are you saying that um that the that the licenses will or will not be tradable if it's put in place? Limited trading is required under the National Water Initiative, but um it is going to be uh you know a part of a process that um that, that falls under that National Water Initiative. Um, but it won't be outside of um, of valleys. Um, it will be within those valleys. Dan, did you want to further give some information on that? Yeah, thanks, Minister. This is a really important point. I noticed it's come up a few times in the inquiry so far. Um, so we're obligated under the Basin Plan trade uh, requirements to have trade for all surface water entitlements. It's a it's a requirement of the Basin Plan. So we we have to have some trade. Um, there are obviously good reasons why you would restrict trade in floodplain harvesting. We've we've definitely proposed a, a, the most constrained trading regime that it, that exists for surface water entitlements, just for all the reasons I guess that have come up in the inquiry. There's a couple of key points I, I think that I'd like to make. The proposed rules, as the minister said, um, you can't trade between any any valleys. Um, we've got quite complex trading arrangements that mean you can't aggregate um, or clump. Um, entitlements within any particular area, particularly those environmentally sensitive areas within the landscape. And the third type of rule that we've got is a rule that relates to um, the capacity of works and the intent is really to control the rate of take from those environmentally sensitive areas. So for those that are familiar with our floodplain management plans in the Northern Basin, uh, management zones A and D, which are the culturally environmentally sensitive areas that carry most of our flood flow distribution. Those are the areas of the landscape that we've we've got really quite um, quite um, quite restrictive trade rules on. The intention there is to make sure that we don't increase the rate of take from the, from those areas. So there, um, there's a need to have a trading market, not just because we're obligated to, but because we're through this reform reducing water take quite significantly. Um, it's important that people have the opportunity to enter the market and re-establish that, but it's very important that we make sure that any trading framework that we design doesn't or avoids those third party and environmental impacts. And the, the trading regime that we've proposed, as I said, um, is the most constrained uh, type of trading regime uh, for that reason and because floodplain harvesting is quite unique in its access characteristics as well. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, that was helpful, thank you. Um, it leads really to one, again, some of the evidence that we've had this week is the issue of unapproved works and the fact that within the licensing, re licensing regime that you're proposing, that actually the take from unapproved works is factored in to those, um, into those works, even if there was a plan to remove those works over time, that actually the take is still there, so therefore tradable. Are you able to... Um, clarify how that would operate? Um, in terms of the some of those structures, there there are some challenges and, and 
I do note uh, that Nature Conservation Council have, have raised some of those issues and uh, there's some 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 fair some fair points there. I mean, you know, we will continue to to uh, explore and do what we need to do to ensure that take is fair um, and appropriate. Um, but in you know some of those structures, you know, in do include roads and railway lines, so that it's it's complicated. It's it's town infrastructure. Sure, um, that's right, Minister. But can I? My my, my question is actually very clear. The unapproved works that are currently there, no matter what they are or, or, or how they're operating, whether they're you know levee banks or whether they're large dams or whether they're railway lines, um, it's, it's it's my understanding it's been put to us that the, the the licensing regime factors in the take from those, which essentially means if they the plant. What I'm trying to say is that if they if they're currently not approved and at some point in the future they're removed. The problem with the licensing regime is that it's actually factored in that water. So that would then be um, the light within that license, that water that would, you know, if, if that if that um, structure was removed, that that water would still be there and therefore becomes tradable. That I'm trying to understand the link to how unapproved works are going to operate within the licensing regime, given that people will have been a lot been licensed, having you having factoring in um, take that perhaps they're not actually entitled to into the future. Okay, um, I'm going to pass the details of uh, that question to, to Jim um, to, to answer in terms of those works and how it may impact um, that license. Uh, and uh, yeah, over to you, Jim. Thanks, Minister. But um, I think Dan's probably the best place to, to answer that. So you, you start, Dan. Thanks, Jim. Um, so it's not quite like that, um, Penny. It's it's a it's a little complex. I'll try my best to really simplify it and make it clear. Um, so the legal limits just, just um, define the size of the pie. Think of it that way. It's a good analogy. I think we cut up the pieces in the pie according to what our policy describes are eligible works. So these are typically works that were approved and constructed as at third of July two thousand and eight. There are some other criteria that relate to works that didn't require approval at that time. Given that flood work approvals in particular, and these are the structures that you're really talking about, have had requirements to be approved since 1984. Um, it's not the storages definitely that are in the place in the landscape that will 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 count to the capability that need to be need to be removed. So I guess really importantly, size of the pie is based on you know infrastructure in place under the plan limit conditions. We cut up the pieces in that pie in terms of entitlements based on eligible works, which are which are in the main approved and constructed works at 3rd of July 2008. Um, as has been said before, this is a new reform program across the Northern Basin. It's been almost $60 million of Commonwealth and state investment over a series of seven or eight years. It involves floodplain management planning and floodplain harvesting, so the structures in the landscape, as well as the volumes that those structures can take. Um, we've got new floodplain management plans. The last one of them commenced today, uh, fortuitously, for the Macquarie Valley. Um, those things set rules and, and criteria for the types of things you can build in landscapes. The overall objective is unimpeded flood flow passage across the landscape. There are some works that we know that are that are, uncom that are not compliant with that flood flow management plan. In, in fact, we've identified some priority sites and we've you know, the regulator have this on their radar. They're absolutely um, working through, it's one of their compliance priorities at the moment. If you look at their compliance priorities, it's really targeting those high priority flood works in the landscape and bring them into compliance. It's one of the really important arms of this reform, whether there's a structure in the way of water getting to where it needs to be or somebody's taking it out as an extraction, it's still having the same impact. So th okay. there are two complementary arms of the reform. Thank you for that. I have many more questions, but I'm going to hand to Mr. Searle. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, Minister, you've been extolling the, the virtues of Mr. Walker's advice to the committee. You're aware that Mr. Walker only was asked whether or not floodplain harvesting constituted various offences under the Water Management Act and various other pieces of legislation? I read the questions the committee put to him and I read his answers back that he yeah. asked, he, so, his opinion so was that morning... floodplain harvesting in New South Wales is not illegal. Well, that was in the context of his answer where it said, Floodplain harvesting was not unlawful, i.e. was lawful, while the Water Act 1912 governed the position. That's at paragraph 15 of his advice. The Water Management Act has now repealed most of 
the operation of the Water Act. Um, and under the Water Management Act, all common law rights to water have been abolished and vested in the government, in the Crown. So unless the Crown provides some kind of lawful permission, there do seem to be, and Mr Walker agreed this morning, that there were legal consequences of unlicensed and unregulated uh, floodplain harvesting. What those consequences were, were complicated and highly fact dependent. Uh, but he nevertheless, nevertheless was very clear that floodplain harvesting may not constitute or doesn't constitute an offence under legislation, but there is still legal uncertainty and question marks about what happens when people do engage in floodplain harvesting without licensing. Now, under the Water Act 1912, licensing was permitted, but it's the case, isn't it? Maybe Mr Bentley can tell us no such licenses were ever issued for floodplain harvesting. Is that correct? I think he made it very clear that lawyers are not the great people to set policy either. As oh, well. no, he made that point. Yes, we're just dealing with what is the case at the moment. And, and we're dealing um, we're dealing with very simple advice from him that it's legal. That it wasn't an offence. We, we should be able to regulate and licence it so that we can get more water. Okay, uh, well, to just on that issue, Minister, just on that issue, you were saying, I think, a little while ago that floodplain harvesting would be included within the cap. Now, given the lack of historical information about how much water is being taken through floodplain harvesting, how can you assure the committee that your regulation of flood, floodplain harvesting will make sure that it is within the cap? I'm you going know, to the evidence and the advice I'm getting from people like Enra, um, from Jim Bentley, Dan O'Connor, Andrew uh, Brown, who's on our call today that we are within cap and we are actually with uh, the with the licensing the ability to actually uh, take less water uh, there'll be less water available um, in the in the Guida and in the border rivers and work yet to do in the Bowen Darling and the Namoy um, mm -hmm. that it will be the environment that will benefit that's the advice I'm taking um, and that's the advice we're trying to move forward on okay well with with the evidence that the committee has at sorry, the moment I'm sorry. Yeah, we're um, out of time there. So we need to go to the crossbench. I'll um, have a couple of questions. Um, question from Mr. Connor. Let's go back to the accredited cap model. So were floodplain harvesting volumes contained in the accredited cap models? Yep. So sorry, Kate, what was the question? Were floodplain harvesting volumes contained in the accredited cap models? Absolutely, absolutely. So the I think the question that you or the nuance that you're trying to draw out there was, um, there's an accredited cap model. There's a volume that we use for reporting under Schedule E because we didn't have a licensing framework for floodplain harvesting up at that time. And this is the same for all of them. That the, the the cap accounting that the cap credits that I spoke to before that play out as a you know, positive 10,000 GL cap credit since 1995 didn't include estimates for floodplain harvesting. The models themselves did, the accredited models did. They didn't appear in the cap accounts because to compare observed diversion to the expected model take under that particular time, you need a licensing regime for that to play out. So cap was really clearly about trying to compare apples with apples. Uh, it, the cap accounting was about trying to compare apples with apples. Very different from my proposition. And you go back and have a look at the cap audit reports. They're all on, on the MWA's website. Floodplain harvesting and the estimates that we're talking about were part of those accredited models at the time that they were accredited. So you're suggesting that, so the New South Wales government is potentially changing, so changing the BDLs, right? Revising the BDLs. Does that mean the SDLs are changing as well? That That's the current construct of the Basin Plan. So the Basin Plan set up. So I guess, I guess the question you're going to is, do we expect there's a fixed relationship between the BDL and the SDL? That's the current construct of the Basin Plan. The Commonwealth are the uh, I guess, have the pen on that piece of legislation. That's how they've described is the relationship between BDLs and SDLs. Um, and obviously New South Wales is as like, well, as all Basin states are going through the process now of implementing the Basin Plan as it currently exists. 
You should so be you clear. Have to that... go, so, so look, can I just check on this? So you have to go back, therefore, and do a reassessment then of all of the environmentally sustainable um, levels of take as well in all the valleys. Is that happening as well? So, so I think, I think, I think yep. Dan, I think, I think we need to draw out that the SDL is the definition. The thing that Dan's talking about is just a numerical estimate of that definition. Okay, so the numerical estimate can change over time. The definition cannot be changed without changing the Water Act and the Basin Plan. So what I'm asking, let's not get like into definite. What I am asking is if you you are saying that you're changing the BDL, potentially uh, changing the BDL, you're saying that it's fixed and you're going to change the SDL. I am asking you whether that means is the New South Wales government then undertaking a new assessment of the environmentally sustainable levels of take at all in any valley? So can I be clear on that, um, Chair, that New South Wales doesn't decide about what the BDL should be and what the SDL should be. That's a function of the Commonwealth. And um, to the extent that the Basin Plan, as it's currently written, describes a fixed relationship between BDLs and SDLs, that's the process that we understand will happen at the Commonwealth's end. It's not a process for New South Wales, but for to be really clear, we don't have the remit to revise SDLs. That's that's in that's in the ballpark of the Commonwealth. Yes, but you're revising how much you're you're revising how much you're taking. So let's go, let's um, for example, the Guida Valley. So the official cap model for the Guida Valley lists the cap as 346 gigalitres. But DPI is stating that the extraction limit in the cap scenario, your cap scenario model is 431.4 gigalitres, right? So it's 81.4 gigalitres higher than the official cap model. So does that does that mean that there is a higher kind of SDL? Well, firstly, why is it why is it higher? So so this is goes to the point that I was making before. The estimate that you just quoted is the estimate of all of the components in that cap model excise floodplain harvesting. The actual accredited model made estimates of floodplain harvesting and the volumes totaled 447 GLs. So the revised numbers for the Guida that we're proposing are 16 GLs less than the total volume that came from the accredited cap model, which when you compare apples with apples is a 16 GL like decrease. Mr. Mr. Connor, isn't it the fact that back in 1994, there just wasn't the level of floodplain harvesting? Right, there is there, there was not the level of floodplain harvesting. Um, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yep. So, so how much more floodplain harvesting in terms of storages is there now compared to what there was in 1994? So the point that you're trying to make, I, th I think, and it goes down to um, uh, something that I've heard others say uh, in this submission already. Cap has said it, and certainly Andrew said it, and Jim said it. Um, but CAP is set at the water source scale. There's no such thing as a CAP for floodplain harvesting. There's no such thing as a CAP for general security. There's no such thing as a CAP for supplementary. There's just a CAP for the Guida regulated river water source for it, just to use that as an example. So uh, yes, there's been a change in floodplain diversions. In most of our valleys, we also see a consequent change in some of the other diversion types as well. So it's really important to know that diversions are a function of three things. They're a function of development conditions, absolutely. They're a function of the management arrangements that are in place at that particular time. And they're also a function of water user behavior. All of those things have changed radically since 93, 94. In particular, in the early 2000s, New South Wales introduced a, a, all of our water sharing plans. Those plans were intended to return water back to the environment by having up to a 10% impact on diversions. So in the Guida example that I can, because it's it's front of mind for me, I can tell you that there was 100 GLs worth of storage capacity increase just in the Guida alone between 93 to 94 and 99, 2000, which are the conditions that reflect our plan limit. But there was also very, very significant changes in management arrangements. We had a new water sharing plan that, that for the first time created environmental contingency allowance. We had new supplementary flow sharing arrangements that were introduced. All of those things really oh. suppressed diversions. And, and that's, yeah. you, need, you need to consider all of those three things. Can I just, can changes I just in jump infrastructure. in, Mr. Connor? Yep. Like, I just, I just really want to press you on this. You know, I yep. think 
I just really want to press you on this accredited um, cap model. So you're talking about the old model, you know, and you've got this kind of as though you've got this kind of new world's best practice model, but it's actually the same accredited model. There's only one accredited model. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Right. So your new best model that you're talking about with this in, to this committee is not accredited. So the accredited model in terms of the lawful legal model is the one that you are no longer dealing with and you're using a model to justify an enormous increase in the take of floodplain harvesting. So Kate, as I have described a couple of times now, the, the new models that we're putting forward here and CAP is the oldest of the limit, CAP's, we've moved it's on, we've had BDLs, in, model. I'm, we've, like, we've, we've, we've got so BDLs just, and- Mr. Connor, you're, you're yep. calling it an old model Let's, it's the lawful accredited model. So we're a committee that is looking into the legality of floodplain harvesting, looking at what you were doing. We're trying to ask you questions about whether what you are doing and the minister and her department is actually lawful under the Murray-Darling Basin Agreement. This is the accredited CAP model. So are you just throwing it out? You're throwing it out, what is the legal model, and you're making it up. So, so I'll make I'll make two points. If we were to license according to the old accredited cap models, we'd be licensing a volume that's a hundred GLs across those three valleys, a hundred GLs bigger than what we're proposing. That's the first point I want to make. Second point is there is a process. New South Wales is no different to any other basin state, and we're we're implementing the process that the Commonwealth has asked us to implement, and that is that we bring forward these new model estimates as part of the process of assessing and crediting a water resource plan. The minute that we get on with licensing this program, we'll be submitting those new models to the Commonwealth as part of our updated WRP, and that is the process where they'll be reviewed, accepted, and changed. As Andrew pointed out before, changing models is, is, is nothing new, um, and definitely once you have a licensing regime in place, and you get a better improved estimate of those legal limits, you make the changes up and down according to the allocations, which are all permitted by our water sharing plans. Okay, can we just go to Andrew? I think Andrew's got something important Mr. here Brown. to clarify. Sorry. Mr. Brown, thank you. I'd just like to point out, um, I think it might be important that we understand that the accredited CAP model will be continued to be used for CAP compliance until a new model is replaced. So right now at the moment, there's modeling staff that are preparing the annual updates in terms of the climate inputs to the accredited wider cap model, and that will continue until you know, a new model may may not be accredited in the future. So nothing changes until a new model is accredited. Thank you. My time has expired. We'll go to questions from Mr. Mark Benaziak. Sorry, Mark, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, we heard evidence on Wednesday by Murray Water users. Um, that they said that 720 gigalitres um, essentially was lost to the Murray um, because of floodplain harvesting. Um, and obviously, DPI's evidence is only 1%, um, which clearly couldn't equal 720 gigalitres. So do, do you have any understanding where or how they've arrived at this 720 gigalitre figure? Um, um, I... Mark, I don't, but, uh, well, I've got some ideas, but I think this answer, this question is going to be better answered by technocrats um, and yep. that that's an appropriate way to try and explain why this is misinformation out there. So I might handle it in two parts, if that's okay, Minister. Andrew, if you like to take that question and talk about the 39 percent and where that all the the 700 gls and the 39 percent where that came from and i i can definitely answer the question about our analysis of of the one percent so to, to you first andrew okay so there was a ndba had a consultant who produced a report and it quoted 39 percent of northern flows contribute to the i think it's the south australian entitlement flow commitment um when we we went through an exercise of trying to work out what where that number came from, and it appears that what they've done is they've counted, um, they've assumed that the contributions of flow from the Bow and Darling are accounted first in terms of contributing to the bar, to the South Australia's entitlement flow. 
So they've effectively ignored the ongoing contributions from the Upper Murray. So I believe there's published material now that talks about this in detail, but essentially their assumptions are wrong. Um, so their long-term average, I believe, was 14% of the Murray's um, or South Australia's entitlement flow comes from the Bowen Darling. And if we, we worked out, if we change all of the, I think we switched all the floodplain harvesting off, that made a 1% difference to Murray inflows. Okay, thank you. I think that I think that probably covers it. I might um, move on to some other um, questioning. Minister, the committee secretariat emailed you a document um, from the Irrigators Council around barriers to meeting metering, and my questions are about um, obviously the the issues that we're having um, with metering presented in this report, and how the committee can possibly have confidence um in the metering of floodplain harvesting so have you you you've been emailed that report i just want to check can you see it i think that's a yes yes you can yes that's it yes yeah. excellent thank you um have i had time to read it no um, no that's a totally understandable minister so i'll 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 um give you some leeway there um in our in our briefing with um, DPI earlier on in this process, um, I think it was uh, the Honourable Penny Sharp raised questions about metering, and there was the impression given that everything was going along swimmingly. Um, but you know, Enra then put out a a, a statement saying that only forty five percent of tranche one were compliant, um, and there was like a thirty six percent error rate in um water new south wales data that they were essentially utilizing so there was 36 percent um of these of these sites or these work work approvals that they couldn't actually find so you know does that concern you minister that we've you know where enra who's going to be enforcing enforcing uh this regime um you know, is working on a database that has 36% error rate. Mark, I am concerned um, about where we're at in terms of those those timetables and and things I'm hearing out on the paddock. Um, and, you know, here's the things I'm hearing from New South Wales Irrigators Council, whilst I haven't had a chance to read the report that they um, tabled today. And, you know, I am in constant conversations um, with the agency, um, you know, trying to to ensure that all points of view are being listened to and respected. Um, we've got, you know, some big time commitments to meet for the 1st of December for those pipes over 500 mils. Um, and, you know, it has been complicated a little uh, in terms of, you know, getting some of the pumping, you know, equipment or, or the meter equipment. Um, from overseas landing in our ports, coupled with, you know, those issues, and I've heard those issues about the technicians able to go out and actually go onto paddock, you know, and that's not even to mention some of the, the difficulties, um, you know, being the only state looking at stock and domestic, and I've had representations from a lot of people, and I've asked the agency to look at that as well. So, you know, that's always part of the tension when you are leading the charge with you know, the most groundbreaking reforms in terms of water measurement and management in Australia. Um, there's going to be some tensions. I'm aware that those tensions are there. Um, and at this point, I'm, I'm going to ask Jim Bentley as um, as the deputy, as the deputy secretary uh, for water to actually deal with some of those issues, because, you know, it's good that we're ventilating them. It's good that we're discussing them um, to realize that it's not an easy task and it is a, it, it, it's quite a mammoth task for all involved um, and, you know, we are getting there uh, and that's, that's the important part. Yeah. Well, if we, if we're struggling at tranche one um, and tranche one is, you know, a smaller number than uh, tranche two, which you're looking at 7,000 between seven and 8,000 smaller works that have to have these meters put on and, and accredited, et cetera. Um, are you, are you worried that we're actually this is just going to compound the issue that we're having with the smaller trench, trench one. Like if we can't even manage get, get this basic trench right, how are we going to deal with trench two and trench three when oh, this issue is going I to be compounded to... with, you know, we, we can't even get duly qualified people, um, 
you know, well, there isn't enough duly qualified people at the moment to do with trench one, then we're going to up the ante with trench two. When you're pioneering new reform that puts us, you know, way out ahead of every other state in terms of managing water and, you know, I talk to people that have put the, the pumps in and it's been not a problem and they've worked through it. Um, I'm not, it's not, this is, you know, this is going to be a difficult process because there is change for some others have already been doing it. So, on that basis, I am going to hand over to Jim to talk about some of those challenges that we are facing and accept. Um, but water management metering, uh, that is part of the 2018 reforms. We need to do it um, to restore you know, respect and, and confidence in the sector. Uh, it's a good thing to happen um, and these businesses uh, you know, uh, you know, major investors uh, in equipment themselves, and this is part of the business now of being in water in New South Wales. That sort of well, compliance yeah. and and that that regulatory process. But just I think you... no one's denying the need to do it, Minister. But I think I think there's concerns about whether we're we're going to have it ready. But I'll allow Mr. Bentley to add anything if he wants. Uh, thank you. I won't take up too much time. Just a, a couple of points. Um, the duly qualified persons. Um, there are 160 duly qualified persons, uh, 129 of whom are available to do commercial work, uh, and the, their order books are not full. So, uh, the evidence that we have, I mean, and I might say, just as the minister said, this is a massive reform. I welcome the New South Wales Irrigator Council's report because it, it gives us a lot of things that I need to look into and follow up on, and indeed we are doing. However, one of the things from following up I know to be the case is that order books are not full for those that employ duly qualified persons. There's been lots of uh, approach uh, by water users to those people, but until orders are formed, until orders are placed, th those that employ those duly qualified persons are not going to increase the number of people that they employ. However, have, that having been said, the order books are not full, so there is resource available. There are 19 more duly qualified persons in training as we speak. There's more training arranged. So the numbers of duly qualified persons will grow. And as I say, there is capacity in their order books. Now, the other thing to say on uh, you know, how much is this going to be a compounding problem, um, I think what we're actually doing is ironing out a number of the problems. For example, uh, a couple of months ago, it was 12 weeks was the um, average time for placing an order to getting your pump. The average time now is down to about six weeks. So there's quite a few areas where good progress is being made. Um, nevertheless, there's things in here that as the manager, I need to follow up with quite closely and make sure that we continue to iron out those problems. The other thing I would say, sorry, if I just could, this guy, I think at the start of your questioning, uh, you were saying, if we can't get this right, how can we rely on the metering of floodplain harvesting, it's quite a different type of metering. Uh, that measurement system is quite different to this measurement system. And, and if you want, Dan could speak to that. Dan, did you want to add, add do you foresee any problems with the floodplain harvesting metering? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Mark. And thanks, Jim, for referring on. So, yeah, it, in terms of size and scale, it's definitely a much easier proposition. So we've got, you know, in the order of a thousand storages needing storage equipment. We know that um, many of those storages, there's quite a number of things those individuals need, need to get. The first is um, a storage curve by, by a registered surveyor. So they understand the storage itself, its dimensions, um, how much volume it can hold, etc. They need a benchmark installed on the site, which is a how you tie that you know, how you tie that into the, the Australian height datum, which is the survey reference mark across across Australia. Um, then you need to make sure that you have the equipment itself. And I think we've got 13 devices uh, currently um, available to people, which range in price with different specifications. And we've got a, a single at this point in time with a, with a bunch more in testing local intelligence device. So that's the device that um, is the data longing and telemetry. That's the smarts to the, to the on ground meter. Um, so it's a much smaller proposition from our market research. Uh, so far, we don't expect that there will be um, any problems with the rollout of that framework. And that's the advice uh, we're getting back from industry as well, that this is a, a much constrained um, program of works that we don't think uh, will suffer the same type of challenges that the broad scale metering rollout program would suffer. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And that's my time, so I'll throw it back to the chair. Great, thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to check whether government members had any questions at this stage. Okay, Mr. Franklin. 
Yeah. Actually, I, Chair, I think Mr. Amato is going to start right. the session. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fred. Amato. Thank you, Chair. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend this inquiry. I uh, also extend that welcome to the representatives of DPI and E. Uh, Minister, water is going down the Darling Anna Branch as we sit here today. What does this mean for locals? Alu, oh, it's um, it's uh, just extraordinary. Um, and when I was out there in April, and and we we opened some of the big gates, and the water went into the main lakes, uh, to see this uh, supercharged event. Um, and that was one of the reasons I went to Canberra about six or four or five weeks ago to talk to the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder and the Murray Darling Basin Authority. Um, to say we need to to be sharing some of that water to to get the the native fish habitat operating in those outer branches and coincidentally today um, this you know there are decisions being made by water New South Wales um, for that overflow event um, and in case I think that's 30 gigalitres and just in case there wasn't enough water um, the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder will do a, a supplementary surge of water as well to ensure that that Anna branch flow will go down to, to the Lower Darling. And that's something that means a hell of a lot, of, lot to the people of Broken Hill um, and Indy and the Lower Darling. So, you know, but these rainfall events have, you know, have, have just been extraordinary after, you know, the Northern Basin facing its driest three year period ever. Um, now to have uh, these inflows that have been going now for about 12 months um, is, is really exciting. Yeah, no, thank you, Minister. It certainly has been a blessing. And so I've got another question. Um, would more water have gone to the environment if the floodplain harvesting regulations had not been disallowed? Yes, they would have. And the advice I have from the agency is that uh, we would, we will be. Uh, if we we will be reducing floodplain harvesting in the Guida by 30%, um, in the border rivers by 13%. Um, that's a decrease, um, and I think uh, Mr. Barnes, I've been advised, gave evidence earlier today that we would have actually had bigger inflows um, into those wetlands around the Guida and the border rivers um, quite significantly if the regulations had been in place. Thank you very much, Minister. I'll pass on to uh, the Honourable Ben Franklin. Uh, thanks, thanks uh, very much, Mr. Amato. Um, if I could move on to um, the, as the minister referred to them, technocrats, um, and uh, probably Mr. Brown, but um, very happy for whoever's appropriate to to answer these questions. Um, if we assume through licensing that you start collecting and measuring individual farm water take, I guess my first question is, can you see any other areas where measurement will need improve, uh, needs improvement and uh, what can be done in that space? I don't think you'll ever get a modeler who's going to argue about collecting more data. Um, hmm. Probably the main th for this particular purpose, the measurement of the water um, entering the storages is key. Um, that gives us a much more solid uh, means of estimating or understanding the flow balances or the water balances on individual farms. I think if we were, you know, in a no no hole, you know, no no budgetary restriction sort of world, I think we'd probably put a lot more flow gauges on some of these flood runners, uh, where the, some of this floodplain accessing water is coming from, and I, we'd probably also, if I had a Christmas wish list, um, put in some more. Uh, high quality uh, climate measurement stations. So typically the further west you go, the less densities that you have automatic weather stations, essentially. So more of those is always nice. So if you didn't license and meter, do you think that there are ways that the, the flow models across floodplains can be um, improved in any real way? Uh, not in the near term. I think we've largely tapped out the data that we we can be able to get get hold of, so we have upped we have radically upped the amount of data we were using already, um, but I, I can't I'm not aware of anything else that we've left on the table, you know, in a systematic way. Okay, so for um, for the department to start modelling the full water balance, does that um, imply that licensing and metering would have to um, occur first? We already try to model the full water balance. What we're really talking about is improving the resolution and being able to break down that water balance into finer components. So if we want to go further, we, we, we need to measure more stuff, yes. 
Okay. Can I move on to a different issue? Um, the Wentworth Group claimed in a report last year that 2,000 gigs was missing from the Murray-Darling Basin. I'd just be interested in your comment as, comments as to the veracity of that uh, claim. I think they made some fairly serious um, errors in how they assumed um, that, you know, that those numbers should be created. So, and the one that really stood out to me was um, they effectively assumed that the basin plan was in place and it wasn't over the period that they were collecting their data from. So you can't really expect a plan that isn't in place to deliver the, the objectives of that plan. The other part was um, they made an assumption that the recovered water should appear in the river, and that's absolutely not a requirement of the basin plan at all. So the recovered water is at the behest of environmental water holders, and they have some legislative requirements to deliver environmental outcomes. Those outcomes do not need to be increased flows. Thank you. Um, we've obviously had a lot of discussion and there's been contention about what happens if you completely remove uh, floodplain harvesting from the Northern Basin and what that will mean for total inflows into the Murray River. Um, uh, and and there, it's been contested as to what the numbers are. It's been suggested by um, you, uh, by the government, that, that um, those inflows, if they were removed, would increase by less than 1% on average. I guess my question, and I know that we've discussed this a little today, but um, if you can point to the substantive evidence that shows that, and if you want to take that on notice, then you're very welcome to. I think I might take it on notice, or Dan, or... I can um, I can um, elucidate the committee with some detail, just a simple example, because I think it's easy to understand. So um, we, we know that the Northern Basin inflows, so if you look at published information under baseline diversion limit conditions, which are all the baseline diversion limit models supplied by the basin states, which are the starting premise for the basin plan. If you look at that report, it's freely available. I can certainly provide the link. You can see that the Northern Basin contributes to the Southern Basin about 1,700 GLs a year on average. We know that the flows at Wentworth are 12,400 a year on average. And we know that of that 12,000, um, 12,400, 10,700 from that water balance that was done using those baseline diversion limit conditions actually comes from the Southern Basin. So that's where that 14% statistic comes from. As has already been mentioned, I think by New South Wales Irrigators Council, if you have a look at our IPART uh, determination, um, we've put some estimates of what we uh, expect floodplain harvesting to be in that. You can back calculate it's about 250 GLs um, of floodplain harvesting licenses long-term average. If hypothetically you took all of that water, put it in a bucket and ran it down to Menindee Lakes and tipped it in Menindee Lakes, which we know isn't the case, this water supports a range of really important ecosystem functions across the Northern Basin, recharging groundwater, wetlands, yeah, it is fulfilling the soil moisture profiles for cropping farmers and it's supporting the environment as it moves down the system. But hypothetically, pick it up, put it in a bucket and tip it in Menindee Lakes. We know that that's about a 14% increase in flows, inflows into Menindee Lakes and using those same statistics, you arrive at about a 2% increase in flows at Wentworth. So just really simple maths with some really radical out there assumptions, like picking the water up off the floodplain, taking it down in a bucket and putting it in Menindee Lakes, you can arrive at a figure of 2%. So we've definitely got analysis to, to, to back it up, but I think, you know, it's, it's so starkly obvious from just published information that is available to anybody to calculate that statistic that uh, I thought it was worthwhile sharing that with you. Thank you. And if, if uh, you did want to um, put any further information on, on notice, you'd be very willing to do so. Um, in, uh, if, if these rules and these changes are, are brought into effect, um, it's, you've, been, you've suggested that it'll reduce the water taken in the Guida by about 30% and by about 13% in the border rivers. Um, where will that water actually end up going to? Uh, what it would have been used for irrigation, but um, but then where, where will it, where will it go to if it, if that doesn't happen under this new plan? So that, that's this, one. this relates to return flows, doesn't it, Dan? So we don't we don't we can't put an exact figure on exactly where the water ends up. Uh, we're aware that quite a lot of the water stays on the floodplain and services. You know, environmental functions on the floodplain. 
Um, some more of it will end up back in the river and it will head down through the system, through Menindi, through South Australia and on. I, I don't think it's possible to put an exact number on, but I believe Dan can talk about the investments we're making. Yeah, so thanks, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, thanks for the question. Um, so, so we know that this is a practice when, when it's restricted, it's going to have immense local benefits. But the benefits will dissipate as it moves downstream. As I've said, it, it isn't going to affect the southern connected bus in any material sense. It, it's possibly going to have some um, impacts, beneficial, beneficial impacts on on the Bowen Darling, principally during the times that the the framework will restrict floodplain harvesting, which is obviously in those those wetter periods. Um, but we've we have definitely looked at how um, that additional water on the floodplain um, improves um, some of the basic ecosystem functions. So we've looked at in the case of the Guida, or in the case of all of the valleys, actually um, requirements for water birds, requirements for native vegetation, and requirements for native fish. Um, these requirements are based on the environmental watering requirements for those species in the long-term environmental watering plans, and we've essentially looked at what that in increase in the volume of water on the floodplain would do to the the frequency in which those environmental requirements have been met. Um, I think uh, the minister's already talked to one of the headline statistics in the Guida, which is 142% improvement in some of the metrics around uh, requirements for water birds. Just some of the others, and a 99% maximum improvement for some of the metrics around native vegetation and, and a 70% improvement around some of the metrics that relate to native fish, just to give you a snapshot uh, as well. So um, just to be really clear, the benefits of policy are most significant where we've had significant growth in uh, above those water source legal limits. The, the Guida is definitely uh, the case where we've seen the most substantial growth and obviously where we expect to see the greatest benefits as a result of licensing. Those will be mostly within Valley and really concentrated around those iconic sites, the, the Ramsar listed wetlands uh, within within the Guida itself. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, my final question, a statement which will probably get a bipartisan cheer, I suspect, um, is, uh, is this, that there's been obviously an enormous amount of effort from both Commonwealth and state governments over the last eight eight years or so, who have invested an enormous amount of money, over $17 million on research modelling and consultation, um, to develop and to implement the floodplain licensing policy. Um, clearly, uh, a regulation was made, it was disallowed, and we are now at an impasse. My question is this, um, can this policy be introduced without regulations? Could we go ahead and do it anyway without the will of the parliament? Um, I want to do it preferably with the with the will of the Parliament then. Um, and I think any fair person watching the evidence of this week will see that there there still is uh, a lack of understanding that this is actually about also containing the amount of of of, of take and ensuring that we have more water flowing through to the wetlands. Um, I do want to move forward with this, um, with the support of the parliament. So all my questions, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. Just checking, that's it for government questions, Mr Farraway. Yep. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you. But well, that is the end of this session and uh, the final hearing for, for this committee. So thank you very much for appearing and for making time, as I think some people said in your busy schedule, Minister, appreciate it. Um, that is the end of the live stream as well and today's hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Members.